Um, well, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll do a very quick introduction. It seems that uh, all you guys are pretty familiar with our reviewers today uh, and with Judy uh, Birdson, we which shared uh, studio space. <laughs> Hope we weren't too loud, Judy. <laughs> It was another place, another time. That's right. That is actually correct. That is actually yeah. correct. Um, so, so yeah. So, as as you know, Judy is a lecturer at the University of Texas, and we we have Ernesto Bilbao as well as a teaching assistant, also a PhD uh, in architecture, pursuing PhD in architecture at the University of Texas uh, as well. He has masters uh, from Rice University as a Fulbright scholar. Uh, and uh, he's joining us uh, for this morning session along with Judy. Um, and um, I want to thank you guys for, for joining us on, uh, I think it is also probably all of our first uh, live stream review. So I love that technology is actually challenging us on teaching as well. And um, I want to do a quick introduction to, to our studio. If you saw uh, the email and the uh, uh, information that, that was posted. It's about emotion, emotion in architecture. And uh, the students had opportunity to, to work with emotions from the very first um, assignment. Oh, you froze. An architectural space uh, that exemplifies that emotion or conveys that emotion. And then we run with the same, the same exercise on assignment two but this time with the eyes, through the eyes of an artist or, or a um, architect. Some of them uh, chose architects, some of them chose artists. And that really helped them uh, work with the idea of conceptualization um, and really dive into the phenomenological aspect of architecture, how the spaces makes us feel, uh, how architecture um, can, um, really convey a metaphor and, and start to create a, a sense of process for them, design process that will help them for this final project. For the final project, all the students propose different utopian or dystopian um, uh, narratives, uh, proposal for a future. And we all selected uh, three, our three favorite ones of all the wonderful proposals that we have. Uh, today will be, uh, this morning, the first session we'll be talking about one of those futures. Um, and the five students were assigned to that, to that um, um, particular future. And we'll be looking at their individual, individual uh, projects. So uh, future one uh, will be Clara, uh, Marina, Domini, Nicole, and Isi. And I would like to start with Clara, if you could a little bit, tell us a little bit of your project, share your screen and, and, um, and I welcome you all and the world to our review. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, can y'all all see that? Okay. Okay. Um, I'll just start by kind of running through my concept and then I'll go through the presentation and finish with the video walkthrough of my model. So my memorial explores a physical relationship between the visitor and the world that they will soon be leaving behind. Because in this world, there's no aging. So I think reality is even more linked to a sense of physicality in the here and now where they can really experience what's around them. So each of my spaces focuses on a connection to part of the physical world, including nature, light, and water. And all of those things display a change over time that the visitors have not been able to experience in their own lives. So as the visitors move through the space, they are able to stop and contemplate the beauty and fragility of the human experience. The memorial is also symbolic of a life journey with a linear circulation that does not allow you to revisit the past. And as they travel through this path, the ocean can be heard, but it can't be seen until the very end, forcing the visitor to accept their fear of the unknown as they transition to the next stage of life. And at the very end, they can finally see the ocean. And on the walls in that space, they are able to write their name before leaving the space for future visitors to see that they are not alone in the journey. 
and the last steps of the memorial lead visitors to the sand where they can feel one more physical connection to this world before walking into the unknown. So I started with some research on different memorials to try and understand their program and how they use symbolism in that. And then I went to make some circulation diagrams of what I wanted my program to be. And I decided on a linear circulation to parallel the path of life because you can't go backwards, you can only move forwards. And I, here's some inspiration pictures of some different projects that I looked at when I was designing. I took a lot of inspiration from beach houses because of our site being El Matador Beach on a cliffside. And um, they also have a lot of openness and connection with nature that I was looking for. So then here are some of my initial sketches for previous iterations when I was trying to figure out how to deal with such a large elevation change with that cliff. And then this is my program diagram of what I settled on in the end. So it shows that linear circulation where you'd start at the entrance garden and move through the spaces to the final reflection space and eventually the beach. And um, so the garden has lots of ephemeral plants that represent the life cycle. So when you're in that space, you would see all stages of the life cycle in one space. And the light meditation space has um, a lighting condition that changes throughout the day. And then there's the cliff and still water spaces. So that also shows like the movement of the water by wind and like changes on the cliff that they're able to see. So these things are not only connected to like a physical experience with the earth, but also um, allow you to reflect on the fragility of life and the value of your own life. Um, so a little more on the plants that I used in the garden. These are, um, the two flowers are natural to the Southern California coast. So the poppy uh, represents like peace, death, and rebirth. The coast sunflower represents longevity and long life. And the cherry blossom represents the fleeting nature of life, which is something that the society has been lacking. And then mixed in would be some ephemeral plants that show the whole life cycle. So this is my site plan and it shows more of how the building is integrated into the cliff. And as you move down to be to the bottom of the project, you're closer to the beach and to the ground. And um, to get this design, I used a lot of parallel extension lines to rearrange the spaces with the different um, staircases and walls. Um, this elevation has a good view of the final reflection space, which is the first time that you actually get to see the ocean and it's hidden from you as you move through most of the other spaces. And you can still hear it, but um, like what comes after death, it's intangible until the end, which allows visitors to accept their fear of the unknown. And it becomes more impactful and emotionally charged when you've been building up to this. Um, so here's one of my sections that shows a cut through um, the water spaces and the final reflection space. And then this also shows the circulation between the garden and the light space, which is just a narrow dark hallway with a slit through the cliff to allow light in. So it's dark and narrow, not only to encourage an individual journey through this memorial, but to acknowledge that fear of going into a new place and a new stage of life and just accepting that. So it's like released when you move into the next space. This shows a better view of the cliff and water spaces and the cliff space actually has a framed view behind the water space where you can see part of the landscape but the ocean is still blocked from view. And um, this plan shows the final reflection space. So the two walls um, next to the stairs are places where they would be able to write their names before they go down the last staircase to the beach. And then this plan shows the cliff and water spaces. So you can see that opening that lets you see the cliff a little bit more. And then you can also see where that um, staircase is from the garden to the light space. 
And then this is the last plan of the garden, which um, also has a pretty narrow staircase to kind of encourage people to go through this one at a time. So this would be the view that you see walking up to the project where the ocean is still kind of hidden from view by the cliff. And by the time you reach the garden, you're already moving down into the cliff. So it's hidden the whole time. And there are the plants that I talked about earlier. So you'd walk across this kind of plateau and then move down into the space. And this is an interior render of the light meditation space. And these big streaks of light that come through would move across the room and pull you in throughout the day. Um, this is the cliff and water spaces. So it shows like the connection between them. And also in the water space, the um, path that goes through the water is actually lowered a little bit because I was imagining that visitors would actually walk through this barefoot so they could really feel the polished concrete and they could really have that physical experience. And then through this part, they'd be able to feel the water. And this would be turning the corner down um, the staircase after the water. And then you go through this hallway and on the other side of this wall would be the final reflection space. So the ocean is really hidden until the very, very end of the project. And once you turn that corner, this is what you would see at the very end. So you'd have time to sit here and contemplate your last moments on earth. And then this wall on the left and on the right sides of the image would be the places where they write their names before turning around the wall on the left to go down those stairs and reach the sand. Okay, that's the end. So one quick question. Mm -hmm. um, what happens when they touch the sand? I mean, is this a place of suicide? That's like in the, that's pretty much the concept of the future is um, they're all like immortal. So they have lived for hundreds of years and then like the government has an issue with suicide rates going up. So they're trying to provide people with a place where they can like finish their lives in peace. Okay, okay. So the idea is that um, as they exit the memorial, uh, they move down to the beach and into the ocean and they don't um, come back, right? Yeah, there they don't come back. You made the point that there is no return path, right? Right. Okay, okay. I just wanted to be clear on that. So would you say that this is um, not as much a memorial as it is a, um, a, a place for suicide? Yeah. It's kind of both because it's not just like a place for these people to go to die, but it's a place for them to remember how to live and what was beautiful about their life. So it's like memorializing each individual as they go through the spaces. Okay. Okay. Um, so I had a couple questions. I mean, I think the way you talk about this um, is, is really quite um, lovely and potentially quite powerful. Okay. Um, I wonder if you had looked at all at, I mean, the, the fact that you are moving from earth to water, right? Two profoundly different, um, certainly material conditions, but they also have very significantly different um, connotations in, in, you know, various mythologies, various religions, right? Right. Um, so I think there's, there, there are a couple of, um, I'm curious about a couple of things. The idea that you would, you would move from the garden down into the earth, right? Right. And then out to the sea or out back to the life, to the light. Um, in, in a lot of cultures, that journey is representative of rebirth, right? I mean, you right. think about birth, you know, just the physical act of birth, you're moving from a very, very dark space into a very bright space, you know, um, mm -hmm. from the womb into the room in a way. Um, and, and, and also in a lot of cultures, people uh, are reborn by, they reemerge from the water, right? Um, right? 
So I wonder, did you, did you, given the site that you have and the poignancy of the program, did you investigate that at all? I mean, are you um, either intentionally um, operating within those kind of um, mythological connotative um, systems or was it just an opportunity for you to kind of weave a, a, a phenomenologically significant path with different experiences through the site? Short I'm question. <laughs> are, you engaging, are you engaging these associations or are you simply um, using the site for the physical opportunities it provides? I was definitely focusing more on the physical opportunities of the site. Mm -hmm. And what you were talking about with like the dark space moving to a light space, I was thinking about that less of that being a journey of rebirth in itself and more of that being um, their transition of like being fearful of what is coming to being accepting of it. Okay. And I think you guys as a group decide the idea of connecting back to, to the ocean in a way was that's going complete the circle of life, getting back to, to, to the energy of the earth from what right. I remember. And, and that was a, a proposal that you guys kind of work together and define the location mm -hmm. of, the, of the site. So the location of the site actually, and I should explain it a little bit better, Jody, uh, was a, a group cons consensus. So they, they inherit the, the description of the future mm -hmm. and they apply that uh, concept in the selection of the actual site. And some of them chose to engage the beach, some of them don't, but we'll see later. But I think that was a conscious group decision for, for that as a parameter. Mm -hmm. Actually, another part of context with the site is the part of the like concept for this future was that the city is very overwhelming and large and kind of cold and emotionless. And that's actually um, behind what we see here. So it would be like, a, like further away from the beach. So the idea for this memorial was to kind of pull them away from that like chaos and emotionlessness of the city and bring them like back to nature. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, I suppose you could argue that, you know, at this point in the future, so many hundreds of years have gone by that people may be ignorant of those kinds of myths and those kinds of cosmological um, associations, right? I mean, right. It, how, how, do you, um, how do you begin to talk about rebirth if there's no concept of death, right? Right. <laughs> what are you being reborn from? <laughs> So. Yeah, I, th I, th I think it's a, it's a very good question. First of all, like, hello, Judith, it's been a while I haven't seen you. Uh, I think it's a very interesting concept, um, and, 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 and Judith is, uh, is pointing out a very interesting um, uh, topic, which is, I mean, your, your project is going to be applied for all kinds of beliefs, uh, even though that anything can happen in hundreds hundred of years. From um, I mean, the perspective that you're designing your project, I think it's kind of interesting that it's kind of uh, um, capturing the possibility of a universal belief in terms of uh, being uh, alive and then suddenly being uh, to being re re rebirth in, in that sense. So I think it's kind of, kind of it's, it's very interesting. Um, I think I think your project. I mean, the way that you presented it was very clear. I, I like the way that you have applied architecturally. Um, all the concepts and all the ideas that you had uh, for your project. And I think, uh, you know, the way that you manipulate the project or the spaces in terms of uh, having a very open space, the garden at the very beginning of the coming out of, of the circulation where you started, where, where you begin the, the circulation is very interesting with, with the garden and very uh, precise uh, um, uh, vegetation also kind of gives uh, that space a very particular uh, atmosphere. And then uh, also, I think it was very interesting how you manipulate the space. You uh, after that space, the, the, the very uh, where you start, uh, you compress the space, and then suddenly you open the space again when you are at the very uh, end of this uh, promenade. So I think that was uh, very interesting. And then one of the things that I saw that I don't know if that was uh, intentional in your project was the man what was the use of light. I think you used uh, um, light, you know, in sense, in, in ways that uh, 
you capture shadows. I mean, you, you intentionally use lighting or to provoke uh, more intimate spaces or darker spaces and things like that. And also that correlates, uh, correlated with uh, how you were uh, hidden, um, uh, hiding uh, some of those, some of those spaces, especially between the cliffs. And I think that was that that was a very inter interesting relationship between the light and how you were uh, hiding the spaces. So you were kind of uh, moving up from the the total light. Uh, you compress the light, you compress the space, and then suddenly you frame again to the light uh, towards the, the the ocean. So I, I and, and again, you know, when when you were framing the, the ocean at the very end, was also a very interesting movement. Of um, of uh, kind of capture, capturing the, the landscape, another movement of landscape, uh, as you did uh, when you began the, the circulation. So I think in both uh, ends you had something that is kind of relating to the landscape, which I saw it, it, it is very interesting. So I think um, you know I see the the use of light very interesting. Um, when I saw one of the sections, I wasn't sure if you were considering vertical circulation as another. Um, feature in your project in order to emphasize uh, some kind of aspects. Uh, for example, uh, ramps, the use of ramps, the use of a stair, a st a stairways or staircases that can uh, probably or, or could have uh, probably manipulate uh, also light or, you know, kind of uh, reinforcing the idea of uh, having, making these transitions from one point to another. Using mm -hmm. the deliberate use of the vertical circulation also, you know, to go from the very top of the cliff uh, to all the way down to the beach. I think it, it could have also added another very interesting uh, level or layer of um, interest in your project, uh, right? So I, I, see, I see many very interesting uh, instances in, in your project that are very, very interesting. And I think uh, just about, you know, when I see the project in section is especially when I think that it needs a little bit of uh, a, a calibration, especially, you know, there are some instances, especially with the intermediate, uh, the inter especially with the gallery the space that you had in between. There was a, a gap, especially with the, the upper part, you know, where, you know, it's hard to uh, understand the transition, the vertical transition from this space to this one, and then from right. this one to the other one. So I think, you know, vertical uh, circulation there could have uh, uh, been used as a very important feature in your project in order to make these transitions from one uh, uh, area, one space to the next one, and then to the next one, and so on. But I think uh, it's a very interesting project. I, I was uh, making some notes yesterday when I saw it. Um, and I think it's, uh, it, uh, I, I like the clarity of, of the concept. I, I like the clarity of the circulation. I like the clarity of, um, of the discourse uh, behind your, your design. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard for me to look at your project without thinking about the Chichu Art Museum. Are you familiar with it? I am not. Uh, it's a project Tadao Ando did in the probably mid 2000s, maybe early 2000s. Oh, okay, I probably have seen it before because the last assignment um, we had to choose an architect to base our designs off of, and I picked Tadao Ando. So, okay, there you go. Um, it's similar in a number of different ways. Um, for one thing, it is a, um, a very quiet architecture. I'll come back to that in a minute but it's also very internally derived. In other words, it takes its, its it, the architecture is, is actually, um, actually results from um, very internally um, focused decisions, by which I mean, you know, it's a lot about path and corridor, right? It's not about, um, it's not a, about what it looks like from the outside, right? So it's, it's again, it's, it, it takes its, uh, it, the architecture is found within the experience of moving through it, okay? Um, and Ando uses light in really particular ways in that project and he writes about it beautifully. You should, you should there's a book, you should get it, you should read it, everybody should read it. Um, because he uses light to kind of define the path and I don't mean by drawing light on the ground, I mean light comes around through a corner, so you're drawn to it. You move to it, you turn the corner, right? So he's using light as kind of a guide, but then he also uses light very specifically to illuminate the three spaces where art is held. And one is a space for Monet's works, one is a space for Walter de Maria's work, and one is a space, I think, for James Terrell's work. Um, so three very different artists, um, all using light as a subject, but with very different results, right? Um, Monet is pretty different from Terrell. Mm -hmm. 
Um, anyway, so the project is a lot about path and the arrival and path and arrival. And each one of those moments of arrival where the art is held has light entering in a different way. And that the way the light enters is appropriate to the art that is being sort of hosted in that space, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so you should look at it because again, it's kind of hard not to look at your project and even the way you talk about it without thinking about it. I mean, you have um, a, a sequence of chambers that are connected by corridors, right? And um, the corridors, again, are as much a part of the architecture as those chambers you've, you've designed. Um, so a couple things maybe along those lines. Um, I think given that the path is as important as maybe the, the individual rooms or chambers, um, really, you know, and, and maybe this, you know, comes back to a comment that was made just a little while ago, really thinking about how a person, what those, what the qualities of those transitional spaces are like, you know, um, when is it appropriate to have a wide stair? When is it appropriate to have a narrow stair or a ramp? right, or a straight passage. Um, because I think there were um, a few moments in your project where, you know, particularly the stairs that are coming down into the last chamber where you stop and you write your name on the wall, where the, the and it seems like a petty point, but I don't think it is, where the, um, the dimension of the stairs seem too generous. I mean, there's this thing about, you know, dying is the thing we do alone, right? Nobody goes with us. <laughs> right. And so that's a very singular experience, right? So to give it sort of a generous stare seemed, it seemed more like you were welcoming a group of people into the room instead of emphasizing the fact that this is actually a very solitary experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just, you know, minor things like that. Um, I think there's also some really interesting temporal aspects to your work. I think at the end of the day, your project is about time, which is appropriate given the, the, the sort of program as you've defined it, right? The fact that you have these, the cherry blossoms or these flowers in the garden, you know, they grow and then lose their petals and they die, right? Um, so there's an aspect of time there that maybe takes place over a period of days or weeks. And then you move into the meditation chamber where light is moving around, not unlike the Pantheon, right? And uh, time is understood more in sort of a minute by minute way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you know, you reemerge at the ocean and, you know, you're introduced again to this expanse, this visual expanse that seems almost limitless, right? And the ocean is something that never seems to die in a way. Um, and so time sort of opens up again. And I think these things are embedded in your work. Um, it, it would be nice to maybe um, have you acknowledge that and take control over them maybe even a little bit more, right? Just talk about it as being sort of the, the conceptual underpinning that, um, that yeah. I think is there. I, I think uh, that's why I was uh, saying the importance of the light. I, I don't know if the, if, the, if, the, if the use of the light was very intentional in, in your design, because I see that you have this intuition of kind of uh, using light to, um, as an instrument, to follow the circulation or to uh, mm -hmm. circulation is, is followed by the, by the light or, something, or, or between the use of, of, of the two. So I think that's, that's very interesting in, in, in a way. So that's why I think it's very important the transition between each one of these chambers, each one of these uh, three spaces, major spaces that you have, I think the circulation and the use of light become very interesting or, or, or important and relevant in, in, you, in, in the way that you kind of made the transition, you made the, the articulation between these three chambers and I think this transition according to the amount of light, to the amount of uh, shade, to the amount of um, um, air space that you, you're able to, go, to to see and so on. I think I think it's, it's, it's how you calibrate, I think, you know, the transition between one point to the other. I think it's, it's, it's very important. And also because you're, you're, you're going from, from, uh, from the top of a cliff you know, all the way down. So I think, you know, in, in, in both ways, conceptually and um, 
in terms of also of, of, the, of the level, the difference of level that you have, circulation becomes very important. So, uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I think it's, it's, it's very interesting that you have that intuition of how to use the light. Um, and also that, again, you know, it's very interesting that especially the, the, the chamber in, in, in the middle is hidden, is, uh, is, is, is kind of embedded in the cliff. It's also very interesting. So I think, uh, you know, you, you start from this very open space where you have the full amount of light, then suddenly you uh, make that, that space, the next space, the next chamber is totally dark, or probably have dark or, um, and then you, you make the transition to the next one where you again see the light, but, but in a very different way. As, as you know, from the perspective of the, of the perception, our perception of light, you know, our eyes, how we perceive the light after being in a dark space, you know, in, in order to reinforce your, your concept, the idea of your concept. So I think it, it's very interesting if you could have articulated light uh, with circulation in a more um, um, uh, particular way, right? And uh, I th those are great comments. And I think those comments will apply to some of the other, other um, proposals as well. So this is fantastic feedback. Thank you so much, Clara. Thank you. Claire, can I make one suggestion? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Please. As you're going Please. into, as you're putting things together for your portfolio, um, mm -hmm. I think you need some images. You, you showed us a couple of sort of what the what you imagine that space to be like, right? Yeah. When, a, when a project is so experientially, um, it, when, when that's all the project is about, we need to see images that convey that experience. Yeah. Um, because it's interesting that you, you ended your presentation with this particular image where we're looking at the project from the outside. And I think at the end of the day, your project is not about what this looks like. Just mm -hmm. as Ondo's you know, art museum is not about what it looks like. I have no mental image, even though I've looked at that project a hundred times of what it looks like because most of it's buried in the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Your project is not about standing outside turning around and seeing an object, which is what you showed us. You need to have some fabulous renders in your portfolio of those spaces, okay? Because yeah. that's the project, yeah. not the object. And it's interesting because all the critiques that we've been doing has been through with the model and you had a, a great uh, uh, um, way to show us around the model, which Claire would have done that too, probably would have conveyed better the, uh, some of those transition spaces. But, um, but uh, I, Perfectly. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. It's, it's about it's about that experience on those spaces. So uh, you have a lot of really great moments. So make sure to capture those, especially for your portfolio. Okay. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's keep going. So Maria, you ready? Yes. Okay. So basically my concept for my design um, kind of, I focused on like the sun and like how at the beginning and end of each day, the sun is like guaranteed to rise in the east and set in the west. And I kind of use that to get an like an emotional feel from like the emotion nostalgia is what I focused on just because they've lived so long and have experienced so much that they've become kind of numb to like emotions and everything. So that was what I really wanted to focus on with my project. Um, I started um, by researching like kind of how like the really elderly in today's world feel about death and dying. And um, all of them tend to agree that um, really by the time they get to the end of their life, they're, they're ready and accepting of death. So I kind of like played off of that. Um, I have some sketches of some previous iterations. And um, the way I got to those sketches was I went and I looked at um, the angles that the sun makes for this particular site. And I focused a lot on the summer and winter solstice and kind of like the angles that the sun hits the earth from like its altitude and everything. Um, and here was one of my previous iterations where I heavily focused on the X that the winter and summer solstice uh, make. Um, essentially, my 
site lays, um, the building lays directly into the cliff. Um, and you enter through the small chamber at the end and it's underground. And I kind of had envisioned that as a sort of rebirth from like their monotonous life into like finally being able to like feel um, like accepting and like remembering all of the stuff that they've been through in their life. Um, so then here is the elevation from the ocean that you kind of saw at the beginning. And I got all of my forms essentially. Um, I followed like this wave pattern just because it's so close to the ocean. I really wanted to convey that form with uh, my building and the experience from the site. Um, and then through here, you can kind of see like the path that leads into the building and um, this little area with the tree. I kind of like had that to be representative of like a sundial. Um, and then inside the building, um, I really focused on like the light and I did some light studies. I have um, the stained glass that is at the top and the bottom of the main window um, end at um, the altitude of the uh, winter and summer solstice so that all throughout the year you're getting these lights uh, from there and then the middle main window is kind of it's at the altitude for the um, equinox so I just really wanted to play that and like see how like it would light up the space and then here are my um, forms from the outside of the building. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question. So you have the possibility of going to the beach in your project, right? Uh, especially by seeing the image that you have to uh, the left, I see that you have that possibility, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of imagined that space to just like the platform rests like almost just a little above sea, above sea level so I kind of intended it for it to be like a space where you can kind of like feel the waves coming onto you and just kind of like like y'all said in like the previous one like just kind of returning to nature mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Marina, I've got a big gray rectangle on the left on the right side of my screen it looks like a i i, I do too where it's the, yeah. is that, there, there you go, go. it's going okay. down yeah. zoom was having everybody's videos showing me sorry okay i think uh you know it's very interesting uh when you showed us uh, in the slide number two these two diagrams that show uh, the movement of the sun and then how you departed from that uh, research uh, how you wanted to apply that into your project. I think it's very interesting. Um, I'm not very sure if that, if I, if I, I, I mean, maybe this is more a question. I don't see how that is uh, reflected, uh, I mean, um, in your project beyond the last image uh, where you had this, um, where you said you had, you had this uh, light studies, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, I, I was uh, kind of uh, thinking that you were going towards a uh, very encapsulated space uh, and then, uh, but, but the, the, the last chamber, the last space that you're creating is up into the ocean. So, uh, you know, the relationship between the sun and the amount of light and then how the, sun is, uh, the, the light is projected to the to surfaces, I think, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, I think I, I don't see that. I mean, so I'm just curious about, you know, how to understand how the, the amount of light is being projected to the surfaces when you have an open space, so an open chamber, right? Is that, is that what happens? Um, I'm not sure if I completely understand what you're asking, but essentially I wanted it to be just like a very, um, like the walking path up until the building to be like, um, very open and very natural. Um, I made like the mm -hmm. little dome space to be reflective of like the sundial just because that's like historically like very uh, reflective of the sun. And I just wanted it to be like 
you're constantly like in view, but I, in my main space, I wanted it to be more of a controlled, like, so that the light was like reflecting like through the windows and that like you kind of feel that emotion particularly in that space. Can you go, go back to the previous slide? This one? Okay, those spaces are, are interior spaces? This is interior, yes. Okay, those are behind um, the last uh, open space uh, that you showed us that had uh, the stairways, uh, the stairway uh, connecting to the beach, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have Marina, your model would be probably easier to navigate a little bit? Yeah. You know, the quality of the space, just wanna, I think maybe. Yeah, let me share that. Well, maybe I'm, I was curious, uh, uh, you know, because when I see the sections, I'm trying to understand how the simulation works and uh, where those spaces that you were showing through the, your renderings are located. So that's why I'm just trying to understand the project a little bit better. Okay. Yeah. So basically you go through here and then this is like the main like first space. And then this is where you enter into the building and then this is like what y'all were seeing with like the light studies and everything and then from there you kind of go sorry out into here and this is where you first see like the ocean and then like you go down this staircase and then you get to like experience it and I wanted it open so that like you really get like the sun and the ocean and just kind of like feel like the sense of like wholeness like with nature. Okay. So in the first in the first um, area with the tree that you said was like a sundial, is it a sundial or is it just sort of evoking the form of the sundial? Um. So I, it's off centered, so it's not like completely like a sundial. Um, but the tree, I wanted the tree to be the only thing to cast a shadow like in there throughout the day. So that's what you're getting. Like you kind of like can see. Okay. I mean, it, it was interesting that you showed us your first model, which was about the solstices or solstice seas, right? And it had um, sort of the two U-shaped chambers, right? Mm -hmm. One that kind of track the sun during the winter solstice and the other that track the sun during the summer solstice. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So that was interesting because the form was determined by how the light moves through it. So the form wasn't something that you imposed on the model. The form um, was generated by an external condition that you wanted to um, to bring into your project, right? The movement of the sun. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, that, that's a very, um, it's a very specific way of designing. You know, my project is determined by these conditions that I want to engage in my project, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's interesting that you wound up where you did because it's 180 degrees from that, right? So, um, instead of having the building perform or um, derive its shape from, again, these you know, very specific conditions, you are almost, your forms are, are representing something else altogether. They become, they're not deterministic, they are representative, okay? So it's shaped like a wave, it becomes metaphoric, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's important for you to recognize, right? That there, there are two very different ways of designing, two very different results. One is um, predetermined in a way, and the other is almost arbitrary. So um, not unlike the last project, I wonder how important it is for you, for your um, prospective inhabitants, to reemerge from the earth, turn around and see your project. Is it important for them to see that shape, that form, and equate it with the ocean, or, um, or not? 
I mean, I I think it could go either way. Like, I really like the view that it gets, but I mean, it's a pers- each person's like particular uh, journey through the space. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the waveform really came from like the angles that the sun makes, like reaching out like towards like the the solstice and the um, like the winter solstice and the summer solstice and then the equinox. So, so does I begin to bring light in in a particular way. I mean, I'm just trying to understand better how you arrived at that final form. Because one thing I think that it would actually do that is pretty interesting is if you look at amphitheaters, right? Um, they collect sound and reflect it back. So your form is, is very much like an amphitheater. And I can imagine that the, it's gonna amplify the sound of the ocean, right? It's going to almost intensify that experience of being, you know, looking out at the sea and being surrounded by the sound of the sea, which I think could be, you know, amazing, quite remarkable. But um, but it's it's not it's not a picture of a wave, and it's not about light. It's about something else altogether. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think I I'm, I have uh, trouble understanding your project in terms of how. Uh, the sun is in the use of the sun or, or, or the solstice that you were talking about are uh, being used in your project and how the form of the project kind of re- responds to that, uh, especially when we see again. I'm, I'm seeing your your your, uh, your uh, project, the first uh, iteration that you had, is actually kind of responding to the to the movement of the sun. But then suddenly, I don't know if I have trouble understanding your project because um, some of the, uh, the floor plans, the elevations, mm-hmm. I don't need, I, I, I think they need a little bit of uh, uh, cal- cal- calibration because it's hard for me to understand um, where the spaces are located. I think it's a very nice technique. It's, uh, I mean, the way that they have been, they have been drawn, but it, I mean, I, I have trouble understanding the spaces, especially I'm seeing now section one, for example, east, west, and I, I'm, have, I'm having trouble understanding, you know, how you go through the first space where the tree is located to the next space where you're, you're showing the interior of this chamber and then how you go out to this um, sort of like the amphitheater. So I think you need to, um, even though they have um, this very nice technique, you, you need to calibrate so we understand the spatial uh, quality of each one of these, uh, uh, these uh, elements of your uh, composition so uh, but yeah but you know the, the use of the sound could be could have been very interesting in, in your project I don't see how it is uh, reflected um, uh, you know uh, I was uh, you know when I see the, the interior renders uh, I was uh, those remind me of the Cenopath uh, by Violet Ledoux for example you know I was kind of thinking well maybe this is something that creates a very special chamber totally dark and then uh, through those very tiny openings is how you inform the user about the soul size and uh, how, how about the movement of the sun and so on. But that really doesn't happen. So that's why I had uh, trouble understanding uh, your project conceptually, you know, from the point of view of the use of the sun. Um, and then also because of the drawings, I mean, you need to calibrate those drawings so, so we understand them better uh, right. I mean, what is the where, where are the levels? Where where are you cutting? Hey, where are the surfaces? Uh, uh, roof, uh, floors, uh, walls, uh, something like that. You know that kind of uh, uh, helps us to understand the special quality of each one of those uh, uh, chambers. Very, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think some just very conventional informational documents. You know, a conventional site plan, a couple of very conventional plans. Um, would help us understand this project, particularly since it is again about you know these spaces that are arrayed. Um, you know, it, it's not not everything is held within a single volume, right? And so, really understanding how those spaces relate to each other, how they're connected, we need a document that sort of stitches your project back together for us. Those are great comments. Um... And I uh, really appreciate those, uh, uh, Marina. I think you have a lot of good takeaways from here. Um, thank you so much for, for the presentation.
Yeah, thank you guys. Let's move on to Domini. Hi, um, okay, so I'm gonna start with a quick presentation and then I'll do a walkthrough of my Um, so the basis for my model is um, the ashram system, which is um, part of Hindu philosophy. And it's basically these four stages of life that someone experiences before they die. And through these stages, they can kind of prepare themselves for death. And the main concept for my model is I wanted death to be something that wasn't frightening or scary because these people are choosing to die. I want it to be something that is really beautiful and natural and a normal part of life. Um, so I began my project just by looking at these four stages, um, the student life, household life, retired life, and renounced life, and just kind of researching about what they go through through those stages and how kind of the emotions that you feel as you go through them. Um, a little bit of inspiration, how I kind of began my form was um, looking at, um, this is the city of Varanasi in India on the Ganges River. And when people are cremated, their ashes are released over this river, so they kind of become one with the water. And that's something I really wanted to convey in my project, people going towards the water and kind of going back to the water and becoming one with um, the ocean. Um, I looked a lot at um, mosques and Islamic architecture, um, kind of um, for the form and for the emotion that you feel. I wanted death to be something really peaceful, and I feel that these spaces are really peaceful. And this um, water element also you can see in all of these courtyard spaces. Um, this is another um, mosque in, it's a palace in Spain and the climate of the Mediterranean is really similar to the climate in Malibu and in Southern California. So I thought these kind of open spaces were something that could really be utilized because of the mild climate. Um, another thing I looked at are, um, these are called jollies. They're in, um, seen a lot in India and they kind of help for circulation and you can see these kind of patterns, which I um, drew a little bit of inspiration from in my form. And this is another jolly. This is a photo that I took actually in Robbers Pond last year. Um, so this is my site plan. Um, you can kind of see the four stages here. Um, this first space is kind of just a, almost like a portal that takes you down. There's a set of stairs that takes you down into the beach, onto the beach. And my entire building sits right along the water. And then you can see these um, four stages here that represent life. And I'll go into those a little bit more in my walk through the model. But you can see the water kind of becomes a more and more dominant aspect as you go to the last stage, which is completely filled up with water and it's on the ocean. Um, this is the elevation looking from the northwest. Um, you can see kind of the stages and the spaces and how they line up and the progression towards the water. Um, this is looking from the ocean and you can see kind of this pathway that takes you towards the spaces and how they kind of line up and um, the arches line up as I go throughout. Um, this is the floor plan. You can see the stages a little bit more clearly now. Um, this first one is an open courtyard, um, which takes you to your next space. And then the third one and the last one, which is on the water. Um, here's a section. Um, also looking from the same view and you can see kind of how they line up and how a person walks through them towards the end. Another section um, from the ocean. And then here's some renderings. Um, this is kind of this first pathway once you go down the stairs and you emerge from that kind of darker space towards the end. And here you can kind of see my last two spaces. Um, this is from the third space, which is the household life, looking towards the end. And then this is the final stage where it's very open. And another part of my project, which I thought to mention was this renunciation of material desires. So as you go through, you become less and less connected to material and the material world, and you're completely ready to kind of go into this water and give up your life. And then I can do a run through of my model. Um, yeah, so this is the first step. This isn't one of the four stages, but this kind of transports you down towards the end and towards the final stage. Um, 
So this is essentially just a long set of stair stairways that um, takes you down towards this. You can see the stairs taking you all the way down. Oh, sorry. And then you go finally down the stairs and you reach this tunnel where you're kind of emerging towards the beach and you can start to see um, the sunlight and the light going into the space. And here you can't see the ocean yet. Um, and this is the first kind of pathway and the first view of the monument. And as you go through um, the cliff, it becomes, it slopes downwards. You can kind of start to see the ocean as you go through it. Okay, so this is the first stage. Um, this is the one that represents student life. Um, I want it to be really a pathway because you're growing up and you're, as you go through the space, um, the water is a big part of this, but you're not, you can't go through the water. It's a very kind of linear progression and it's more straight than where you follow and it's completely kind of embedded in the cliff. So it's not as, you don't have as much freedom in the space. And then this is the second space. This is um, the household life. So you have the option to kind of meander around this area, around these arches and um, through, or you can kind of walk in the water. And this begins with this kind of renunciation of material desires. So you can kind of start, you can take off your shoes and you can walk through the water um, to go through this space. And on the outside, um, you can see this kind of steel framing over the glass, which was inspired by the Jollies. And then this is a view you kind of see that goes to the next few stages and how all these archways kind of line up. Um, this is the third stage. Um, before you begin the renounced life, it's the retired life. So it's becoming less material already. Um, it's less enclosed, the roof is fully open and it's a less social space than the one before. And it's kind of preparing yourself towards the final stage. And here is the final space. Um, this is the renounced life. So you, you can see it's kind of completely in the water. People are actually walking through the water. Um, and it's kind of this final renunciation of materials. It's completely open and there's no kind of enclosures. So you can kind of fully become one with nature. No. There are a couple aspects of your project that I actually like quite a lot. Um, one is the, I mean, for me, I, it was a moment where you entered your project that was defined by a gate, right? Mm -hmm. You entered a space through that kind of articulated gate. Mm -hmm. And then you exit your project through a similar gate. So you're really marking these two very important moments, right? Um, the moment of departure and the moment of arrival, right? And everything that sort of... Um, extends between those two. I would, I would, I almost think of your project as sort of an inflated threshold, right? 
a threshold being something that, that you know, exists between two spaces that often marks, it holds the space between arrival and departure, okay? So um, if you think that the example I, I often use is of Gothic cathedrals, where the, you, you, as you move up to the facade of the cathedral, the door is really recessed, right? Back in space, and it's a big door. And so you are actually standing in the space between the earthly realm, you know, and the heavenly realm. So, you know, that kind of threshold, right? So I think your project is sort of this elongated or this attenuated threshold between these two gates, these moments of arrival and departure. Um, and I think that, could, that has the potential of being really powerful. Um, I also really appreciate the fact that yours is the first project we've seen so far that actually takes responsibility for um, um, the moment when the occupant you know, enters the ocean. Because before it was like, okay, my project ends here, they go down to the beach, they get in the ocean, right? And for you, that moment is, a, is very much a part of your project. It's the terminus of the project, right? Um, and so you, you, you really, I hate this phrase, but you really took ownership of that moment, right? And I think that's also very um, powerful. I like the way you used water to organize movement through the space. So the first was that channel of water that you walked alongside. The second room had the, the pool of water that you had to navigate around. You know, the third chamber, you know, you had to kind of, you started to move through it. And then, you know, in the fourth, you're in the ocean, right? So using water as an element to organize your space and organize circulation and movement through the space and how that slows down the trajectory of the um, visitor, right? When you're moving alongside something, you're moving pretty quickly. When you move around it, that becomes more contemplative, right? Um, you're, you're standing in water, that sort of impedes your passage, but now you're actually engaged with it and then you're submerged, right? So um, I think it'd be great for you to kind of almost write the narrative of how you imagine people engaging the water you know, in this project, because I think that would help with my final comment, which is yeah. we need to edit. The yeah. experience is so wonderful and so profound, but the, the, the introduction of the, the articulated screens is a distraction. So um, yeah. when you're talking about how open um, the spaces start to become, I think you can do that in other ways. So I think that, that you're interested in these screens, you know, maybe you have a history with them. Um, they're certainly beautiful, but I think they're a distraction. They take away from the essential experience of your project. They become more about ornament and less about, um, again, the experience, okay? Mm -hmm. So I would look for other ways of allowing your enclosure to um, start to open up, start to disappear as you move through the space, if it's even there at all. You know, mm -hmm. it could be something where you start with a high wall and the walls start to get lower, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but for me, you know, it's, it's all about how you used water to, mm -hmm. um, again, help organize circulation, help organize your spaces. And for me, that's where the power of your project is. And it's not in how those spaces get um, embellished. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, th I think it's a very interesting project. Um, I really like the uh, third image that you showed us in the, in the presentation, uh, this photograph uh, in India that shows uh, this, uh, this uh, direct relationship with the water. And I think that's fantastic how your project is kind of responding to that image. So in that sense, it's, um, it's uh, it's a very uh, interesting way how you solve the project from the top of the hill from the top of the cliff um, towards the water i mean how you use these several uh courtyards where where water is manipulated in order to recreate the same uh feeling that i i mean that i see when i when i see this photograph uh, right and i think that's fascinating how you had, were able to translate that first image um through your project or in your project or to your project. Um, 
Then one of the things that I, I really like of your project also is uh, I see the Northwest elevation. I don't know if you can go back to that one. Oh, yeah. uh, I okay, think it's very interesting your presentation? Yeah. In, yeah. Yeah. Um, in the way that you can um, you see a very interesting relationship of this sequence of spaces, this sequence of corridors. But when I see the plan, it kind of distracts me um, well, the side plan, especially, it kind of it distracts me the way that you have organized the circulation according to this L shape uh, a pathway. And I think that's kind of distracting. I think if we go back again to the first photograph of this uh, photo in, in India, everything happened mm -hmm. uh, according to a, a straight uh, axis, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I think uh, since you're, you're at the very last chamber, at the very last uh, space, you're kind of uh, um, you are uh, on the water, you're actually on the, on the ocean. I think it could be very interesting in your project if you have uh, worked uh, this uh, sequence uh, of couriers uh, along a straight axis, right? Something like that, instead of making yeah. this L shaped thing, right? Okay. Because, I mean, you had, you, you, I mean, you, I think that you, that happened because you didn't have enough space on the beach to uh, yeah. locate all these couriers. But mm -hmm. since you're in the, very, in the very last space, you're actually on the water, you needed maybe just to accommodate those a little bit further from the shore, right? Mm -hmm. Having a straight uh, axis that you, you know, takes you from the, the upper part all the way down and then through this sequence of uh, couriers, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it, 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 that organization according to a straight axis would have been uh, better in your project from my point of view. Mm -hmm. um, because I think it's very distracting, you know, this having this L shape, and then when you once you descend, and then suddenly you could see, you know, towards your left, the ocean, and then you see mm -hmm. uh, the next corridor and so on. And I think, you know, if you had everything organized according to a straight axis, could have been even better. Then I think uh, it's very interesting this um, uh, way of uh, dematerializing your project. That was the desperation, I think, in your project from using these uh, massive, uh, uh, or yeah, uh, walls, right, being uh, transforming to these more um, um, uh, linear uh, walls, right? Uh, and I think it's, uh, I think it's something very literal in your project. I think that was the intention. So maybe at the very last chamber, maybe those uh, arches, the, these uh, wire arches just maybe disappear, or something like that, you know, some, 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 mm -hmm. some, something more provocative. But I think it's a very interesting project. I really love the, the way that you're manipulating this sequence of spaces, uh, you know, through water, this uh, sequence of couriers, I, I think are very interesting. Uh, one of the things that I would love to, 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 to say also is that you, you have to think of the, of the symbolism of the arc right, of the arches, the use of the arches. I mean, I think that is something that you have maybe, you, maybe you needed to mention something about that, right? I mean, what, okay. what's the symbolism of the arch, the archetype, right? The archetype, mm -hmm. well, that, that's, that, that, that's been. But beyond that, I think it's, it's a very interesting project. Mm -hmm. Just edit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? Is that mm -hmm. supporting, is it uh, furthering, um, you know, what I'm trying to achieve. Thank you so much, guys. Great, yeah. great comments. Um, thank you, Dominique. Thank you. And we'll move next with Nicole. Nicole, you ready? Yeah, just give me a couple seconds. No worries, no worries. Okay. All right, so I guess I'll go ahead and just start with a brief um, design statement. So uh, my memorial focuses on the experience of remembrance and letting go of a long life. So the visitor is first led through a procession that presents them with several environments to encourage reflection, taking them first down into the earth to reflect on the physicality of life and human memory, and then gradually up and into a more ethereal reflection space of wonder and ideology. 
viewer's journey is completed as they follow the building's thrust outward and into the sky, leaving behind the physical world as the cliff drops beneath them and the ocean stretches below the frame setting of this one. Um, so I think I'm going to go ahead and take y'all through my um, physical my, uh, model first. Let's see. All right, so, okay. So we enter here, and this is the part where you're being taken down um, into the earth. And, oops. So, we, um, the, the first part, it's kind of divided into three major um, ramps or stairways, one representing kind of childhood, one adulthood, and one um, elderly. Um, childhood, it's a bit, it's a shallow incline, easy adulthood, you have the stairs, you have um, some interest, and then um, as you reach the end of your life, uh, you can see kind of the end. Um, and then uh, something about the corners here, they do, rep um, it is a very linear procession, you're not supposed to see like where exactly you come from because you can't really revisit the past so um nicole sorry to yes. interrupt i think we saw that your battery is running low oh do you mind if i plug it in real quick please please do uh, we don't <laughs> want to move you or your presentation <laughs> by any <All> chance right. <laughs> yes we'll wait for you don't worry <laughs> yeah it, it happens to all of us we ignore those uh, warnings and then boom, we get all disconnected so <laughs> So sorry about that, I'm back. No worries. Okay, so um, yeah. And we then enter this kind of other reflection space and this um, water will be cascading down. Um, I haven't figured out how to do that in landscape yet, but um, this is kind of a reflection space of the decision that you've, you've made. Like you can see up into the next space a little bit. This is kind of like the actual, you know, decision. I'm moving on to the next stage in life. And so you walk up this way and follow the light here into this next chamber of ethereal reflection. And this kind of draws on uh, Gothic arches just a little bit to kind of capture that uh, spiritual sense and you're walking through the water on this polished uh, marble floor and you're, you know, you get the chance to wander around and just, you know, enjoy the light quality and think. Um, and in the last piece, you are led out into the sky as the sun begins to set and you are able to see that framed here over the ocean. Um, yeah. And so that's, go ahead and bring us back to the presentation. So Nicole, is that um, curved cut mm -hmm. um, there to allow light to come in at sunset? Yes. Or it just is. that cut? Yeah. So, um, here I'll so the solar orientation is kind of, I guess, important because I do want to very much frame that view. The sun sets in the very far uh, corner of the plan here. So um, the building is directed uh, so that you can get a very nice view of that over the ocean. Um, so I guess, you know, for very briefly, I'll take some, through some of my influences. I wanted to kind of experiment with um, light quality a bit and what kind of um, figures and stuff spark this kind of feeling of reverence, but also joy. Because um, this is very much about um, memory and being, you know, reflective of your life, but also definitely about letting go. Um, some of my earlier iterations um, experimented with arch types and procession, but I always did want to have this kind of uh, extension into the sky because that's 
you know, in, you know, most cultures I've found, you know, up is, you know, ascension. It's, um, you know, release. So uh, a couple of sketches of more finalized things and then uh, into the drawing. Another thing to kind of note, um, the building is placed on the side already. There are some uh, rocks that exist and they kind of point directly out into the ocean. So I wanted to make sure to kind of um, relate to those. Um, so from one elevation and then the other, um, something I didn't mention in the presentation, but there's also like the water that you're walking through for the entire top part of the uh, procession. Uh, it's spilling out into the ocean. You're not really supposed to like jump which is something that I realize is, might be indicated. Um, but yes, that's there. Um, some more elevations. Uh, section here, you can see um, going into the ground and then right back up through the spaces. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And floor plans. So, and I, I did, um, there's kind of a, a playing off of each other, of the arch forms and some also very geometric forms. Mm -hmm. Arches kind of relate back to uh, you know, spirituality um, and height and stuff. The rest of it, it's like, you know, you're familiar with a lot of geometries like uh, circles, triangles, hexagons, etc. And then being presented with those on kind of a, a very large and powerful scale, it's like, you know, it's familiar, but it's also new. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's powerful. Like you're in this space, you, you want to feel both comfortable and, you know, like this is something that's happening. Like I'm making this decision to, uh, you know, go out of life. So. I, um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing again the presentation in my computer, and I think it's very interesting. I love your your sketches, the, all the sketches, uh, and then the first renderings of your project. And I think uh, um, all of them capture your interest in the interior space. And I think those are very interesting images um, that you have been able to really take take them all to the next level in the final uh, version of your project. And I think that's very interesting, right? I mean, so, uh, and even the rest of the renderings that you showed us, all of them capture the interior space. So that's that's very interesting in, in, in your project. Um, then when, when I think, and, and I think that's the, the, the best part of your project. I don't know if you can take us, I'm looking at the plan now. And I think the oh, plan okay. is very interesting um, in a way that is very clear how the circulation works and how you're kind of uh, through the circulation take the user to discover the jewel, right? This uh, sort of like cathedral uh, in the interior of your uh, building, which is fascinating. And I think it's very, very clear. I don't know if I can annotate here. I'm gonna try to do that. I don't know how, how here. Um, well, let me see if I find the annotate tool. Where is it? Well, I can find it. Anyway. So you'll be was... next to your view options, if you click down probably. But if for some reason, yeah, we don't have on her presentation. Yeah, we don't have it anyways. Well, mm -hmm. I was, you know, what, what is uh, marked in, in white in your plan, I think is, is fascinating. It's very clear. It's very uh, clear to understand. It's very easy to understand how the simulation works. It takes you to the upper, from the upper part all the way through these very uh, concealed um, uh, pathways. And then you take the user to discover this jewel right at the center of the plan. And then you take them, uh, take them again out uh, to discover the ocean, and then with sunset, I think it's a very interesting uh, movement. So, uh, my question would be like, you know, what is? Do you really need? I mean, you were uh, thinking all the time about the interior space, and then suddenly you decided to encapsulate the whole building, the whole the circulation, especially using these sort of like two walls, uh, right uh, towards the the west and the east. And then uh, in order to conceal the whole project, they con in order to conceal the entire interior space. So I don't know if you, I don't know if you need them at all. I mean, uh, those uh, uh, two walls, especially, uh, maybe you just need to uh, work with walls that 
work the profile of the wider space and that will be it, right? So I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. So, because when, when you see the, the perspectives, especially of, uh, you know, seeing the object, you know, it's more about the interior space than the object, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think, you know, to, to design these walls, the walls that we see there in that image are probably unnecessary, you know, in terms of just guiding the interior space of, uh, according to your uh, desire. Uh, but I think it's a very interesting project. I, I like uh, the way that the project is uh, extended to the horizon uh, from uh, from the upper part of the cliff, and you know, it kind of uh, gives this impression that the building is hidden, and it suddenly kind of projects you to the next level of of their afterlife. And I think that's a very interesting uh, aspect. But I think uh, you know, um, going back to your idea of uh, of the interior spaces and how you circulate uh, through these interior spaces. I think it's the, the, the most interesting aspect of your project. Um, I think it's, it's, it's very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we talked about all the other projects in terms of sort of that experiential sequence, right? Moving through it. And we could certainly talk about yours in the same way, but I almost want to talk about yours more as an object you would see from somewhere else. Um, I think there is sort of a tension of friction between the sort of you know, the fractured geometry, the, the um, faceted geometry of the exterior walls and the circular arched chamber within, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one thing, the reason I asked about that cut was because it did seem very intentional, right? So you're bringing mm -hmm. light in, in a particular way. So that's the reason, you know, it's, 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 you're carving to achieve a particular, um, effect, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I find that move very effective formally because it does look intentional, right? The other wall does this, this wall does that. It doesn't look arbitrary, right? But some of the other faceting seems somewhat arbitrary. And I know some of it is the result of trying to, you know, hold the circulation in a particular way and guide movement. But I think the dialogue between that interior chamber, which, um, has such a strong um, presence um, in your project. Um, so the tension between the external walls and that interior chamber, I think mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just want maybe there to be less of a conflict between them. You mm -hmm. know, like maybe the exterior walls just simply hold the, the cliff face back, right? And allow this chamber to come up until the, mm -hmm. the walls emerge from the cliff and you get that one very powerful cut, right? So mm -hmm. everything seems like it's doing what it needs to do in the simplest, most straightforward way possible, right? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a tendency, particularly where you guys are in the program, and I've certainly noticed it in my studio as well, to think you have to make things really complicated, right? Like. <laughs> It's not sufficient to be able to walk down a narrow corridor. The narrow corridor has to zig and zag and do all this stuff. And maybe one or two of those moves is important. But you know, to do it 30 times, um, you know, in the interest of, of making something maybe spatially more complex, um, when in fact all it does is make it spatially more complicated, which is not necessarily a good thing. So um, I think there's there's a a fear of maybe trying to make a design statement in a clear, straightforward way. That there's this desire, and I think it's an exorcism. I think it's a formal exorcism. You guys need to get this stuff out of your system, right? <laughs> um, so that maybe you can come to a point where you you cannot just um, appreciate things said you know, sort of simply, but kind of embrace the, the complexity that, or the, yeah, the complexity that can come out of a very simple situation. Uh -huh. right? So um, I would encourage you, like the earlier project, to maybe edit a little bit. You know, whatever you are um, inclined to introduce another element into the project, ask yourself whether that is really furthering what you're trying to achieve, and if not, you know, get rid of it, right? Because yeah. um, I, 
you know, there's, there's, there's much that I like about your project. Um, but I think you could have done it with four or five moves instead of 15 or 20. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, I totally agree. I don't know if we have time for our last comment uh, and jump here, but I think, you know, uh, I wish that your plan we have a couple was, minutes, yes. uh, was only about what we see in white, especially when I see the, the, the plan uh, mm -hmm. of the left. You know, I, when I see those uh, areas, uh, those black areas, especially, I, I wish that I can get rid of those and just leave the plan with the white and then, mm -hmm. you know, being defined white walls uh, by walls that kind of guide you or guide the circulation mm -hmm. or contain the space that is sort of like the cathedral in the center and then, you know, two outer uh, walls coming out or kind of, kind of coming out of that cathedral just to define that sort of like a cone that you have. And that will be it, you know, uh, and, and still it's about the interior space, it's about the, the, this very ephemeral space that you wanted to create in the interior, especially at the center of the project. And then, and that was it, you know, the minimal, the minimum movements in order to achieve a fantastic uh, uh, building. And uh, so I think, yeah, it's, it's when, when you started to, you know, you, you, you were thinking, you know, I need to design a building. So when you started to, you know, put the walls and sort of like, you know, put them uh, to mm -hmm. conceal the interior space in some ways, and then then uh, is when I think uh, everything you started to to create this uh, object that was, in my opinion, unnecessary. Right? It was mostly about the interior mm -hmm. space. But I think you know you have very interesting moments. I don't know if the only thing that I didn't. Um, uh, quite understand was the use of the arch when you were descending, when you were you were approaching. Um, mm -hmm. In the first ramp, you had uh, some arches towards uh, the left. Yeah, if you can remember those yeah. exactly. I don't know. I mean, the, the, if the, those were necessary, you know, it's yeah. when when mm -hmm. I, I really agree with uh, Judith in terms of editing. You know, I don't know why you need to do that. It's right. mostly about you know having this uh, very narrow corridor guiding you to the interior of this jewel that you wanted to create and then taking you again out of it to discover the horizon in front of you and see the sunset and that was it you know very simple very direct uh, and, and very powerful conceptually speaking um i think i think you need to say this is where you jump off into the ocean this is how you okay. do it you know, you can't, you can't leave us literally hanging like that without saying, this is the opportunity I am giving you, right? So, you know, I don't know if you guys have been to Barton Springs. Hopefully we'll all get to go to Barton Springs sometime again in the future. There are <laughs> ways to go into Barton Springs, right? You can go the slow, you go down to the kitty end where the water is kind of shallow and it's a little bit warmer because it's more shallow and you can kind of walk in slowly, right? So you're sort mm -hmm. of, um, you're really drawing out the torture, right? Or you can go up to the diving board in and that's it. You're, you dive in. There's no going, once you're in the air, there's no going back, right? No. You have 20 yeah. kids behind you, so you better jump. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> otherwise. Um, so I think that's what you've given us. You know, there's no stair down to the beach. I think in your mind, you knew that that's what was gonna happen, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's fine. I mean, I don't, I, I can't imagine being 600 years old and, um, you know, whether at that point I would want to die or not, but we have, we are humans, right? We, mm -hmm. we resist the unknown. We resist, um, giving up the life that even after 600 years, I would hope I was still enjoying I think most people are going to need that push, you know? Mm. So I would say that your whole project was about moving to that end. Again, take ownership of it. They're going off. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and different than the other projects that we have seen, I think it's very interesting that your movement pretty much happens in the, in, in the horizon um, or horizontally, right? I think that even I mean you have that very tiny instance where you have to to descend and then you have to go back again up right or something uh, vice versa but I, but I think it's very horizontal and I think that helps the project to kind of uh, 
project them, uh, project itself to, towards the horizon. And I think, you know, that creates this very specific moment at the very end towards the, the ocean where you have this difference of height that is very interesting, right? That we haven't seen in other projects. And then uh, that kind of emphasized the idea of what Judy was saying before, you know, in terms of jumping to die, right? You know, uh, once you see the sunlight coming, <laughs> sunlight and then, or the sunset, and then suddenly you decide to jump to die. So, you know, the difference of height could have benefited also your project in, in that sense, right? To reinforce the concept of the simulation at the very end, right? And the decision of making your building totally horizontal, right? Mm. Great comments, nice. guys. really appreciate it. Nico, thank you so much. It's been uh, very exciting. So we're now with the last presenter. Um, last but not least, Daisy. Mm -hmm. Hi. Okay, so I'm gonna start by reading kind of just like my general description simultaneously going through the project. So, um, my project is trying to explore the possible emotions someone would feel if they were choosing to peacefully pass into the afterlife. And this model is designed to allow a person to slowly let go of the life as they know it and prepare for something much greater. Um, one underlying rule used throughout this project is the number three, as it holds much significance in various cultures, religions, and in mathematics. Um, and the memorial is comprised of three spaces that allow a person to appreciate the life they have lived while encouraging and guiding them to move on, both literally within the monument and figuratively within their spirit. My project was led by three conceptual trios, body, mind, spirit, earth, um, sky, earth, and sea, past, present, and future. So I'll continue to read it. Um, so the first space is meant to focus on the body, sky, and the past. I felt like I grouped them more the ones that were more related to like themselves in that moment. Um, so it's a space that is meant to fit the human body, connect with the sky and allow for them to give a good last look at the city and the life as they know it while simultaneously providing a small uh, peek at the sea, which is the final destination. And so, um, yeah, that's it right there. The second space is based off of um, mind, earth, and the present. This is a reflection space that promotes introspection and the realization of the journey they have embarked on. It's grounded in the earth as a link between the past and the future. And then, um, yes, this is the reflection space and it's underground. Um, and then the last space is focused on spirit, sea, and the future. Uh, the visitor is ready to surrender to the mystifying sea, seemingly so familiar, yet in actuality, we almost know nothing about it, but we're so, we feel like so connected with it. Um, and this is supposed to represent that the visitor spirit is ready. So it's kind of supposed to be like a progression of um, the visitor spirit in multiple ways. I think using the number three kind of kept it, um, I guess, open to different cultures and religions, since three is a very, plays a very active role in a lot of the different things, even if you're not religious. I mean, it's, it's very important and familiar. Um, so I have my digital presentation here. Um, so yeah, three, that's my concept. Um, yeah, so just some examples of ways that we are all familiar with threes, like birth, life, death, red, yellow, blue, child, adult, senior, father, mother, child, life, death, and rebirth. Um, yeah, and it could also mean something that's very solid, real, substantial, complete, entire. Um, and so this is like concept again. Um, here I just add that nature is constantly kind of interrupting the, the flow of the project as if it's kind of saying like, I'm here, bye, like I'm kind of greeting you. Um, so you're not completely alone through the journey, um, kind of like stuff that you're familiar with to guide you through. Um, so my first space um, is about the past body and sky. And these are just some inspirations um, that led me to where I got, um, where I captured the view of the city. Um, I definitely got inspired by um, Chapel on the Water. 
because it was just such a simple concept but so powerful. Um, my second space was the present mind and earth. Um, I think a large room, a large reflex, reflection space was great for you to kind of introspect and realize almost how insignificant you are in a good way. Um, and just kind of give you time like, wow, I did this, I'm in it, let's go forward. Um, and then my third space was the future sea and spirit. Um, definitely very inspired by this tunnel in Japan. Um, and these are some sketches. I knew from the beginning I wanted to do three different uh, spaces. One that focused more on the past, one that was definitely centered in the middle, and then one that focused more on the future. Um, my form was definitely inspired by um, Luis Baragan because I loved how, how simple it was and powerful. Um, the colors don't really come into play in the model until my drawings, but um, yeah, I thought that was a very interesting sort of, I love his work, it's great. Um, so yeah, there's some early Baragan um, explorations of the model. And um, here's my site plan. And this is where I tried to incorporate the different colors. Um, I made a tiny mistake in the bottom with the copy and paste error, so excuse me, the labels, but yeah. Um, so this is the first space, definitely more open, a little bit more like complicated than the other spaces. And it's supposed to be like the humanly space. So I kind of saw that relationship. And I feel like the spaces get simpler as you go, kind of representing your, your kind of digging through yourself, all the complicated parts of yourself to your spirit. And then the last space, here's the reflection space section. Um, the third uh, hallway section. And then the elevations of the front and the elevations of the back with the city in the back. And then here are my renders of the first space. And then your la the last time you look back at the city Zen garden before you descend into the reflection space. And here is your last um, space. I wanted there to be a distinct disconnection between um, that tunnel that takes you out of the second space and the last space, as you can see right here, that I tried to do. Um, it also gives a great light quality during the early day. Um, here's the second space. Sorry, is that a word? The, yeah, so the reflection space. Oh, this is your tunnel into the last space. And yeah, that's it. I have the model open if you guys want to see any particular parts of it too. wants to go first <laughs> <laughs> well i was uh, i was uh, thinking uh, that you know especially when you showed us these uh, three first uh, spaces and i don't know if you can go back to those images i'm sorry that you have to scroll down all the way no, to, to the pipeline but i don't know if you can go back but you know i was uh, thinking that those uh, three spaces are very interesting i mean those are photographs of uh, presidents that you were using right go up uh, mm -hmm. to, i don't know if those images are too far from where you are now uh, oh, where no. it's uh, first in space, uh, pass by the sky, and then you 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 use oh. uh, just a second space, present mind and earth, and then so on. And I think mm -hmm. you're kind of uh, making a very interesting contrast between these uh, three spaces uh, through these precedents, especially this one, for example, you were talking about, you know, when I see the textures, when I see the vegetation, the light, the, the sky, um, the water, and so on, I think, you know, in the, uh, considering your intention, of, uh, you know, I see this image is kind of considering everything that we see uh, or consider as granted, right? Uh, mm. uh, before we go to the next level, then can you uh, move to the second space? Mm -hmm. the, then the second space is more intimate, especially if you go to the two next ones. Uh, can you pass that one, that one, and that one? Next one, mm -hmm. next one. Yeah. Go to the next one. That, and so that one is a uh, more intimate space. It's more about uh, reflection. It's, it's more about the transition that you're going to make. And that's very interesting. And then the next one, where you have the third space, uh, future spirit and sea, you know, the connection. I, I really like that image because it's about the skylight, you know, this very uh, linear uh, skylight that you have there and where the stair 
uh, meet this uh, skyline. I think it's a very interesting um, a point, you know, where you see kind of mm -hmm. this uh, tiny horizon at the end of those, where those two lines connect. And I think that's very powerful. So you had, I think you had very interesting ideas for these uh, three spaces. You wanted to, to divide your project into these three components. And I think you had very powerful ideas. Mm -hmm. But once I see your project being developed, I think it became, you can now move to the site plan or uh, the other parts of your project. What, but especially when I see the, the, the site plan, and I think it's, it's wonderful, it's very well developed. You know, it has um, very interesting spaces, uh, circulation uh, I think is very interesting in the way that it kind of takes you around the site, it kind of takes you through very different type of spaces, you know, guided by, by walls, uh, interior courtyards and all that, and I think it's beautiful. And I think you used uh, all the presidents, uh, Luis Barragan and the others, in a very nice way, you kind of made made a very interesting interpretation of those precedents. But but when I see your project, you know, in, in relationship to the three main spaces that you showed us at the beginning of your presentation, is when I, I have a conflict, because I think you 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 developed your project too architecturally. I mean, don't take me wrong, but I think you you thought of your project too much as an architect. Yeah, and I think you needed to step back a little bit. And to think about the intention of the, of, of, of the exercise, which is about more um, using the concept. I mean, how is that you're going to be able to create a concept? I mean, how, is, how are you going to be able to transfer all these ideas that you had through the precedents or your concepts or the original ideas, the triad, for example, these three elements that are present in all kind of things in, in our lives, how you are going to be able to translate those ideas into something that is more conceptual, right? And I think your project is beautifully executed, you know, but it's too architectural, in my opinion. And don't tell me wrong, this is fantastic, but I think, you know, you needed to calibrate, maybe, you know, to step back a little bit and to think less uh, than an architect and to think more as a, uh, as a concept maker. I don't know how to, how, how to describe that. But I think, you know, nevertheless, I think you have done a very interesting uh, work. I think, you know, even in the expression, in the way that you have expressed your drawings to color, you know, the textures and all that, the, the, the interior spaces, you have, the, you have this very um, nice intuition of how to create spaces, beautiful spaces, and, you know, uh, to develop uh, what uh, any project needs, right? Uh, but I just wish that it was more specu speculative, right? Um, that it was uh, your project was tied more to the to the concept, to the idea, to the ideal of this uh, concept, right? Of the making the transition of uh, through these uh, three type of spaces, right? That you wanted to capture from the very beginning. So I don't know w when or how that I was that was lost. I'm not saying that your project is. I think your project is fantastic, but I wish that it reinforced more those aspirations that you had through those three main spaces that we saw. Is it maybe like too disconnected? No, no, no. I think I think it's fantastic. I mean, it's not. I mean, any of those uh, three elements that you have in your project. I mean, they're not disconnected. But it's, maybe they were more about the experience. They were they were maybe about the, uh, about the, the atmosphere that you wanted to create. I mean, it, it, maybe mm -hmm. some of those spaces were more ephemeral. Were more uh, especially for the for the third image, the third space. You know, the, the image that, that I'm seeing in my screen uh, because I have open your, your presentation here. Oh. Uh, in box and I see you know the connection between this sky like a very nice line of uh, 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 sky there meeting yeah. meeting the stair right mm -hmm. at, at that point um, well I'm talking about the third space in in, in the precedent but you know but, and, oh. and I think that that's fantastic in that moment I think you know it's very it's spiritual you know in, in, in terms of kind of calibrating you know the concept of a project you know where those mm -hmm. uh, the two elements meet, you know, in this uh, line where the, the, the stair meet the, the, the sky. So those uh, kind of uh, very um, fine uh, gestures, I, I wish that you you could have applied in, in some moments of your project, right? And instead of being uh, too architecturally applied, yeah. right? <laughs> what about the personal experience? Like, what are these people actually going to see? Yeah, I think, you know, your project is fantastic. And especially, well, you have uh, this image now you, uh, that you're sharing. And I think it's very interesting that you have the stairway kind of descending, and then you have the, this uh, wall, right, kind of 
um, and, you know, receiving all the shadow that is being projected from the, the roof mm. and the light, the use of the texture, you know, this sort of like garden to the left, to the right with the rocks and all that. And it's beautiful, it's a beautiful space. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But I wish you could calibrate, I mean, you could you know, add to, to that space some of those concepts that you were um, describing at the very beginning of your presentation, right? I mean, how the triad, uh, how the three elements are expressed uh, in this image, for example, right? And mm -hmm. or how you calibrated those uh, uh, three elements uh, throughout the entire project when you were circulating through it uh, from the start to the end and so on. And, it, I, and I think it's a very well developed project. Maybe it's the, the, the most developed project that we have seen today uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, the circulation. And I think you, you really thought about, you know, the and the, the difference of heights and levels, and you need to calibrate through ramps and stairs, and that it's very well resolved, right? It's, it's beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. But I wish, you know, it had that level of con mm -hmm. uh, concept aspiration uh, that, you know, uh, according to the studio, um, maybe, you know, uh, forces you to uh, speculate a little mm -hmm. bit, to be more playful. Yeah, okay. Right? Probably. <laughs> You know, I was a little nervous when you started talking about the symbolism of the three. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, you know, I know that you guys, you know, in your prior studios, um, I wouldn't say that they are intentionally conceptually dry, but they certainly don't have the um, programmatic punch that this one does, right? Mm -hmm. um, Professor True has asked you to think about things that you probably haven't had to think about yet in your education, right? And, mm -hmm. and not, just, um, not just, you know, everyday things. I mean, things that, that you know, of profound significance, right? Um, and, you know, it's interesting, I was on a review yesterday where the students were, they were graduate students and they were also designing a sacred space. And we were talking about what that meant now, you know, and that there is actually a reticence to talk about these kinds of things um, publicly and in school, you know, um, God is like, I mean, taboo, I'm not doing a cross. <laughs> it's like, it's taboo. <laughs> And for many, you know, probably very good, legitimate reasons, right? But the point was made that architecture has always dealt with these issues. You know, the earliest architecture is tombs. You know, we have, as architects, we have always had to think about, you know, death, life, birth, you know, our relationship to the cosmos, however that's defined, right? Mm -hmm. But I think one problem is that um, when you're taking your first kind of stabs at it, we revert to symbolism and metaphor, assuming that symbolism and metaphor is universal, and it's not. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't want to call attention to, Dom am I saying that right, Domini? Domini's project? But the, the four chambers that, that were to her important because they were um, evoking you know, the four steps in the Hindu, um, in the Hindi tradition, um, mm -hmm. assume sort of that universal knowledge that we don't have, right? Mm -hmm. But there are kind of, kind of, I think there is, a, I don't want to say universally shared experience, but there are things that we kind of all can relate to, you know, like what it means to look up and be, you know, um, oriented to the sky, what it means to look out over an expanse of water. These are kind of, we have visceral reactions to being confronted with those kinds of spaces that I think are universal, you know? And I think you started to get to that in some of your project and that was nice. I think you also sort of averted, um, you know, really going into deep symbolism of threes, right? For you, it was a way of helping bring order to your project. And actually, you're right. I mean, three, you know, in addition to being a number that, that comes up over and over again in religion, interestingly, it comes up over and over again in architecture. For some reason, we think three is an okay thing. It's like two is not enough, four is <laughs> probably too many, but three kind of feels right, you know? Yeah. So um, I think for you, the symbolism is there. 
mm -hmm. people who want to who, who want to think of things that way. But it, you could also just argue that for you, it, it brought order to your project, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, again, I think there are, there are some really nice and direct things that you've done in your project. Um, I think there are some superfluous moves, you know, maybe a few too many, you know, just walls, roof, folds, twists yeah. and turns. Um, mm -hmm. that might be diluting, you know, again, um, an architecture that, that, that really is focused and, and, and provides us with a concentrated experience. Mm -hmm. okay. But I applaud the studio for being willing to take on and talk about some of these like incredibly diff difficult um, issues. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, I mean, uh, that makes sense. I think some of the driving forces, like the three main when you say, okay, well, this arch here is going to take up one third of this, yeah. uh, like, thing here, uh, this wall here. And so that probably um, limited me as to, like, other things I can do that were a little bit more, um, like, yeah. that would fit this. But for me, I'm more interested in why there's an arch. Like, why do you go oh. into this covered space mm -hmm to reemerge into the other space. So why am I going from bright light to shaded to bright light again? You know, mm -hmm. so those are the universal experiences, right? Yes. I guess, well, what I was like trying to do is um, I wanted that um, on the left side, the vertical part of the arch, really to feel like you're grounded and you're safe and you're, you're still in this very like humanly space. And then I was trying to, in a way, um, I guess, um, capture the sky so I didn't want it to be completely open because um, I guess from the other view it's supposed to um, look like it's capturing it from the top but I also understand like sometimes if it's too abstract like that yeah. that's why I think you know your project is more about the experience uh, you know more about those uh, trestles those uh, intersections uh, you know, yes. those relations between the spaces you know it was more, more about the, the atmosphere of those spaces instead of uh, you, I, I, you know, I think you were you were overusing the precedence. You know, when I see your images, your renderings, I think uh, I kind of take those images take me to uh, Campo Baeza's work or Luis Barragan, right? I mean, those mm -hmm. spaces, beautiful spaces, but I think they are very more about. I mean, when I see your images, they are more about the precedence than those experiences, right? Uh -huh. So maybe it's, it was just a matter of, um, uh, you know of uh, when you were presenting your project to you mention some of those experiences uh, through yeah. these uh, spaces, you know, maybe you just miss that, you know, in your presentation, maybe it was just a matter of saying, you know, what were the, the particular intentions in each one of those uh, renderings, in each one of those spaces that were represented through those renderings. Right? Yes, I missed it because she, she always presented the spaces uh, in terms of how it represents the, the past, the body and the, in the sky and the other, which I think is the most successful one, the one underground, uh, it has more experience. There's a more a phenomenological aspect to it, which is the about you know the the uh, earth, you know, and and having you, you forgot to mention that you are actually exposing the cliff and the introduction of water and and how that actually creates you know this. Uh, phenomenon there. What what is the person feeling right now? And I think that's that's what was missing on your presentation. You see, and maybe you can we can talk a little bit, a couple more about that. But I think that's what Ernesto is is also mentioning. You know, what is that emotion that uh, the the people are going through, and how that uh, influences the design decision? Um, yeah. And what are those moments that you have that you consciously done? that reinforce that concept and reinforce that emotion and creates this very, you know, emotional space, you know? Well, yeah, I guess what I forgot to mention is through the video, um, I guess technically there's supposed to be like the sound of the waves, especially That's in the- another thing, sound, it's important and especially in this space, you know? Yeah, it was supposed to be like a sneak peek almost of where yeah. you're going. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I get that definitely. Yeah. Has a big... I think your project has these very interesting moments of uh, being sublime, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. especially when I see those three uh, spaces that you wanted to achieve from the very beginning. I mean, those are spaces that are, I mean, well, the first one is kind of mundane, but it kind of makes a, 
a point of, you know, well, we kind of consider things as, as granted. But then the two, um, the, the next two were about these sublime spaces, about, you know, making you think about things. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and of course, your, your, your spaces are also about that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they are perfectly defined, you know, with the, with the, the walls and, you know, the, the, the pathway going through, through, the, through, the, through the pond and, you know, the water and all that. It's, it's perfectly executed. I mean, it's very refined. Um, so, and, and, but, you know, I wish that you had uh, something to say about, you know, the, the sublime experience, about the, the experience, about the emotion, as uh, Jean-Pierre was saying before, because, you know, when I was reading about the intentions of this, the, the studios, also about the emotions, how you uh, are able to um, transfer the idea of an emotion into architecture, or mm -hmm. how you also kind of speculate about, you know, some of those uh, uh, issues in architecture. And I think, you know, it, your project is very refined in all senses, I mean, from point A to point Z. Um, but maybe it's just a matter of, uh, you know, mention that and that, you know, and that will be it. But it's a, it's a great project. I mean, I, I, I like it a lot. Thank you. And uh, we, we still have a couple, couple more minutes if you guys want to do some final comments for, for the studio, Ernesto and Judith. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, all the projects that we have seen are very interesting. Uh, you know, I think it's very necessary at some point in our education to think uh, conceptually, you know, to, to be able to uh, approach a project with a very precise and uh, a concept, right? And it's something that uh, we uh, need to work all the time in, in our career. And I think uh, it, was a very, it was very interesting also to see that some students um, we're also checking out the memorials, so, you know, because, you know, some memorials, especially the, the, the two that uh, I think uh, Claire was uh, showing us um, at the very beginning, you know, the, the, the memorial at New York and then the, the, the other one in Washington, the Vietnam Memorial. Those are two very, uh, those are very gestural, right? I mean, they're just about a specific gesture, especially the one, the, the Vietnam Memorials, it's about this gesture, but it has so many ideas embedded in that, in that simple gesture, right? right? So I think it's a fantastic uh, precedent in order to understand the, the power of the concept, the power of the, of the gesture. I mean, how the concept, that concept was the, 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 the wounded, right? The, the wound was transferred to this gesture and then in, in order to catapult or, or, or organize the entire project. So I think it's a very, it was a, a very, a, a, it was a very enrich, enriching experience to see all these projects, how they, each one of these students were trying to you know, manipulate those ideas and to transfer those ideas into their uh, final uh, buildings. And I think uh, uh, you have done a very great job uh, in jump here. I, I'm very happy to see these these projects really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm I'm happy that we saw everything from one future narrative because it allowed us to kind of compare apples to apples. Mm -hmm. But I'd be really curious to see how these are different um, formally and conceptually from the other future narratives, right? Very, very, how very different. Kind of common, <laughs> how, how the shifting of the narrative shifts or determines the, 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 the resolution of the project, right? So are the marsh, do the Martians look like the suicide? <laughs> no. Sorry, because these are suicide places. <laughs> no, <all of> <laughs> um, <laughs> does that look like the Martian landscape or whatever, you know? Um, so I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be seeing those, but um, yeah, um, I think I it's really very interesting the work that we have seen so far this morning. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting also the approach of the studio or or of this exercise at least, you know, to consider this uh, sort of like an a scenario, like a futuristic scenario. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that um, companies of uh, marketing that deal with advertisement advertisement do very often. They kind of catapult themselves to the future in order to understand what possible uh, things might happen in order to, you know, understand uh, the economics, uh, product, whatever. So I think, you know, to translate that into uh, an exercise, to an architectural, architectural exercise, it, it was very interesting, right? I mean, to foresee or to speculate uh, around that uh, possible scenario, right? Yes. So that it's, it, it was a very good idea. So thank you. Thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, if you if you have any time, you can always welcome to to look at the at the drawings. I think they're going to be available for the rest of the week. Uh, so thank you so much again. I really appreciate all the wonderful comments and your time. And uh, and then we'll be right back to all of you that are tuning in. Uh, 
um, I'm like practicing my host uh, uh, for for future online <laughs> hostings. I hope we never have to do this again. So, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I i i share i share the sentiment Julie. so anyway uh, thank you so much everybody now I'll, I'll we'll see you guys and with new reviewers uh in 30 minutes thank you okay, thank, thank you, you Jean goodbye Judith. goodbye we have two distinguished um professors here we have uh, benjamin ibarra joining us today as associate professor here at the university of texas also uh, program director and master's uh, in advanced studies. And uh, I think you guys also are very familiar with uh, Professor John Blood. Uh, he's also uh, a distinguished senior lecturer here in the University of Texas and licensed architect. He has a, his own firm, Dance and Blood Architects, here in Austin, and uh, also well known for his uh, uh, works in concept artists uh, and set designers for uh, film uh, and video industry. So, um, I wanted to welcome both of, of our reviewers. Thank you so much for, for coming. Good to be here. Yes, thank you. Awesome. And uh, everybody don't that is tuning don't in. Don't me by my bookshelf. It's, a day <laughs> it's only been up by for a day. And <laughs> next week, I'll need another one. It'll fill up pretty quick. <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thanks, everybody, uh, for, for joining the second session of, of our studio review. I know this is uh, very new for most of us. So if there's some kinks and uh, and some uh, bloopers or mistakes, you know, it's all welcome. So it's all part of the experience. I want to take a quick minute to kind of give a little bit of introduction of the uh, of the um, studio. Good. Um, the studio is basically about emotion in architecture. We explore the phenomenological aspect of architecture. Uh, very also driven, um, given a uh, lot of justice with the uh, speculative uh, uh, master uh, theme of the of the project of the of the studio, and the and the students start working on early assignments with emotion. Each of them as, uh, were assigned three particular emotions that they had to create some type of architecture that emulates or, or represents uh, that particular emotion as a basis of the concept based. Um, and then we run the same exercise. It was a two-week exercise with great results. The second week, the second exercise was the same emotions, but through through the lens of an architect or an artist, and that allowed them to to understand uh, particularly uh, designers' process, and help them guide uh, them to kind of create a, a, a process that they can apply to the final project. So they were able to do the same three emotions that they work on the first assignment and uh, be influenced and, and uh, immerse themselves on the process of that particular artist or architect of interest. And then the final project, we started as a, as a whole class, we, we create a proposal for a future, each student uh, presented a proposal for a dystopian or utopian future. And between the class, we selected our three favorite um, proposals. And those are the ones that uh, students work on in groups of uh, five. So um, one future for five students. And in this session, we'll be looking at future two and a work of uh, five students, which is uh, Juan David, Anna, Jackson, Sebastian, and Matthew. We will look at their individual work for the future too. Just one, one FYI before we get started, I find it very helpful to review the work on box on a second screen so I can scroll through all the documents. But if the file size is too large, box crashes. So there's some floor plans that are 96 megabytes and they're, they're far too large. So if you have a minute or two to uh, reprint at a smaller size and upload the box, it'll, it'll help a lot to be able to look at those. Okay. And, um, and really quick uh, about the, this future, kind of the gist of it is, uh, um, I'm, I don't want to butcher it, but basically aliens came sometime and started mining the core without us noticing. And by the time we notice, the uh, um, Earth to start changing considerably, food source, vegetation, big picture, full devastation. Uh, hunger was uh, uh, the next 
um, big uh, element who make humans uh, start eating each other. So cannibalism. Wait, that's like three major things. Yes. <laughs> Aliens, then hunger. Yes, hunger, cannibalism, and then cannibalism. Okay. And then somehow, uh, um, somehow, you know, civilization restarted with, uh, I think if I remember correctly, about 6 million people throughout that survived this uh, uh, course of 50 years, I think. And um, the memorial is uh, uh, in Brussels, and it's um, um, it's about the power of nature and and what all went wrong. So each of them have a take on that future, and the full narrative is in the, in the uh, box folder, and I, I shared with you guys previously for this. But um, as a group, they decided the location of 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 the site. Um, which is the ruins of a church, and each of them had a take on on, on their memorial. So, with that, I want to uh, welcome uh, Juan David to to start showing us your project. Uh, yes. Um, hello, everyone, professors. Uh, hello, yeah. Hello. Uh, maybe I want to start it. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Professor Trude, for uh, introducing the topic. Actually, and I'm going to start sharing my screen and presenting my project. Will. Okay. okay, everyone can see. Yep. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, as Professor Chu said, um, well, these aliens came and did uh, started drilling into the Earth's core for energy, which then made the plants die as a result. And as a result of that, animals died, and basically we ran out of food which led us to cannibalism and violence. So uh, as my concept, I wanted to represent nature as stronger than anything, because even after this great hunger, as it was called, it managed to resurface in its full splendor uh, because nature cannot be contained. Uh, water in architecture is a metaphor for both uh, life and death. So in my project, these water reservoirs surrounding the central platform will be a non potable water collected from the rain via drainage systems located on the site. Uh, this water represents all the souls lost due to the polluted way of life full of sin of those who gave in to cannibalism and violence. This changes, however, once uh, nature is added to the equation. Uh, the main central structure symbolizes a tree or nature, and it will take in polluted souls through its roots. Uh, purifying them and giving them back to the world through a shower of pure potable water. Uh, this monument remembers all the lives lost and teaches us that if we don't rid our souls from sinful ideas and take in nature as basically our savior as the people in the city did, uh, we will remain polluted water uh, forever. So let me walk you through it. Um, well, that's my concept, which I already read to you. Uh, well, first, I uh, struggled on representing nature uh, without being too literal about it. As Professor True said, we did a project in which I had to represent trust through the eyes of Antonio Gaudí, and this is the form I got. However, I still thought this uh, form, which was a pavilion, showed a too literal connection to a tree. So I looked at Toyo Ito's uh, work, and I really liked how he represents nature or trees through the actual surface of his uh, walls and structures. That's how I got the uh, internal, the, the central structure. After that, the shell, uh, I looked at also at Antonio Gaudí and how his animal, the salamander, represents him. And I got this uh, tunnel-like or tail-like structure that narrows down the more, the, the further you go. And then I tried to morph that into looking like a drop and a leaf at the same time, at the same time, which allowed me to create my project's shell, which is visible here. The next uh, inspiration I took was, and the greatest one, was the 9-11 memorial in New York City uh, because I needed to connect water to the lives lost. And this memorial does it incredibly. Uh, in this memorial uh, for the catastrophe of 9-11, there's individual streams of water that represent individual lives and then they will join and become a whole. I uh, used this idea to represent the uh, purified souls and this uh, shower in my project will also work as a refre refreshener 
uh, after having done a long pilgrimage from the city to my memorial. So uh, as you can see, these are the roots that take in uh, this dirty water, as we could call it, and filter it through a system in the main structure. And then they will rain it down like this in a form of potable pure water. I also intended to make it uh, work as a screen on which I could project images that show or portray the history of all the lives lost and how we came to be where we are right now. I also wanted people to be able to experience these roots more closely. So I did a second level that would have a glass ceiling that allows you to look at the whole system or circulation of these souls that were going to be purified by nature. Uh, other than that, uh, if you keep going downstairs, you will find yourself uh, within a forest-like space that will make you understand that these lily pads that are being, th these are actually the supports of the lily pads that will allow you to enter this space in the first place. And you will feel like nature is actually letting you in into this space in, from, the, from the beginning. Uh, this would be more clear in my site plan. Right here, these are the lily pads that will let you, allow you to go into the space. After my side plan, I've included my floor plan. And here you can see the shower of potable water that will serve as a drinkable water. And my circulation downstairs to see the system. This represents the forest-like structure or space. On my section, you can actually see how this space here, this both of these spaces actually represent the reservoir of water being the, and these structures represent the actual pipes that will take in water, purify them, pump them up this central structure into the concrete shell and then rain here. This is another section that shows the uh, forest. And my two elevations. I hope you can open them up, as you said. Uh, I hope they weren't too big. Oh, OK. Yeah. Uh, so I also have opened my model, if you want to uh, walk through it, or I could go back to any of the drawings, as you wish. If you have no, that's OK. Let's back up a little bit. So this is, I think, fair to say, not a typical the architectural design studio, is that correct? Well, yeah, I would say that. Right. Okay. So you've got to, you, you have to like expand on 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 this the 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 proposition and the setting. I don't want to jump right into assuming that water means this and uh, columns mean trees and things like that. I want to, I want you to feel like take me back into the story and the proposition and 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 you have to actually like let it unfold like a story and set it up in a way that allows me to access it as a viewer, let my imagination ac ac access the uh, okay. proposition okay. more completely. So I, if I understand correctly, this is an, a speculative uh, studio, right? It's an intermediate speculative. That's why the projects will have this kind of character of a speculation, fantasy, and so forth. That's correct. Yes. What is the theme of the speculation? So uh, there is this city and I will have to do pilgrimage that will take, in my case, days to go look and experience this place that will represent all these lives lost due to cannibalism and uh, violence, basically. So I want well, to create too a far space. Ahead. You're, you're taking me too far ahead. You need to back up to say, this is this is a this is a future that is different than the reality that we understand. Now we're okay. in a position of, of transition in our world, in our society at the moment. So we I might see. actually there may be a window of opportunity within our current limitations to introduce this this uh, speculative proposition. And I, okay. and I work in, in the science fiction business. I actually actually do that, and there's. Uh, a lot of mileage gets, you know, with a two-hour-long two feature film, you have to tell a very, very long story very efficiently. You have to compress the proposition. A lot of how it's done in film 
is an aesthetic association or a genre association like, oh, it's a zombie program. And then you're, you know, you're halfway there or, or oh, it's like Brad Pitt in, in a zombie film. Okay, I know who Brad Pitt is. I know what a zombie film is. I can put those two things together. And, you know, 75% of the story is like laid out for me right now. So you, we're not watching a film, we're in an architecture studio. So there's a couple of very, very important sentences that need to start everything out that says, we're living in a moment of transition right now. I mean, the world as we know it was built on socialization. Like we go to studio and we talk to each other and exchange ideas. And now we don't do that. Our lives are changing before our eyes as we unfold it. The proposition of the studio takes us further down that role or down that rabbit hole of possibility into the future. And the idea at that point is that, um, and, then, and then you just have to like unfold the story because I wasn't, I was in the, in the setup, uh, uh, jump here, you, it's, it's worth actually expanding. You, there's, there's, there's like three or four abrupt propositions that are thrown out in, in front of us. And I think it's important for the students to say, if this is the case, then my assumptions about things are this, and they should share those assumptions and spell them out. So for example, not the least of which is, this is an urban setting. Why is it an urban setting, right? Uh, I okay. see in white, why are they in white? Okay, why are they not decayed or overgrown? Or, you know, there's, there's a whole number of other things that have to unfold. So a very, very important, and I think I like it. I think it's great, I think it's good, but um, so let me try to uh, yeah. do. You're taking do, me too far down the road too soon. I see. Okay. No, I totally understand that. Uh, so let me try to uh, start again and introduce okay. this whole idea. So yes, as you know, th this is a future, uh, definitely uh, not a real future because it involves aliens, but basic or the, the whole idea is about aliens coming to Earth, first of all, aliens, and drilling into our core for energy. And this is what causes, for some extraneous reason, plants for plants to die. And that is my whole focus here. Plants die and then animals die. But then because plants die, we all starve. So humans uh, don't trust nature anymore. And they resort to violence and cannibalism. However, nature then uh, goes, comes back because nature is strong. Nature is uncontainable. And at first, humans don't really trust nature completely, but we try to until this group of people creates this city, this society that lives from nature, that uh, has a kind of symbiosis between nature and accepts nature as their savior. And this is called the city. However, the government of the city uh, wants the people uh, to create a, a monument that, re that because we don't want to forget all the lives lost due to cannibalism and violence. So we are prompt. We, we have food to eat now. Sorry. I oh, yes. Uh, we question. eat uh, in this city. Uh, everyone's vegan, basically. They subsist from. Where do they get their food? Sorry. Oh, yes. Um, well, this city is because, because nature has come back in its full splendor. And everyone's vegan, basically in this in this in the city. They plant and they subsist from from plants, uh, plant based uh, um, food. Yes. Uh, oh, this, this because city. all the animals died. You mentioned right. Yes, all the animals died. Okay. And so the city that we are seeing as a context is not a ghost city. It's a city that is, is alive. No, it's a, it's a very it's a very elaborate city because humans accepted nature into their lives and they created this amazing city. Very let futuristic. Me, let, me, let me interject in here really quick. Um, so there is the city, what the narrative uh, describes as this utopian kind of citadel. And this area where the site is, is a destroyed portion of uh, area in Brussels, and the site is the remain of a church site in a location that is adjacent to some railroad tracks. And it's very, it's a very important to understand that people actually are coming in here and risking their lives because there's still activities uh, of, of, of uh, people that they still chose a life of, cannibal, of cannibalism that are lingering in these areas. So this area is a, an unsafe area. So there's a component of the pilgrimage that people do 
to get to this site using the railroad tracks uh, uh, as the means of, of, of entry to the, to the site. So that's, that was part of the premises of the proposal uh, that, that was uh, the narrative that, that, that I share with you guys. And then the five students took that and kind of create a little bit of the parameters of the site. And then I don't, want to, I don't want to be a, a skeptic or anything. I'm totally, you know, I'm a sport because, you know, I actually do this kind of thing. But um, I think with the um, a proposition of this nature, it's very important to, uh, again, to lay the story out. All of us in our public speaking, in the way that we write, in the way we talk about our projects would benefit <clears throat> from learning how to be better storytellers, just in terms of how you lay out a premise and begin to do things. Really huge issue here for me is this question about change in society. Okay, cannibalism, mm, I don't care, uh, but I understand the thing about running out of food and things being changing in a certain sense. And then reaching to a point where you actually want to memorialize or go back and remember. That's a major transition. That's why I ask, do people have enough food or are people just trying to eat enough, right? Because most of the things I work on are zombies just trying to find a can of beans. So they're still just trying to survive. They're not yet at this point of re-civilization, which I think is very important. So you say, this is a studio and a design proposal about re-civilization after yes. the loss of civilization as we know it. I can understand that much more clearly. That sets me up to go like, okay, well, you have to have an idea about what the past was and who the past was, and then what the future and what the present and the future are. Then you put them all together. But that's that's the sentence that I think needs to be really critically highlighted. Okay. Okay. Good. Yes. And then then I can get into architecture. So it's like, what's yes. the earth? What's man-made? What's nature? What do you okay. think nature is, et cetera? Okay. Now keep going. Great. Yes. So uh, after we're prompted with creating this memorial, that <clears throat> basically serves as. Uh, not only a memorial, but as a reminder of how, if we don't, like if we succumb to violence and cannibalism, we will never join this society, this re-civilization, as you say. And as Professor True explained, yes, uh, maybe that is a little confusing. The buildings around it and this whole site is destroyed. I know they're in white, but there should be, there's supposed to be, everything is supposed to be overtaken by nature. So the only uh, untouched thing here would be the shell of uh, my building. Yes? Everything else, the stuff that I see in white. Yes, it, this is all understood over... understood as being ruinous. Yes, as overtaken okay. as ruinous. Perfect. Why didn't okay. you draw them as ruinous? Uh, well, that is my mistake. Okay, just I'm just curious. Okay. <laughs> yes. So um, going back to uh, the project, I propose to remember and serve as a reminder to people to accept nature into their lives, as the people in the city did. You're uh, proposed with this, with this shape, with this shell that looks like a combination between a water drop and a leaf, and within the shell there is this central structure that resembles a tree. And this tree, which represents nature, will purify the souls represented with the water surrounding the main structure. And they will purify the souls and rain down uh, potable water, uh, which, is a, which is a very uh, big uh, deal for me because I was thinking if I was gonna do a huge pilgrimage to this place, well, the first thing I wanted is, uh, well, first of all, water, you know, to clean myself and to drink because I'm probably going to be exhausted and some shade. That's where I want to do the shell that contains people and give them purple water while still telling this story. Um, I don't know if you want me to uh, retell my concept again, but um, water for me represents uh, both life and death in my project. The surrounding reservoir representing the lost lives the central structure representing nature. And as you can see here, these are these pipes, which will be taken in water, are basically going to be representing the uh, roots of my tree that will be taken in water, pumping them up into these concrete 
and then raining down pure potable water representing how nature when you take in nature or how nature purifies the soul basically as it did with the people in the city why is it nature not in a central pool but instead it's a kind of a moat like a ring or water why is sorry can you repeat why that? is water not a central pool since it's such a powerful symbolic element is it not actually dis distributed like a moat or like in a ring yes because this water that is surrounding the central structure is actually unpure water it's dirty water it represents the souls the, the, the violence and the cannibalism so you don't want to interact with this water because it's it's awful but when it goes through nature and it rains this pure now potable water you totally want to drink it or even shower on it where is that water this is this water right here which is being rained mm -hmm. uh actually but, yes and that water uh, falls into the pool again or is that, uh, or it goes no, somewhere else that water i believe the best uh let me find the best oh man where is that sorry uh I'm pretty sure I had this render here. Actually, I can take you, if you allow me, I could take you to my Rhino render. This water here will actually go into a canal that will then rejoin the dirty water. So it's basically a cycle. This So that this water is always pure, purified. That's unclear to me. I don't understand how that works or if the water is held in a vessel. Or so this is location. basically, it comes from the ceiling. The water goes, it's pumped up through this structure into the concrete. The concrete. Then there's this opening, which then rains individual strands of water as the night memorial. And then these strands go into this cut in the concrete uh, base that will then rejoin the dirty water, creating a cycle of water so that this water is always uh, pure and potable. Yeah, but you could also have taken that water somewhere else so it can be used for human human use, right? Yes, so I, I actually wanted it to be back used to, for human use. Yeah, you know, but pouring it back into the dirty water. But that's not, I mean, it's just a, a, a question. Now, the question that I have is, uh, you talk about uh, Gaudi a yes. number of times uh, and used it as a reference, used it as, as a, source of, I would say, inspiration. Can you elaborate a little bit more on why Gaudi? What is it that you are interested on? Well, uh, uh, Gaudi for me, did and uh, yeah. Yes, uh, Gaudi for me has always been a source of inspiration, especially because how he interacts with nature. Uh, as you can see in Casa Mila, he represents the ocean and all the materials he uses are from uh, on site or are from uh, someplace very close to it. Actually, Casa Mila is uh, a representation of Montserrat, which is Gaudi's uh, favorite mountain. So I really wanted to use a, a, a connect to an architect that connects his work to nature. And I also uh, picked Gaudi for my second project of the semester, as Professor Tru explained, for which I created this structures right here, which is a pavilion made with uh, to represent trust. Mm -hmm. And I got it through the eyes of Gaudi. And Wait, that's where a I... pavilion that represents trust? Yes. So uh, it, it's basically taking the form of a tree, which for me, and definitely Gaudi, as he shows in La Sagrada Familia, he uses trees to support the ceiling through his columns. So that is trust through my eyes and through Gaudi's eyes is the tree. Why would that be trust? Well, if you look at Gaudi's work, well, first of all, the simple shape of a tree, when, if, if there is nothing, if there is no human interaction and you find yourself in the field, I, I would feel I trust it be to protect me from the rain if I would need to climb it to protect me from predators. A tree is just, for me, a symbolism for trust. And I think for Gaudi as well. Um, okay. I know we, we have to review five, uh, five students <laughs> in a few hours. Yes. Sorry. How are your sorry. eyeballs doing, by the way? Mine really get to hurt after a while. Let me, let me just get to a, a quick point then. 
So if I just get the meat and potatoes on this, then then once we get it, because whatever the thank you for kicking us off, Juan. Everything I said to you, hopefully the other presenters are listening to, because I would would say the same thing. Uh, yes. Very important thing. I think you'll you'll get a lot more. Uh, I think you'll get a lot out of out of um, going slower and thinking more elementally and more simply. Like, what does it mean to go below ground, or what is the nature of a you know a tree does not represent trust necessarily. It's a protect you from mm -hmm. the rain unless there's a lightning storm. So it's like that's be very careful about the things you say. There's very powerful symbolism, and it's well, worth examining. I would go more deep into it. I'd read mythology about it. I would connect to your own feelings about them, but but uh, resist the urge to jump three steps ahead and say I tree see. is a very yeah. powerful thing. It's a it's a statement of survival and about nature and about roots and finding water and about reconstruction. We build out of trees and they're also uh, a symbol and metaphor for us to things for us to begin to work. And what about materiality? I mean, I'm very interested in your materiality in this thing. I'm less interested in the shape of forms, which okay. might be more symbolic. And I'm much more interested in what, you know, what, what this thing, what the feel of things are. Okay, so, uh, well, this structure, these are actual pipes that will be pumping water from this uh, uh, moat, as you say, it, <laughs> and upwards. Uh, they're probably going to be made from plastic or, well, I mean, they have to be hollow because they are actual pumps that will tr make uh, allow water to travel upwards and rain down. Then these lily pads are definitely going to be cement because of the structure, they need to be cement because they go all the way down. And then I, I planted some grass on the top to, you know, connect them to the whole aspect of my project. Looks pretty but lush. What's what? It looks lush, like verdant, like it's really vibrant. Like Is that a good thing? More vibrant than even in nature. So it's, it's a very, take going very, very off in a very strong direction. Can I just for two seconds commandeer the screen? I don't know if people actually know me that well, but I'm just gonna, if I may just do this, you, you just so that you need to know where I'm coming from on this. So um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I cannot share the screen while you're, you've got to stop the oh, screen. I can stop, yeah, I can stop yeah. for sure. Okay. Sorry about this, but just, just this, you, you may not, um, which screen am I on? Yeah, there you go. Can you see this guy right here? Yeah, this is, yes. this is really great. So I work for Fear the Walking Dead and Zombie Shows. I designed that. Not everybody gets to include something like this in their portfolio, but that's a thing I designed with actual like, well, well, zombie actors in front of it. Okay, so things like that, issues about decay in the in the film and the science fiction world, we deal with stories a lot. This was the Dell Diamond. I, I burned it down right here. That's, so this is this is the kind of things that we begin to do, highly aesthetic driven. So uh, a lot of that conversation is about like. You know, we're just dealing with a screen, so and color. So color is desaturated. Contrast might be up. Things have a gritty feel to it. There's a very strong sensation about what happens in terms of nature coming back in control or nature being rampantly out of control. And you know, they never do explain why they're zombies. That is somehow. But again, very interesting part because they, they don't. Right. Show, they didn't say, "Hey, there's this like a uh, virus thing." It's, they just skip that part and go straight into it. But because we've already done this, we, we know what that story is about. I would stick with architecture. There's things like being above ground, being below ground. There's ideas about certain kinds of form, like this very, maybe really interesting teardrop shaped form, which is not a universal platonic form, but it's something which is, has a very kind of like singularity to it and a, a kind of a, a curious purity to it, which could be very, very interesting. I don't care about the pipe mechanism. I want to know, is there electricity? Uh, and I don't want to see those, I don't understand those, those pretty colors and, and what's going on in the background. So you don't have to like, you know, put all grit like that, but I need something to set up the stage so I can see if your building is acting as something that's different and exceptional, which I think it is. And then I want to know the way that you're putting things below the ground. And, and right now it just looks kind of like a swimming pool cross section. I don't really, you know, like that. But I don't really understand the nature of what it's like to carve and create the space that holds water and how there's two different kinds of water. And water is an interesting thing as a symbol. I think it should reside in a vessel of some sort, it should be held like in a body. So interesting, interesting stuff going on there. I like, uh, I like the form and stuff, but I would uh, 
You'll probably yeah, I, I, I actually appreciate uh, you were totally right about actually explaining a lot further down so that you get the grasp of the whole idea because I feel like I started my presentation and you were just like presented with this and you were you didn't know where you were standing. Yeah, there, there's an, I want to, just, to expand on this because you're an exceptional studio right now, so it demands that you do that. But it's true in every single studio. You've got to go all the way back to square run, go back to the brief you were given and saying, we were asked to do this, which seems to me to be about these issues. And this okay. is how I, I approach think... these issues. Always restate the issues, the, the problem. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, uh, you guys, I really think I'm taking time from cool. someone else. We're going to, if you're okay with us moving on, Juan. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, on. Let me yeah, just if you have any final clear, comments. Uh, one, one more, one thing. Yes. Um, um, yeah, do you, it's, it's usually with these studios and, you know, being the first one, you, know, you take a lot of hit because it's hard for the reviewers to, to kind of understand the premise and kind of get into the, what the group of the studio is about. So first, you know, I want to commend you for your presentation. I think you did a, a very good job. You really introduced us Thank to the you. project. We are looking at a very compelling uh, uh, object, architectural object that has, you know, form, shape. You have done some research. I mean, I think that uh, overall, I will I will say that this this uh, structure that you have uh, created is uh, is really pleasing. It has it has uh, Thank uh, you. and and will have, I think, will convey the meaning that you you are putting into each one of those elements. I think that that's something that, you know, becomes personal. It doesn't mean the same, things doesn't mean the same thing for everyone. Now, uh, but I, what I'm a little bit, con will be a little bit concerned is about materiality as uh, uh, when John asked about mater materiality, you know, because I think that's in this uh, dystopian and, you know, kind of reshaping uh, the way Society. people li live, you are going back to just regular, materials right they say it's oh. a concrete shell it's plastic uh, pipes it's a you know it's a it's cement i mean all those type of things right so i think that that's an opportunity for you or for i don't know if it was for everyone but uh, for you to actually rethink about okay how in this uh, new environment and use in this in new in this new context where people are looking back to the past and saying okay these are the things that probably we didn't do very well, how can they actually embrace, as you say, nature in order to create, a, a, in this case, for instance, a monument, right? How mm -hmm. do I actually they highlight also through a materiality? A, I think that that's where also part of the experimentation a, could go. I think that at this point, I will just see it as a shape and a real a, a set of a set, a set of shapes or elements that a, aim to convey a, some symbolism. But then I will go a little further, right? I will go a little, uh, uh, do my research and start thinking about, okay, how can, for instance, biomimicry can inform this, right? How is it that this could be not a concrete shell, but perhaps it's a, you know, a, a, a plant-based uh, right. shell that grows, or it's totally breathable. I don't know, you know, things yeah. like- Yeah, no, I like okay, that yeah, idea, that makes it's sense. a really good idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Trying to connect to nature also. To nature. Yeah. If you are through... thinking about cement and columns and you know and, and shells, that's yes. shells are you know in mid 20th century. We're in a different context now. So how is it that people are thinking architecture at the time, uh, in terms of its materiality and construction, could be also part of this uh, com uh, of what you are presenting here? But, yes, uh, I, I, see, I totally see that. Otherwise, uh, I think a uh, very good. Uh, Kick off for the for the for this couple of hours that we are gonna spend here. Biofertilized yeah. self calcifying concrete. I like it. It's a good idea. We're gonna move on. I think. Yes. We need yes. To I think I'm fast. taking too much time out of my my uh, Oh yes. yeah. Now we'll. I'll be blunt and direct. All right. So let's move with uh, Anna. Oh yeah. Thank you, uh, professors. Uh, thank you. Cool. Very good. Thanks. Good. Thanks for taking us off. Fun. Okay. Bye. <laughs> um. So um, I will share my screen for my Enscape model. Okay. So I had the same, obviously the same narrative with the aliens that mine Earth, and then with the cannibals that come and which um, creates the big event, um, the Great Hunger. Um, and then after the Great Hunger um, civilization, um, 
reorganizes itself to become more with nature. Um, and so the site of my um, monument is the same as David's. <laughs> um, it's out of the city and um, it's, um, like he said, like uh, it um, takes you, it makes you travel um, a far distance and it's, it's risky because cannibals are still, some cannibals are still out and um, so, yeah. Um, and so in my memorial, I wanted to honor those who died from the great hunger. And then I also wanted to celebrate the new way of life, um, the way people live with nature and how they interact with it. Um, so the orientation, oh, okay. So um, to do this, I um, formed a tunnel space um, that narrows down as you go through it. Um, Okay, there you go. Sorry. Um, and so in this space, um, I wanted you to feel consumed and um, like you're being enveloped and um, kind of a little bit fearful um, to kind of re to like honor those who had like died and been died because of the cannibals. Um, and to also represent those who had died, I created these drips of water that, um, I'm sorry, my inscape is kind of slow. <laughs> um, but um, essentially these drips of water come down from the ceiling of the tunnel to represent all the um, lives that have been lost during the great hunger and as you're going through this space, I wanted to create that feeling of, um, yeah, like I said, being consumed, but then also like remembering those who have um, lost their lives. And so then um, I'm gonna turn the drips off because it makes the escape slower. But um, I have the images on the screen here, so that's okay for me. Okay. You can go to stills. Sorry. And so at the end of the tunnel, the entrance is significantly um, smaller. And then um, I decided to do this narrow pathway um, to kind of keep people to stay in the middle and to, because um, I didn't want you like kind of roaming around in this space. It, it's more of like a, an individual experience rather than a group experience. And then you go through the end, and at the end of the tunnel is um, these stairways that go up and out of this space. And um, I decided to um, do the tunnel um, underground to um, uh, to um, I'm sorry. Um, I decided to do the tunnel um, underground rather than above ground um, to kind of remember like the mining experience that the aliens had um, done to the space. Okay, so then. Sorry, I lost where I was. So at the end of this tunnel, there's this um, large like ditch here um, and I created that space because like I said there is still cannibals in this in this area and um, as a group um, we did designate an area that's um, towards this end of the this space that where you would most likely encounter a cannibal so I created this ditch to point towards that way to um, give people a sense of awareness of that, um, of, of awareness of their presence. And again, to hopefully kind of create a sense of fear and uh, yeah, and again, like awareness of that. And so that's that space right there. And then at the top of this, um, and I don't know if you could see the, 
stairways in the render image. I don't know your plan. Okay. Can we see your, your presentation or your plans um, so we can uh, get a better understanding? Yes. And uh, let's, let's keep it a couple of minutes so we have enough uh, time for the reviewers to provide some feedback. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, that's okay, good. That's so fine. Yeah. What's the uh, so the the yeah perfect. That's great. So is that the footprint of the existing church? Yeah. So that church, I decided to build retaining like small, short retaining walls to um, also uh, resemble like to also go back to the past and like to let people know like of the destruction that had happened. And um, so yeah, I did put some like planters in some of the retaining walls. But yeah, and um, the great. reason. I left that space open right here. Um, I kind of wanted to create like a park space, kind of like Zoker vibe, I guess. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I and then- that undo is there, Oh, well, fine. Uh, what's this wall right here? Sorry if this doesn't go away. I'm, I'm pressing undo, but it doesn't go. What's that thing, the zigzag? Oh, this right here is the pathways um, from exiting the stairways that goes back to the platform where the where you would like enter the space. This one right here, this thing that looks like a light, like a lightning bolt scar. This one? Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's also the existing church. It is? So be like a short retaining wall. Okay. Well that's just kind of weird. Um, I like I like the, the the fact that there's certain elements that mark the ground plane either historically or you know the uh, I, I love you know, you'll see squares in Europe where they you know stones mark where the footprint of the old church face was that's gone. So there's some scar or memory of the past that happens. It is very simple and very powerful in that it happens in the ground plane. I think that's a really that's a really good move. Uh, I am pressing undo, but nothing is happening on my screen. So hopefully I haven't defaced your drawings forever. Um, and I like the the main gesture of going down into the ground. Uh, I, I, I be the word consumed, you mean people want to feel like they're being, it sounds like you want them to feel like they're being literally consumed, like eaten, and I don't know if that's the right word or not. Yeah, it or, is kind of weird, but um, no, yeah, it's I okay. guess. No, it's fine. It's, it's good. And, and, and you're doing an interesting thing where you're, you're actually like uh, um, provoking our emotion as we experience this thing. And I think that's a very, that's, that's actually very interesting. You, you might be going too far. You might be, I, I may not agree. I mean, I could understand an argument about where uh, we, we had to go underground literally to survive. So maybe underground is nurturing and protective instead of being exposed. And the moment when we come back up, above the ground might be something when we literally re-emerge because some there's some ad adjectives that I can associate directly with spatial positioning or sectional positioning like re-emergence uh yeah, versus I being think like protected or or enclosed or burrowed is a word so I, I use the thesaurus a lot really important thing so burrowing is an idea about being protected so you're, you're taking us down, but then you're also giving this feeling of like provoking us and making us feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, okay, that's fine, but it might be, it might be abrupt. And then you have this, this, this funny dog leg turn at the end of the whole thing. I'm a, sorry, I'm afraid yeah. of Mark again, that thing right there. So um, why like that we don't, see, we don't see what you are marking, John. You don't see anything? No, if you are trying to annotate the drawing, we at least- Yeah, I annotated mine. Her screen's all red and marked up right now. So no. uh, at the end of the stairway where you come back up, there's a right hand, a, a sharp right hand turn and you come up. It makes a kind of two 90 degree turns, which is kind of uh, abrupt, I would say. So I'm just don't know why the, the, the sequence of going down seems very formal and the sequence of coming back up seems, uh, um, abrupt and two 90 degree turns in a way that I'm not, I'd like to know more about that. Okay. Um, My screen's clear now, thanks. Oh. Um, to the right of where your cursor is. Okay, yeah. Right there. Okay, I understand that. Um, I guess I had mainly turned it this way just because I didn't want it to go like straight leading up towards this way where the cannibals were. I wanted it to go away from it. Um, but I do understand now that it does 
it does look abrupt and I probably could have treated that in a better way to make it more seamless. No, I, th I think the intuition there is right. I think it's worth examining a little bit more about how you did it. It does make a two 90 degree turns, which is, we see that a lot in stairwells and very familiar things. So it might be something where you go to a landing and then reposition and then go to another flight that goes out if you don't want to see a direct line of sight. Yeah, and I think uh, like an, another thing, I guess I had just wanted it to go along the tunnel. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's also why it ended up like that. But yeah, I definitely could rethink that. There are a couple of things that, uh, you know, I find uh, very well uh, executed from of, on this on this project, and definitely this notion of being consumed, right, getting into the ground, somehow being swallowed by the by the by the ground, right, and going going back to to, to Earth. Uh, that's what we do, or that we do with our you know loved ones when they when they passed away. We put them back in the earth, right? So it's something like like that. And then uh, I think that uh, this is space that you have created where there is water coming down and there is this water ponds on either side of the path. I think that's a really powerful space. I just can't imagine, you know, hearing all the noise, getting all the splash from the water, uh, going through this tunnel. I mean, really, uh, really powerful um, experience. Um, uh, and and I find it uh, I find it uh, very suggestive, right? Mm -hmm. The part that I think I think that uh, this then this project calls for because I think that you are talking about a couple of things, right? One is this uh, notion of of being a, a, a consumed or being taken back into the ground uh, and getting to this uh, space that is all very earthy, and then going into this other space where the water is pouring down. I see it like a couple of spaces. I think that is the same space doing two things. But I wonder, especially with this, with this uh, scenario where you know the, the, you put the, the, your own limits, why is it that this couldn't have been a couple of spaces to create these clear two types of experiences? And also, uh, I see that you, if you look at it in plan, it's kind of a very linear uh, uh, path, right? It's only one a cone or funnel that actually takes you into this uh, experience. And I think that it calls for perhaps two of them or, or perhaps a longer, a longer uh, a space in which you can uh, provide the two different moments that you are presenting us here, uh, especially since there is no, no limit here, right? Uh, mm -hmm. the, if you see it in, within the plan, uh, you know, uh, even if, uh, if uh, or even perhaps I know that you guys have this side, but perhaps could have been something that is a lot longer, right? That starts somewhere around here, you get consumed and then you go with the dead people who are, is the water, the representation of water over here. And then you come, come out and, uh, and I agree with, 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 with uh, John that this staircase, you see my annotations, right? Uh, no, I can't see it. I can. No. I think if I stop sharing and you share, I don't know. Oh yeah, but you, you, we are supposed to be seeing those. I don't know what's going on. But yeah, anyway, I promise since the morning, uh, I think the settings uh, are not allowing us for everybody to see the annotations. Okay. Okay. We can annotate them, but no one can see them. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll see it. Yeah. All right. Let's yeah. Start. Okay. Uh, let the. Uh, did you get what I was talking about? I think so. Yeah, like um, like the entrance yeah. start up here, and then go or even through. farther down to the left, you know. Oh, okay, so I'm like yeah. right here. Yeah, perhaps. Okay. I mean, just it's just that. But in other otherwise, I find uh, the imprint of the church on the ground, the memory going down to the earth. I mean, all those gestures, mm -hmm. really powerful. The water falling down, the getting a splash, the sound. I just can't imagine the sound in that space being super intense. Uh, and uh, that really, really brings me to, to a profound experience. Yeah. And just to kind of reiterate some of the comments that John had, the context is really important too. So by showing the buildings white really takes a little bit of the mood of the contrast of having the, the uh, um, your approach to the context. So I think it makes it stronger if you actually have the buildings kind of in ruins and and overgrown yeah. and stylized in a way that, that yeah. comes that idea. 
I or, agree. or if they start to be like, you know, decayed, de destroyed, de textured and dark, then the thing, then your proposition might want to be a, of a counterpoint or, or counterpuntal or contrasted against that. Contra right. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Anna. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let's uh, uh, move on with uh, Jackson. Jackson, you ready? Hello, yes. Screen. Okay, so my project, I decided to call it the uh, Scandinavian, which is a uh, Dutch for uh, civilization memorial. The whole basis of the project is that I wanted to create, um, well, the memorial to um, what uh, civilization used to be. So now it's all just located in one major city and there's not, well, there's not a whole lot of uh, diversification of like cultures. And so one of the inspiration for formal stuff, uh, these few buildings were just- now, uh, What was that first one? This building, uh, it's an earthquake memorial. I forget where it is exactly, but like the formal elements uh, reflect my project yeah. pretty well. And I liked how the, the material of like the top being ground and then the sides of the buildings are very uh, prominent and kind of like uh, well, just important for the overall design. In this building, I liked the um, uh, inclusion of the water element, which is a big part of my project. And then this one is a little bit more of what I wanted the water to eventually look like. And so, this um, anthem is a, it's a movie that I watched that it heavily influenced how I wanted the feeling of my memorial to be. And so the movies, it's based around like it's a lost uh, horror film from the 70s that if you watch it, it will die in 24 hours or something. But it, it does really well. It builds up this, um, like there's a, there's a main story, which is more, it's kind of a, like lighthearted, very, uh, like it, um, it's more peaceful. And then there's like the whole movie, it's cut to look like kind of demonic. And so I like that uh, feeling of like, there's a main focus, but then there's also this surrounding uh, atrocities around it that give it like a very eerie feeling. So the next image is like kind of the scary part. And then the one after that is it coming together. So there's this whole theme of like the devil coming in and then there's like throughout the whole film you can like see the silhouette of it kind of in the background and it's just very eerie regardless of the story. So process of design, I wanted to isolate the main event in my mind that uh, uh, needs a memorial, like what are we remembering? And so main events, alien drilling, lost life, the great hunter, and then the events were birth of nature. I felt like the rebirth kind of um, was more of a product of everything else. And the loss of life leading to the great hunger, that was also more of a product of the initial event, which was the alien drilling. So I decided to use the drill site in the ocean as my uh, source of inspiration. And then uh, what was lost in the event was a question I asked myself to kind of decide what the program of the memorial should be. And so I got to the point where I decided the thing that was lost was uh, culture and civilization. And so I wanted to make my building reflect that. So within it, there's a museum to culture and then a memorial to all the different cities around the world that are lost. So the main process I took the site and then each of these lines points to a significant area in Brussels or uh, towards the city. This main line toward, points towards the main city. This is um, this one is towards a historical museum that was in Brussels. This one points towards the Royal Library. And then uh, these two are main cross streets. Uh, so what I did is I took those lines and then thick into them up so they could. Uh, cut through some formal geometries that I tied together around a central core. And so then after chopping it up, I started putting it on the site. So this is the first iteration. Um, 
The second one, I made the core, which is the main part of the memorial, much larger and more impactful. And then the third one, I added the uh, water element around it, kind of isolate it and make it um, really stand out in the context of the overgrown surroundings. So the final design, the site plan, it's very, uh, it's very different from all the surroundings that are just uh, like kind of crumbling overgrown buildings. So this is the bottom floor where the museum would be. This is the main core. All these uh, sectors would house exhibits to show off different cultures that used to exist around the world. Um, this first section shows just really how deep it goes down. It's kind of like to you know, to the drill site. So a couple of images of what it would look like down in the bottom. And then the second section shows off the main part, the core. Um, the core I designed to make each of these little, um, there's a bunch of little bricks. Each one uh, has or would have an engraving of a name of a city that used to exist. And there's about 4,500 4, of these little bricks, which is uh, just about how many cities exist in the world with over a population of 150,000. So this is the entrance. And then looking up, it kind of, it also, it gives the feeling that, that it kind of looks like a, a cityscape when you enter. And so I liked that reflection and kind of gives a feeling of being lost in a large city. And then looking straight up. Next part, uh, elevation shows the progression down. A couple renders of the outside. And the front view of the building. And yeah, that's the end. Jackson, do you have your model that you can walk us through? Because we're kind of confused with all the image yeah. uh, flipping. So this direction would be like um, that pathway is the train tracks that lead you from the city to here. You're greeted with this opening, which leads down to the central museum. And then this area, uh, it's all occupiable. So this uh, kind of leads down and you can climb up over here and walk around on top. And you can go down into I have a, a strong desire to see um, somewhat conventional floor plans and sections that indicate occupiable space versus the surrounding mass. So it's, I ha there's a, a kind of a uh, potentially compelling graphic um, intention and, and uh, number of factors that are assembling and some complexity that's in there but at the end of the day i want to be able to under get some idea about how enclosed am i what sense of uh, relief relief there is is there a light at the end of the tunnel or uh, is this a, a narrow space or a wide space so um the, I, 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 it's, it just seems to be missing from the presentation especially at the lower level like once i'm down below i do go below correct yes yeah so once i'm below is it a tomb? Is it a cavern? Is it, what's it like to be in there? And uh, it, it's, and honestly, one of the reasons we use relatively conventional conventions like thick line and poche is so that we can, and you can test to see what the quality of these spaces are like. What are the, what's the objective quality of the space? Long and thin, fat and wide, round, what's, the, what are they like? The round space, next to the space that's next to it. What's the relationship of those? So um, I would add those to your, uh, to your work. 
it would it would help. It's a different way to draw. It's a different workflow uh, that doesn't come out of the Enscape or whatever computer program you have to go through Illustrator or Photoshop. But but it's an important step because it's a different way to measure the success of the project that you've got. Uh, so, yeah. Jackson, can I just let you let me just share the screen quickly? Oh, yeah. I probably I don't know if uh, um, if um, if this is a drawing that you are referring to. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't read it. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a you know the thing. I, what I'm understanding here is that the the whole project then is just this very thin. Uh, very thin uh, walls, right? I mean, sorry, uh, hallways that, that almost, are almost like, but then I see this type of uh, situation where I see some that is wide and there, there are some spaces. Uh, and I suppose that is over here. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I can see how that's confusing. All the gray is open space and those little, uh, like thin hallways are more just separations of different areas. Oh, so this it's is water. open space. It's water. Ah. The, and the, and yeah. the source of the light coming the in. Because so. I'm seeing in this section, this wall, right? Mm -hmm. So I interpret, and then when I see this plan, you know, they see the section through here. And I was like, well, the section is through there because he doesn't have much <laughs> other other place to actually show a space, right? It's just this thin hallway. I didn't realize this was completely open. Uh, but because this section shows other thing, right? But I think that that happens, the spaces happen down here. That's why we see yeah. the mass versus void relationship. Right. Yes. Mm. You might want to explain a little bit back up, Jackson, on on the cuts that you made that respond to those lines that you're showing on plan. They're actually also the source of of light, and okay. and you wanted the space to be feel in a certain way from the entry, the compression. What was the thought of that, and why you choose to have a very dark space? What is that emotion? I think you, you cannot. Jump a little bit on 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 uh, the form, but I think the meaning is is what's important as well. Okay, so I'll go back to my landscape. The bottom area down here. Using these cuts are the cuts that I showed in my presentation that flow with um, significant areas surrounding the memorial. And so each of them is a source of light at different times during the day. So I'm gonna make these uh, little water paths to go through. The entryway lines up with one of those cuts. And it's very, um, it, when you're entering, it's a little wider at the top, but like when it goes into Kind of compression because I wanted it to feel like I wanted a definite sense of separation from above. Going down here, it seems like a completely different area. You get a completely different experience than from on top, maybe looking down into the core. And it's um, because that, but each of these areas would be a uh, place to. Uh, show off that can exhibit for a culture that used to exist around the world, which is the main function of this bottom area is a museum. If you want all the way around. Yeah, that's the part that would be immensely useful if we just have a floor plan to show us what that space is like. I think it's, it's that one that I was showing, but it doesn't <laughs> look like yeah. right? it, doesn't, it doesn't capture the space. So no. we need to define the extent of the space and the relationship to what happens at above. That's why we use the dashed line. So the big slot, so the section might be in the slot, I don't know, versus the section that's next to the slot or transverse to the slot. Those are two different, radically different conditions, and you have to have both of those to, to get them to work. I think a really good example. Um, 
Mm, maybe not. No, I was going to say look at Peter Eisenman's drawings, but yeah. that's not a good idea. Just his objective drawings because he gets he gets lost in complexity and graphic uh, uh, fetishization. Yeah, I think for something complex like this, a, a simple plan gives it more justice and explains it better. Well, What's clarity, it? because I think there's some richness. Is there's some richness in the design proposal, um, I think, but you, it will benefit from giving as a document that's that has clarity to it, because we can see what's space and what's not space and what the relationship to the other uh, uh, graphic uh, propositions are. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm very very intrigued, you know, by um, just going down there through this very thin uh, pathway. Then getting to all those those spaces that are semi dark that have some, you know, the camera or what they what the this software is doing is is very contrasty images which I believe are a reflection of what is it that is going to be happening over there. So you are creating this a situation where my eyes get you know a, a, a overwhelmed by light sometimes, but then they have to really look into the space because it's very dark. And that set of uh, situations and sensations, I think, experiences will make this space extreme, uh, extremely powerful. The core area with the bricks of the city, I think it's a, a, a great idea. The, what you have chosen and with the, with the kind of glossy or glassy uh, material that reflects the light, made it look like a very, very elegant and powerful space with the ceiling there, et cetera. You know, it is interesting that some of them actually touch the ground, some of them, some of them actually don't. Uh, that will be something that I think will be interesting to to explore in terms of why some do, some some don't, and what the implications of doing that are. Perhaps further study, but otherwise, I think uh, generally speaking, it's a good, uh, it's a well accomplished project. I also find a very intriguing and very compelling the topography that you have created above ground. Very suggestive, uh, very elegant. And I think it's consequence of uh, you having, having uh, have done uh, very good research and uh, looking at examples that pretty much uh, were um, uh, lined, lined up with, with your intention. So in other words, what I want to say this project at, at also is a consequence of choosing the right precedents, right? Of looking at the right architecture, the right examples, in order to 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 to, to harvest some of the ideas that uh, you can get from those uh, good examples and interpret them and doing something on you of your own. So overall, I think it's a very elegant piece. It's, it got lost a little bit in translation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your audio wasn't really coming very well, uh, for at least because of the, the all the power that is the, this software is using, and uh, but also the, as I think I, I totally agree with John, the, just basic, straightforward, you know, drawings. Uh, one more section, I think, one more section that should have that showing, you know, going across the mass, not through the hallway, but going across the. The, 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 so to see that there is a space underneath and then there is a bunch of soil on top, uh, that that will have, at least on my end, clarified a lot of what you were explaining. Now, I'm just going to reiterate, I know we need to move on, but just I want to reiterate that, that um, now's a really good time to start being master of your workflow because we're isolated and almost everybody's working and in, sucked into computer model and putting textures and light and stuff in models. And some of that's good, but it's not a panacea. It doesn't solve all your problems. And there's real value and importance to take your proposition and just look at it through the most sterile objective documents you can. Dark, dark line weight, light line weight, and poche. Where's space, where's not space? Because I think your project holds up and, and there's great value in showing it that way and then knowing which of those sections, like how many, like like two, three, four, or serial sections, best describe it. The other thing is don't rely on the model that you can navigate through. A, it may not work because of the technological limitations. More importantly though, I think there are key positions, privileged points within the project within which your awareness of its whole is revealed. 
This is a great point of view right here, this spot right here. It gives me the idea of being in the large horizontal chamber and connecting to the vertical chamber. That's what I would say. Uh, go through and mark just the most important ones. Spend time really rendering those. Know how those fit into the story of the project. Something that's an overview, like here's Brussels and there's, you know, just say that it's destroyed or whatever, and we can know where to where parts are and how you enter the building. And then, and then several key positions, something underneath one of the slots would be a very critical point also. But be masterful in understanding which of those almost cinematically tell the story of what your project does. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Good. Great feedback. Thank you, Gas. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jackson. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah, I'd like to see your face if possible. I don't know. I'm not. Yeah. Seeing... Oh yeah. Hold on. Do they have faces jump here. Let's yes, we do have faces. No, there, there we go. go. There you go. Fine. Okay. That's All right. Hey everybody. Oh, oh. Um, let me get started. Okay. Okay. So um, by now I think you guys are familiar with the concept of the future that we're working with here. Um, but just to reiterate, um, there's a city that's been reborn in the aftermath of this kind of cannibal apocalyptic event um, in which civilization was pretty much destroyed. Um, and so they're building this commemorative memorial um, in Brussels about an hour or so away by train um, that would commemorate this event and that they could travel to as a sort of pilgrimage um, to visit the past and memorialize it. Um, and so I think kind of what's important and specific to my project is in the way I thought about it was that I thought about it, um, kind of what happened, um, the, the specific events. And what I thought was important was kind of this, this moral decay of humanity, um, you know, getting to the point where they're willing to literally eat each other. Um, but also juxtaposing that against um, this opportunity that the people living in the city have now today to start this new society over again, um, anew, and maybe eliminate a lot of the flaws that existed in the first place. Um, so in doing research for this, I kind of first started looking for inspiration for the form. Um, and what I realized was I needed some kind of language that I could um, use to represent both the kind of violence and chaos of the uh, period of cannibalism and also at the same time represent kind of the triumph and hope um, of having made it through and hoping for a better future on the other side. And so I leaned on um, the Jewish Museum by Liebskind a lot. I like the way it um, kind of selectively allowed light into the building and also just it's kind of like coiled up, kinked up, um, zigzag form I thought was kind of um, almost like a scar in a way, but like um, very meaningful at the same time. Um, and then I also kind of realized though that having these two very separate um, kind of ideas, programs and emotions that I wanted to tie in kind of required some way to mediate between them, um, some, some kind of bridge of sorts, I guess. And so that's how I kind of decided that I would use um, the, memorial, the actual memorial space is kind of a reconciliation point between the past and the future. Um, and so for this, I actually um, was really inspired by a lot of Tadeo Ondo's work, specifically because um, a lot of the stuff he does with concrete and water, like the water temple, um, the Venice Museum, I just really like how clean and plain it is. And I think it really um, allows you to reflect and look inward without distracting um, the eye too much to your surroundings. And so I really like the tranquility of it and that kind of um, the feeling it creates. So I actually employed that, as you'll see further on, um, in my memorial space. So the next thing I did was start thinking about how people arrived to the site and we're actually going to move throughout it. And so here's just some kind of crude sketches. As you can see on the north side, those lines or the railroad tracks that run um, on top of this, uh, the top of the site. So assuming that people would be arriving to and from the city, um, either by train or at a little train station and walking the last portion, um, I thought that naturally people would be able to or would want to enter from the top of the site and leave um, as that was kind of the area of entry and exit. 
naturally. So I created this flow um, through the site with these three distinct experiences um, that I kind of wanted each to feel very distinct and separate from the rest, but also tie into this kind of sequence and this arc of time where you arrive and then you kind of dip down to the low point of you know the violence and the cannibalism and the moral decay and then you rise back up to this area of peace and memory and um you know respect and tranquility for the people who were lost um and the people who suffered in this great tragedy and then you finally after reflecting and paying your respects you move on um to the future and you're able to recognize the beauty and opportunity of this new world um, that you've been given so here's the site plan overall, um, just kind of looking at the site and the buildings on it. And um, what I tried to do here with the juxtaposition between these buildings was also use kind of a landscape to reinforce that. So I used, um, I situated the, the darker first space um, that represents uh, the violence and the cannibalism uh, on this stone paved plaza. And then I situated the other building in these grass and so I just kind of surrounded it with nature using these trees. And I um, grew that out of um, this central memorial circle. And then the buildings that kind of flank it start to form another concentric circle outside of it. And so I just kind of continued that with these trees in this half circle around the outside that stops once the grass kind of slopes back down into the uh, pavers. And this is cutting through the first uh, floor, so it's above ground. You don't see the underground memorial space in the middle. You just see the flanking buildings. So you would enter um, at the top left along one of these walkways and you would circled, or circulate down um, around this center point that comes down from the ceiling. It's like a massive point. And then you'd enter, walk through the space and then travel underground. And then when you, once you go underground, you travel along this walkway that I'll actually show you on the next slide to get to the central memorial space, which is this circular space. And it's actually uh, these kind of diamond shaped column slabs that hold up the roof around a central uh, pool. And then once you leave that space, you would uh, then go back to the third space and then exit out um, into this like nature walkway and come back to the, the place where you entered, which also serves as the exit before getting back on your train or however you're gonna exit, walk back. So um, this is another elevation here. You just kind of see how the, again, um, comparing the kind of heavy uh, low lying nature of the, the dark volume on the left with kind of the way that the, the light volume rises out of the greenery. Um, and this is looking again from the south out towards the train tracks. Um, and then this is the next west elevation. So this is kind of how you would see the site as you approached on a train um, along that axis that leads up to it. So um, what I like about this is just that the, the third space, the final space kind of triumphantly rises above it in the distance, um, providing kind of like almost a, a beacon of hope at the end of the tunnel, even though you know you're going to this memorial for this terrible tragedy. And then here's a section. So this is actually cutting through the underground space. Um, and those dark gray um, things that look kind of like poche are actually just the background wall, which is concrete. Um, but these big column supporting things that hold up uh, the ceiling are going to white marble. Um, and I chose that because I thought it, you know, had kind of a more important um, symbolic quality and it, um, I just thought it was kind of a better choice for something that was supposed to symbolize a kind of important uh, cultural gathering point for these people that have managed to get through this. Um, and then here's cutting, I guess, the other way. Um, again, looking back out towards the train tracks. So um, you can see on the left, the volume kind of constricting down and choking down into the ground. Um, and then you would, again, come down to this little circle memorial where you could actually sit in these little alcoves um, at the ends that are kind of hidden inside. And I'll show you a, a better picture of that later. 
but it's a kind of a quiet space for meditation or reflection or to grieve um, more privately. And then finally, there's the third space where you would come back up um, and then exit. Um, so the really big thing that influenced my decisions in kind of what I did on this project was um, the emotions that I kind of wanted to evoke in uh, people uh, that go through this. And so the first phase was really just about, um, I mean, I've already said this, but just about kind of shining a light on the ugly acts of humanity and really what we're capable of when we're, you know, at our worst and um, really kind of just exposing the, the truth about, you know, what we're capable of. Um, and then again, here's a further in. And uh, the light, the sharp kind of light streaks, I uh, wanted to kind of use because I thought they represented the violence um just the ruthlessness um and then the wall texture I actually created because i uh kind of thought that that kind of um morphing kind of irregular pattern kind of represented the chaotic and just the, the greed of the people who succumb to cannibalism and then here's the final memorial space where you go underground so um i oh shoot my bad I chose to use a still water pond because I thought that that still water and um, particularly the reflection of seeing just your own face staring back at you and that um, unbroken like plane of water uh, was really powerful and kind of represented that uh, death and like loneliness of the kind of current condition of the people who are surviving this. And then I um, included the trees on top because I wanted you to kind of, when you're experiencing this space, um, I thought they kind of symbolized kind of thought and um, kind of meditation, you know, and I wanted people to be very thoughtful in this space and pay their respects um, to the people who didn't make it and perished. But um, I also thought that they were maybe perhaps like a symbol of the beginning of regrowth on top of this kind of like um, mound of composted chaos and death, you know, so the first sprouts of life are kind of beginning to emerge again. And this is the final space when you um, come up the tunnel, you emerge into this long, um, narrow space. It's very tall and it just gets taller as you proceed through it. And um, this wall on the left actually faces the west. So the afternoon light comes in and rakes across that wall. Um, and then once you proceed through that, the main idea for this was just, I wanted to tie the whole experience together with kind of a hope um, a message of hope and like possibility for the future. I didn't want people to leave this um, memorial feeling necessarily hopeless. I wanted them to feel they have something to live for, even though um, the world is kind of in a bleak state. And then finally, the outside part, once you exit, you can come back and kind of circulate around this um, grass bowl that slopes down into the uh, oculus of the memorial. And then you can just kind of walk around it. That's a better view of it. Um, but that's it. Oh, I think you're muted. Hi, am I unmuted now? Can you hear yeah, me? yeah, I can hear you. I got you. Yeah, well, I go was the best thing I said all day just then. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, no, there's some good stuff here. There is. Uh, I would love to see this presentation with a uh, better graphics, specifically plans, something which is very straightforward, and with just some tweaks in the language. I think you could do it in about half the time and have a stronger presentation. So okay. um, we're doing this on screen, and there's a, a, an innate kind of casual relationship, but I know a lot of people tend to, to ramble a little bit in their presentation. Uh, I'm not saying you're doing that, but I think that you would your, your proposal would be stronger if it were more succinct. Okay. Have a chance to listen in on some of the other reviews, especially advanced designs. Look for somebody that's very good at presenting. There's, it's, it's a little rare, but there's a few. Specifically, um, it would be great if you could eliminate the beginning of sentences that say, I wanted. Okay. Because I don't care what you want. It doesn't matter. It's, but you're not, you're not doing it badly because it's after, after you say that, you go into right, why something's a good idea. So you go straight to the meat after that. But I would be start to be more self-aware of how you present and how you use words 
to lay out the proposition about what you're doing and what your approach is and why it's a good idea and why it's interesting. So okay. in general, I, I would change. I wanted to, it seemed a good idea to use this material in this way or to let light into the building. It's present in, this, it's present in your project and it's present in the sentences that you're using. So it's actually a minor tweak. But I would be self-aware of that and I would actually listen in on some really good reviews if you can find any and see how people that are, that are very good at it do it. Uh, you've Absolutely. chosen a number of, of very good perspectives. Your elevations actually are very legible. Your site plan is unreadable. I can't, because the buildings are green and the grass is green and little changes in elevation have wide graphic exaggeration. So I, I can't, I had a lot of trouble reading that thing. Uh, so cool. that's, go study some great site plans and floor plans and just learn that convention to help strengthen your argument and proposition. You have a dark thing and a light thing, correct? Two things. Yes, yes, yes. Dark, good and bad, like of humanity. Yes. Okay. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on those lines, I think of synthesizing. I think the, the project, um, I mean, it's really good. Uh, I have, I really commend you for uh, the amount of work. The entire body of work is uh, very, very strong. And it is, it is amazing that you not only designed one space, but you designed three. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you were looking at your presents and you were like, okay, I like that. I like that. I like that. Okay. I'm going to do the three of them. <laughs> and, and, and that's a, a, and I think that's a, again, you know, following say, the train of thought that uh, John brought to the conversation, right? The issue, the, the notion of synthesizing, the notion of picking what is it that you want to say and what is it that is important, right? Uh, from my perspective, I think that what happens is that, you know, by designing these three spaces, the circular one, the white one, and the darker one, then uh, one of them becomes stronger. Uh, one or the, the, the whole uh, message also gets a little bit, I think, diluted uh, from my perspective. So I, I don't know. I mean, I feel that, um, you know, you, can, you are showing a very, uh, very uh, strong work from a very talented designer. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that, you know, all the ideas have to, or all the elements that you wanted to do have to be represented there. You have to, I think, sometimes pick. In, if, okay. if you ask me if I could pick one, I definitely will pick the, the cement finished one, the one that you have chosen for the first, for the opening slide of mm -hmm. your presentation. Mm -hmm. I think that you even uh, recognize there that that's a really powerful uh, space, right? And, yeah. But the first slide in his presentation, I don't go know back. if you go back. The dark, the dark one. building, yeah. Yeah, which is the dark building. But that building uh, or that structure or that space, because I don't think a, we could call it building, right, Jet? But, it it's, it's, has a lot of uh, uh, interesting qualities from the light point of view, from the material point of view, from the spatial point of view. I think it's, it's, it's powerful. Uh, and then, you my, know. My vote would be for 13, just to, not to interject too much, but I like 13 because it's, it's outside and it shows us the duality of the project. It gives us an idea that yeah. something's inside and outside. Yeah. And it's per se that, that one. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So that's that's quite what's kind of what I wanted to communicate about your project. I really commend you, you know, for doing three, three on one. <laughs> right? <laughs> each one of them is good. I mean, each one of them could have been a building on its or a or a structure or a, a design of its own. Mm -hmm. uh, but think about editing. Think about choosing, picking your bottles, and see what is it that the strong idea is. And um, uh, otherwise, you know. This also uh, is almost at the border of, of falling in this category where this this kind of is going to be hard to identify if this was designed by one architect or by two. Right? Yeah. So yeah, because you are taking each one of those. The reinterpretation of the of of your uh, of your uh, uh, presence into this structure that I'm talking about, where I'm going to call it the black one. You know, it's remarkable mm -hmm. because you took the essence and you made it even better than any of those examples that you presented today. So uh, that's that's a that's that's something that perhaps you know in the near future you are very capable 
you can do very good work you 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 are very creative uh but you know editing things down is always a good thing as john mentioned so yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, just find find excellent sections and plans of complex buildings that just use line weight and a little bit of poche and learn that convention it strengthens your project doesn't take it in a different direction Okay. Like I don't see sections Great. through these spaces that have the chamfered ceiling. That's they're very beautiful, interesting sections, but I'm always outside when those sections are drawn. So I would I would look for those and I would uh, include them and definitely add them to what you're doing. Okay. Good. That's good stuff. Thank you Thank all. You, Sebastian. Thank you. Good Great job, comments, good job, Scott. Sebastian. Good, good job. Good job. Uh, Matthew, you ready? Matthew will be our last but not least presenter. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Matthew Powell. Hi, Matthew. Uh, can you see that? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So uh, my memorial focuses on uh, nature, uh, the resilience of nature, and as a metaphor for the similar resilience of mankind. Um, so I believe that there is sort of um, an underlying and widely understood beauty uh, in the reclamation of the built environment by nature, and I chose to focus um, on the undying attributes of the earth throughout history um, as a sign of hope for humanity's similar trajectory. Um, so I sort of wanted to focus on two emotions uh, in relation to resilience, uh, loss and, um, uh, loss, sorry, loss and acceptance. Um, so I paid special attention to two things, form and material um, to try and uh, represent those emotions. So thinking, I was trying to focus on um, ideas of descent, weight, and um, large static masses. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'll just give it this for time. So um, with also, material, I- I your files in box, so. Uh, sorry? I can't open any of your files in box. It looks like they're protected in some way. Oh. So I, I would simply have to follow your oh. very specific direction in the presentation here. Um. Don't worry, Matthew, let, keep okay. going. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Still Sorry. presentation, just be aware though that I don't have this incredibly useful thing where I can independently review the work. Okay, sorry, I don't, I don't know how that happened. Um, so I, with material, I looked at natural versus man-made material, and I decided to focus solely on man-made materials like um, black and steel um, and concrete, um, with the exception of one material that I um, actually created for the project. So I wanted to think of history as a material. Um, and then uh, I imagined it like some as somewhere between like an art piece and a borehole. So thinking about um, not only the, the event, which was the drilling, but um, thinking about Earth's geological history and how that's changed over time and representing all of the, the layers of the local geological history of, of um, central Belgium um, as sort of this uh, rammed Earth sort of like construction representing um, layers of strata that represent each, each age. Um, and then with the Anthropocene, um, or the supposed Anthropocene being the very last layer. So that would be um, asphalt and concrete on top, um, which sort of drives the idea that this age of man driving um, the earth is over and a part of history. And then also trying to highlight um, nature's resiliency through these different watershed moments and these different um, changing ages over time. So each strata I guess would be um, a different material uh, corresponding to the material of the actual formation underneath the memorial itself. Um, and then another aspect of my project is, are these um, this sort of forest of columns that uphold, um, sorry, that uphold um, my main gathering space. Uh, I really wish I could have like all my boards behind me so you could see everything that was going on, but, um, this was this was the yeah, one exception. It's good. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so this was the one formal ex exception that I had to um, everything else being very rigid and trying to be 
uh, static. Um, and this was um, inspired by not only boreholes. Um, so again, with being made of this, this material that I talked about, um, but also um, Egyptian and Greco-Roman columns. So that representing sort of the built history of the built environment. And then also the um, outer Sonian forest, which is just outside of the site um, of Brussels that I imagine sort of encroaching um, onto the Western edge of the site, um, which are these towering um, European beech trees, which would represent um, sort of nature and its resiliency. So geological history, built environment history, and um, the present nature. Um, these are just some emotional and sight inspiration um, that I had. So I looked a lot into um, uh, Impressionism and other artworks to try and imagine what this site might look like. Um, and then I just started putting collages together and thinking about what a total state of overgrown and reclamation of the built environment by nature would look like. Okay, so this is my ground floor plan. Um, so the, the project is essentially split, split into two components, um, the path and the gathering space. So um, the, uh, the user starts by entering the space um, towards the left and you start by uh, walking underneath and you soon go underground. Um, it's really, um, so you're sort of funneled into this very tight but very tall um, space. And then that leads you um, all the way to the gathering space, which is this sort of grid or forest of columns that uh, tower over the viewer and support a roof, sort of like it's sort of like the boreholes are coming out of the ground and supporting a roof above the ground. Um, and in this gathering space, uh, the user would only be able to see like a small strip of the sky above. Um, and there are these uh, steps. So there would be these unoccupiable Gabion wall steps um, that lead up to um, the surface level. So the, the entire space is actually sub completely submerged into the ground with these colossal steps um, descending down to where Matthew, the user- Matthew, Matthew, I think if you, yes. you, if you help us pointing out with your cursor- Oh, your sorry, sorry. As you are talking about, that will be, that, that usually makes it easier. So you would, um, enter from right here, you yeah. would you follow along this long, skinny, but very tall, um, sorry, space. And then you would exit out into the middle of this gathering space yeah. with these towering um, columns and these Gabion walls that um, ascend up. Um, and then from there, uh, you would walk up these steps and um, you can walk across here and sort of view the space from above and this time instead of towering above you the the roof would be um, a lot lower and so i wanted to give this um, feeling of, of weight almost um, and then finally you would be released and for the first time you would um, be sort of entirely exposed um, to the environment and the surrounding um, reclaimed cityscape. And then the idea was that um, after moments of restricted views, weight and compression, that the, the viewer would be finally entirely exposed to this environment and can hopefully appreciate that beauty um, within the landscape that I was talking about. And so it, it, the first path goes underground and then you come back up and the walk back is um, just slightly hovering above ground. So it's sort of slicing through um, the, the, the site. Um, and then this is it's worth mentioning also uh, the relationship with the church and this right I was, I was just getting into that so sorry um, this right here are actually the ruins um, of the church so I, I don't think we've talked about this uh, a ton but the the church is actually incredibly significant because it's the oldest surviving church currently um, in Brussels and so the idea that this um, significant event was the one thing that completely forever wiped out this church and the idea of um, a church that's being rebuilt over and over again, uh, rebuilding a memorial on top of that, I think is incredibly powerful. Um, and, and so the path above sort of zigzags and circulates through this church. Um, and then it also provides 
sort of the actual um, organization of the, the circulation in the gathering space. So the gathering space sort of um, mimics the, the uh, dimensions of the church and the underground path would go through what used to be um, the, the central nave of the church. So the user walks um, all the way back through here and then uh, can come out to this viewing space out here, which has a, a larger view of the, of the cityscape and um, can walk down uh, these steps to start the long trek back on the uh, pilgrimage back. And then uh, one of the last things I wanted to point out were these strips right here. Um, so this would be the only source of light for um, the circulation below. So the viewer could look up and there would be these sort of channels of these small strips of light coming down. And then as people walked over, um, their feet and their forms would sort of be abstracted as um, cut off silhouettes um, that would sort of uh, let in and block off light below. And, but while you're above, you would be able to um, see the, the um, people walking below, but you wouldn't be able to see them when you're below looking up because of the, the silhouette. Uh, this is the site plan just showing um, it. So it sort of ascends um, going up here. So the entrance starts off surface level. Here's the long pilgrimage back. Um, and then it's quickly consumed by the ground. Um, those contours are, are five feet each. Um, and then just showing the, the church's um, context with, with everything. Uh, this is the north elevation. Um, so you're sort of looking at um, the church, I mean, sorry, the gathering space at an angle, and that's what's the closest. Um, it's kind of hard to see with the PDF. You know, I wish it was this giant plot behind me. But uh, this showcases uh, that area where they, they come out of this, this um, this is the geological material um, I was discussing before and they, they come out of that um, and walk, walk down. Um, and then this is the, the west elevation. Um, so you can see the, the stairs here and here's the, the entrance that I tried to recreate that sort of descent motion um, to try and funnel them into this, this space. Um, and then here's a, a section through um, where the longest portion that would be the nave of the church and then how you descend um, into that large uh, gathering space here with the with the columns and the ascending gabion walls and then um, right here and right here show that overlap between the above circulation of low circulation and then here would be those those um, small it cuts through the small strips of glass that people would be able to, to have a visual connection between the people below and the people above. And then this is a transverse section as well, um, showing again the gather, oh, sorry, the gatherings, oh gosh. The gathering space um, and the columns, and then it, it just cuts through the, the stairs there. And then I also, to just for clarification, I wanted to, um, because they're hard to see on the drawings, I wanted to highlight the um, circulation with the exploded axon drawing and also the, the paneling system that would be all out of um, black and steel um, through a construction diagram of that. Um, so this paneling system would be all along here, which would be the above portion. Um, and then along here is the below portion. These are all these supports that, um, support the panels, um, and then this is all the, the glass portion here. Um, so this is the first exterior render. Part of the reason I chose the, the color um, of this material that I created was um, not only based on, on the existing boreholes, so it's a lot of st um, sandstone and mudstone that's already, already orangish, but I also knew that the surrounding landscape would be this sort of green um, and I really wanted it to sort of stand out sort of like a beacon. And then the, the black and steel, um, I chose not only because of its strength, its static rigidity, its man-made quality, um, but also the, its you know, blackened qualities as well, um, sort of trying to hone in on that emotion of, of loss. Um, so here, you're looking at um, the entrance 
Um, so you can sort of see that's how I imagine the, the ruins would be like. There's that channel of light coming down. And I know there's um, white lines outlining everything, but this right here is actually um, a strip of light from glass that comes down and drapes over, over here to sort of create a beacon of light so that you know, okay, this is where you're supposed to go in. This is where you're supposed to enter. Um, and then this would be a view from above, I mean, from the ab above circulation. Um, so here is the entrance path that um, right there would be this piece right here, looking at it from the other direction. Um, and then you can see the frame cityscape and the path back below and this glass right here, which I um, placed um, flush to the, the material so you could sort of like see see down. And then um, this would be the gathering space that you walk out to. Uh, there would be the tower and columns. Um, and the, the floor material here is actually these rocks. Um, so these stones that step on that, um, I wanted it to not only create sort of this echoing sound of, of rocks that you walk through, but also this fluid space. So you could sort of see, you know, where people have walked before, not exactly, like not their exact footprint, but um, you could see that, okay, somebody has walked through this space before. And finally, um, I wanted it to be sort of uncomfortable. Um, it's sort of strange and foreboding, I think, to walk on these rocks. I think usually when you, when you see them in a space, you're like, okay, that's not where I'm supposed to walk. And this central path is where I'm supposed to be. Um, and then the idea that they've been walking on this pilgrimage for a long time, so their feet probably hurt, and then they come out to this space and they have to step on these rocks, I, I thought was, was powerful. Um, and then finally, this is that um, interior view from above where this space is sort of weighing on you and you can see these columns from above and um, you have a better view of that small strip of the sky that you can actually see. And that's the project. Do you have your model, Matthew? Yes. Um, so I can try and load Enscape. And Hamin John, any comments? Oh, yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm thank, you for, thank you for a very, uh, very thoughtful, uh, complete presentation. The graphics are very, uh, very, very clear and compelling. A lot of great work in here. A good, good uh, consideration at uh, both the detail level and the overall level, and uh, it's quite understandable. I, I do have to keep reloading it. It keeps crashing on me for some reason, but I can get oh, to the document. Um, there's a lot of projects you need. You should go and visit. I don't know if you've traveled a lot or or been to see a memorial projects, but there's a number of moments that are reminiscent of some pretty wonderful places out in the world. Um, Peter Zumthor's uh, edition in Cologne at the Caribbean yeah. Museum is particularly yeah. I don't know that where that came from, but it's like looks like you're aware of it. Uh, have you been there? I have not, but. Um... I think like people said before, one of our um, earlier projects was choosing an architect and the architect I chose was Zumthor. So then mm -hmm. I did, um, was aware of that project and looked at that project to try and see how I could formulate circulation through um, the space of, of ruin. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was familiar. Yeah, so you know, why did, so the, my, my main critics, there's a, two things, uh, to do one is I don't think you are are yet util. You're you're not. Your your sections are pretty flat. Like if I go to uh, drawing number fourteen, it's a horizontal section through that long walkway, and it's just dead level. And then I come to the end and I go up a full flight, and then I'm on another level. You have the opportunity because you're really scripting the movement of the body through the site and across the site. You actually can can do very simple things like like walking down into the earth on a very long slow ramp, and at some point your head goes below the size of the wall. So your body moving through space changes your experience of the world. You begin to operate in a more sculptural manner. Right now, the thing that you have is a long tunnel where my experience is exactly the same at the beginning and the end. 
So it's just, an, I would begin to add into section the same kind of thinking that you're, that you're doing throughout the rest of the project. So that would be number one. I would just like, like look, look for that opportunity. Uh, the other question, the other, um, I think real test would be the very specific things like why are there two stairs going back up? And is that the best way to get out of that space at the end? And uh, why, why not one? And, um, and those, I think it's fine for now, but you know, I would be very happy with the thing that you have designed. But I mean, there's obviously you're, you know, you've put a lot of thought into it and your, your mind's very, very active at all levels. I would hope that you'd walk away with some questions going like, mm, why two stairs, you know, two-ness at that moment versus somewhere else. I just continue to be bugged by it a little bit. It's not a failure. It's just something that I think might be stronger and more powerful. Uh, would, and that act, that moment agree. actually has uh, is reminiscent in uh, the Swiss uh, town of Chur, Chur, C-H-U-R, the archaeological sheds. Um, go there if you ever, if anyone ever travels again. Go to the visitor center in town. Get the key. Go inside that building because it has the various moments that are reminiscent of your project, the steel walkway that goes down and almost touches the ground. You have to step up into it, doesn't connect. And then you walk down into the, into the gravel around where the actual displays are inside the sheds. You can't get it from outside. So you can look in from outside, but you really need to go in and, and see that thing. Um, really, really nice. I, I like the wall. The pathway is really good. The two different kinds of pathways. I don't know why we would go right versus left. I mean, there's some couple little questions at some some junctures that are like that. What happens at the apex on that on that pathway in? It's a real critical moment where you change from one thing to another, and and uh, is it significant of um, of anything in particular? Uh, I don't it. Yeah, take us down that hallway. Yeah. So one thing I did actually want to mention that I didn't mention in the project um, is that the moment where the ground does reach um, the hallway is reflected by that, that same material. So you're sort mm -hmm. of like, okay, uh, I'm underground now, then the steel would be um, supported above. And then that would be the, the glass that you're seeing. Um, well, you're cut off right there from any connection to the outside world that you can perceive uh, straight ahead. So, I mean, that's a, it's a kind of inter interesting kind of charged, slightly scary, moment again i think you, you could uh, strengthen that by by having your movement down into the earth like in, in section uh uh connected with that so it's it's good to see some something different happening above i think it's a really rich moment uh and um actually the does the material the same on both sides because the we had the the rammed earth wall as the single datum that we entered next to and then we deviated from that and then we're going to turn back again i don't know if the same material is the same on both sides right it's it's the it's the same so i think i mean part of that is just uh, my limitations okay. with with enscape but this would be where the ground meets so then this would actually be that that okay. wall and then it would just continue underneath tell me about the chamber at the end the hypostyle hall like space like right. what's, okay. what's the idea there again? So um, this is the main gathering space. So I wanted the gathering space to be the main point of, of program. Uh, just from researching um, all the, the other memorials that I looked at. So a space where everyone could come together. Um, and this idea of compression and then release is supposed to give them a sense of awe and loss. So looking at these columns and then this was really supposed to highlight that um, sort of these borehole like quality of, of this material and um, sort of just the, the purpose is to instill that sense of loss and that sense of I'm smaller than something else um, in the viewer. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's, it's good. It's nice. Um, part of me says maybe there's, you know, somewhere out there is a stronger version of it, but it's Again, that's just the kind of thing I would just let needle away at you. I mean, having beautiful tall pine trees growing at the very end. So it's this 
formalized but uh, abstracted forest in a sense where your body and the body of the tree is symbol of nature that you begin to interact with is a different version of what the idea is. Um, it's something where the, the magic balance might be in the, in the balance between what's heavy and what's light. And, and what, what, what you're feeling, I mean, you're onto it when you think about it, you feel very small in the space. I think that's, uh, I think that's good, but also uh, uh, you're also feeling yourself as thing or body in space. And each of these is a body in space and the, and the multiplicity of them also. So, so um, it's, it's, it's good. The, uh, should it have a roof? Yeah. I yeah, don't yeah, I, 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 I agree with you, John. I think the, well, the part of that space that I'm a little bit not completely understanding is just this cap, right? Seems like it's just like a cap of for 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 creating a covered space. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's very explorative, and you have a lot of uh, very uh, strong qualities on the materiality, and the and the spaces. And I wonder if, 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 you know, further investigation should happen, especially for this space, you know, because, um, I mean, I all also wonder if, uh, you know, we have three rows of columns, why not four, why not six, why not 10 or 12, right? I mean, it could have that we are, there is no limit here, right? <laughs> there is no limit. There is no, 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 no constraints. So uh, in order to create this really powerful, uh, you know, hypostal, uh, hypostal uh, is, is space, I think it's very, uh, I think studies of, okay, how many columns will make it, you know, so dramatic and so uh, powerful and the way the light will come through also, I think it will be uh, worth studying. I suppose you have done a little bit of those, but it will be interesting to see, you know, determine day and time what is it that it happens within that space and how the light plays a role within the space. Uh, uh, and just, just trying to pick stuff because I'm not really, I think I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that this is a very strong project. Uh, the other part that uh, in addition to the double stair that John mentioned, I wonder if it will be a, a stronger, the experience will be stronger if you just go there and then you just, yeah, and then, but then, then you go up and then you are able to see it from above. And I wonder what is it that you gain from that? You know, from now I'm gonna see it again from that point of view. I think that it a, 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 a diminishes the original experience of going there and being on this, on this space with the columns and, and, and that notion of feeling, you know, small that you were talking about. Uh, uh, I, I perhaps will have just, or will think about the possibility of, okay, I visited the site and then I had my experience. I was moved, I was touched, and then going to onto some, something else, right? Something else. And similar to the, the, the project that I, uh, to the, uh, uh, the first presentation uh, I, I just don't remember the name right now. Who was uh, Juan? Juan's presentation, right? Uh, when look at the, at, I, I really appreciate the exploded axon, and I really appreciate you know that draw, the drawing, the effort. Also, the the same thing for the panels, but the panels seem to be a, a little a, a mundane, right? Seem to be a, a little bit just uh, too regular. For uh, and, and simple for what you are doing here. I, I wonder if, if I also uh, some uh, pr proposition of a different material that you know can be more forward thinking, and and uh, and especially and materially, it can be done here instead of just simple you know, post and what we we'll, we will do this in the 20th century, but in on the 21st century. But what will people do at you know in this future view? And how will that play a role uh, on the overall experience? You know, so just kind of breaking a little bit that notion and kind of be imaginative about what can what can be done and uh, uh, thinking forward. But I mean, as I mentioned, I'm just trying to you know pick on things that I feel that could make the project stronger. 
But generally speaking, it's a really, a really well thought out, really good project. I agree with John, the sections are good. It was nice to see, you know, sections and, and plants. They just need perhaps some depth. Yeah, I agree, some textures, some shades, shadows or something that helped me to understand where things are. Uh, and also because I'm seeing them on the computer and it's hard to see the line widths and so forth. But yeah, it's picking good job. Yeah, it's very, it's very nice. It's, uh, um, there's a, a number of projects that you should look at and go visit in the future. <clears throat> and uh, feel free to just remind me of this project and email it me at some point. The, there's, a, there's a project you might want to look up. This is, uh, I'm just, I've got my other camera on my other screen. This is a project by uh, the architect Axel Schultz. It's a crematorium in Berlin. Maybe you can see the name there. I don't know, but it's a um, crematorium in uh, in Berlin. But what's amazing is it has this. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So A X E L Schultz, if which is S C H U L T E S. And it's a crematorium. What's amazing about it is this uh, repetitive, somewhat irregular, hypostal hall-like space. And the columns have this like strict abstract uniformity to them. And they support a, a ceiling which has this you know, very straightforward abstract flatness to it. But the connection between the two is, is dematerialized. Like there's a, there's a gap or a ring where light is visible at the point where you most expect it to be ordinary. And so there's this magic moment that happens there. And it's the kind of detail that might transcend or change what happens in that space that you have at the end. Agree. But uh, overall, really, really great project. Really, really nice. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for that. And uh, beautifully presented and documented. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, well, we surpass our time slot, which... Uh, which is good. I, I like that we're really engaged on, on really rich conversations. So uh, I want to thank you, our reviewers, uh, for wonderful comments. Any final comments? Maybe one minute we can. Uh... Uh, learn how to tell stories. It's a really important thing to do. It's like we don't know how to do that well, and we don't learn it well enough uh, as architects. And it's uh, very useful in this proposition and everything that we do as creative people. So. Uh, Oh, it's cool. Very interesting idea. Yeah, I agree. And I think I, you know, I have, I said at the beginning, I said at the end, I mean, very good work in general to commend you for what you did throughout the semester. Uh, it was really interesting, very, you know, challenging. Uh, 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 I will just in encourage you to think about, okay, uh, if we are in this futuristic, you know, setting and we are looking at how things can be done in, in the future. Uh, think about how materials and assemblies and you know construction methods could evolve as well. That's probably something that I saw a lot of conventional things happening in the future. So how is it that uh, you know after all that crisis things can be reshaped, rethought, in, and converted into something different? That's probably something that I will will think about. But yeah, but again, you know, very impressive work. Congratulations to everyone, to Jean Pierre and everyone here. It was it was very nice. very nice, very nice work. Thank you so Good. much, guys. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate. It. And uh, we'll be back in uh, less than thirty minutes for the third session. So, okay, remember to turn your audio off. <laughs> yes. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Good. Okay. Bye. Bye. And uh, Camille Job also here. Excellent, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for 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 joining us on this uh, um, exciting uh, new way of presenting uh, <laughs> student work. It's not the same as the studio setting, but we'll do what we can, right? So, um, a little bit about my studio. Uh, we explored the idea of emotion in architecture and uh, all the phenomenological aspect uh, of it. Uh, challenging the students to think uh, uh, in terms of concept driven by metaphor or uh, personal experience. In early early studies, we work with uh, particular emotions as a source of uh, inspiration for architecture. Each of the students on the first assignment have three emotions for which they have to uh, design a um, uh, uh, 
architecture piece that either conveys or represents that particular emotion. And the second assignment, that was a two-week assignment. And then at the second assignment, we did the same, the same exercise, but through the lens of an architect or an artist. So they were able to kind of immerse themselves on the process, on the design process and the sensibilities, uh, not from personal uh, uh, experiences or, or memory, but through the lens of, of someone that they uh, research and, and they get inspired from. So that helped them uh, a little bit with what is process and in a different way to apply concepts into, into architecture. And it was really interesting to see the, uh, the difference between the same emotion uh, exercise and two different uh, types of architecture. So that was, I think, uh, preparing them for this final project, which um, was the, the, whole, the whole class wrote a proposal for a dystopian or utopian future. And we selected from all the proposals, uh, our three favorite ones, and those were assigned to uh, five students. And the group of five students who were working on, on that particular future had to a little bit develop what will be the site. And I don't know if you guys had a chance to look at the uh, uh, UTBOX uh, folder. Um, and um, there's a file that it was the team, teamwork about the uh, kind of like an inspiration board of what would the mm -hmm. site look like. And that responds to the future of, of um, now civilization, the limited type of civilization living in Mars and how to memorialize in, in diff different, um, uh, um, some of our students had a different take on what the memorial is about. So I encourage all of you presenting uh, in this session to give like a, a quick um, a backstory and where, how you are interpreting the, uh, the narrative of the proposal for the future and what are the concepts for your design as well. So it facilitates, uh, uh, understand a little bit for those who haven't followed your projects before. Um, so that's kind of like what the studio is about. So we'll be, we'll be transported to Mars in a very, very distant future, uh, missing all the loved ones and uh, try to um, remember what was life on earth and see where these students will take us. Um, I wanna take the opportunity also to introduce um, our two external reviewers. And uh, I hope uh, Professor Gary can join us since we're uh, limited. So here, I was just on the limo review and he was yeah. supposed to be there as well and he wasn't. So he oh, may I'm not sorry. be around today. So okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much um, for that. Well, um, so uh, Brett, uh, Greg is a um, project manager with uh, Ross Reconstruction. Uh, she's earned a Bachelor's of Science in Architecture from the University of Virginia and a Master's of Architecture from the University of Texas. So she's a fellow Longhorn. Uh, Greg has uh, previously taught this uh, design studio, right, too? Uh, Designed too, a couple of years, yep. Wonderful. Uh, so welcome. Thank you so thank much. You. Um, Camille Job, uh, she's a very experienced local architect. Uh, she uh, uh, has her own practice, Job Corral Architects, for those of you are familiar with, with her work. Um, she first studied engineering at uh, Boston University. That actually didn't know, so that's uh, very <laughs> interesting. And uh, followed by environmental design at Texas A&M. She went on to earn a master's degree in architecture from the University of California at Berkeley, where she I won the Berkeley AIA Certificate of Merit Awards. So really good reviewers today. So we're blessed of having you guys. Thank you so much for, for joining. And, um, and with that, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Aranza. Are you ready? Can I ask one more question? Please do. Okay, I have forgotten. I have taught at UT from time to time, but I know you guys have resequenced a lot of things and I can't remember where we are in the sequence. Yeah. Yes, so uh, we are uh, second year students. Um, okay. And uh, this is uh, what it will be like intermediate um, okay. uh, studio. And this is a studio of uh, speculation, it's a speculative. Uh, so, um, yeah, so for most okay, of them, this is their fourth studio, correct, Taz? Yeah, fourth studio. Great. So, okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. Aranza, take it from here. All right, that's the truth.
just to clarify, y'all can see that, right? Yes. Yes. So, um, Professor Chu, uh, could you explain a little bit of what the, the world is, the vision future? I, I actually did send the, uh, the future proposal, but it will be worth to kind of remind us, if you don't mind, since you're the first one, I don't want to put you on the spot, but by all means, if you can give us a little bit of background, that'll be wonderful. Will do. All right, so remembering Earth. So many years in the future, there was a great starvation on Earth where many people died and not enough food, not enough resources were there to go around. So the rich people said, hey, why try fixing Earth and we can just leave and go to Mars? So that's what they did. They went to Mars and they established their colony. And then several years later, they realized, actually, we kind of miss Earth. But since they did not want to go back, they decided to create a memorial on Mars to honor the lives lost and the planet that they left behind. Uh, this was our board for mid-review. Um, this is our site. And uh, we actually chose an image from Mars and turned it into this topography. And uh, the idea is that the, the colony is actually underground. So that's what these panels are. Um, and then the shell is basically the entrance from above here seen. So tasked with this idea of creating a memorial for an entire planet, well, what is it that we need? We need sun, water, life. That's what Earth represents. It's also cultures, traditions, and memories, and all it that makes humanity what it is. So how does one honor an entire planet and the people lost or left behind? I started exploring this idea mostly with emotions, uh, like what it feels through light, what light makes you feel, what these spaces do. And so I chose to uh, make some watercolors of kind of these ideas of light that I wanted to incorporate and have this vision of this tree of life and water flowing through and what that represents. Uh, I was actually inspired at first by the uh, Aztec temples and how they related to the sun, how much the sun is difficult to obtain in, on Mars because of the, the harshness of the light. So I wanted it to be a soft sort of light to it. And that was this idea or everything is underground. That's why the civilization is underground so that the harsh rays of the sun won't be too harmful to the, um, to the civilization. So in terms of what that would mean, I wanted it to be in three spaces to represent the loss of the people that were lost during the Great Starvation. Then this new exploration of going to Mars and trying to figure out how to survive in a completely different environment. And then hope for the future and the life that they were able to successfully accomplish on Mars. And while these were my first sketches, I realized that it was a very linear procession. And so I started to reincorporate that into how could I turn that into a more rounder, more organic space where it represented Earth from a more natural standpoint than just a very cubic form? And that's where I began to play with a little bit more form, a little bit more the procession, what that would mean. But I still wanted it to be in those three steps. So I still kept this idea of loss exploration and hope. So the first space you'd go into is loss. And because I wanted to incorporate both natural forms and cultural aspects, I at previous um, civilizations and uh, traditional 
like the burial mounds are supposed to be those representations of the loss that occurred. But the Zen garden is supposed to be that reflection, that idea of having water, a scarce resource, uh, represented through other means. And I also found interesting this idea of what it is to have a desert and an ocean, how they can both be the similar, the similarity of barrenness, where it's like a barren uh, circular Zen garden, also with organic forms found in nature like this pufferfish circle. And that leads to the first space you walk into. So this is what you'd go into at the very, um, very entrance. These are those domes that are supposed to represent the burial mounds and the Zen garden-like space. It is all underwater and it's supposed to be that first initial feeling of a little bit uncertain but peaceful and very subtle light coming through. And you can see there will be light going into going in from this next space, but it's a very soothing, almost um, nostalgic feeling. And that's what I was going for. Uh, in drawing, that would be the entryway you go through here. And then you go up into the exploration space. And exploration on Mars, I feel, is a very impending sort of feeling, something that would be new, but also familiar. So I looked into spaces that reminded me of Mars, and that would be like this canyon in Arizona, these ideas of landforms, but also light coming in. And that leads into the actual walkway where you'd, ex you'd exit into this interior space between the interior shell and the exterior shell. And you travel upwards into this space where there's like light coming in. And it would lead you into the space of hope. So I went back into my drawings and I realized that I think the best representation of earth and life comes to the trees. And I chose the Japanese cherry tree, cherry blossom tree, because the flowers are supposed to represent the passage of time and the fragility of uh, beauty, beautiful life. And also looked at a previous project, um, also from our studio, where we were introduced into forms through emotion. And this was my model for nostalgia. So I wanted it to feel the similar reflecting space. I was also inspired by the Heida Yes Center with this idea of diffused light and uh, the cenotes in Mexico. Something to note is that the cenotes are actually one of the places where the Aztecs would have these rituals, um, the sacrifice rituals, some of the bodies would be put in the cenotes. So that's also going with the idea of the burial mounds and the water somewhat burning them. So this is that space you walk into right as you're leaving that exploration. And I think that it's uh, this feeling of calm, but also having this idea of, oh, it's an awful place and you, you walk through here. And that connection is what I wanted to represent. That's the drawing where you go up through this interior wall and then out onto the space. And you travel actually behind that wall before you saw. And so for the actual space of hopefulness, what is it that represents earth and beauty? A lot of places that means nature and forests and waterfalls. Um, but I also looked at well, if we're on Mars and we have this civilization on Mars, does it become kind of a, an oasis or somewhat of an island? Um, 
and that becomes this place where you gather. This is a gathering space. Uh, this is a view from that bridge. And here is the tree of life, as it called. As you walk upwards, you see that this is the movement of water, which is supposed to represent life, versus the stillness of the water below, which represents, um, well, traditionally, still water is associated with death. So it's more of a reflection space. And as you move upwards, it represents more of life. And it's kind of traveling towards the heavens, having this idea of what earth was like, even if you can't actually be there, of having these plants and these natural elements while still having a view of Mars and knowing that there is a connection between both. And as you experience the space and as light flows through, um, you can also view it from here, the exterior portion of it, of Mars. Uh, something to note is the Mars close approach. This is a phenomenon seen every few hundred years, I believe, and actually the Mars close approach will be occurring again um, the 6th of October of the year. And this is that time in both their orbits where Earth and Mars are close enough to be seen uh, very well. So the space that I created is um, a representation of, uh, or it's more a social gathering space where on the night of the close approach, people can go and gather and view Earth and Moon and celebrate this connection between the Earth and Mars. And that's the space here where any day you can see that there's the, the wilderness, you could say, of Mars. But then that night, you'd be able to see the Earth and the Moon and gather with everybody from your civilization. Here is that in and you go up this way. Here's the gathering space. And then the exit would lead you to the exterior. This is the exterior of that interior rendering um, that I showed a few slides ago. This was my And that also inspired a second model to this studio where we were attached to create a representation of our emotions based on an artist. And I chose Salvador Dali. So this is that model that I created for nostalgia, which was represented uh, as a smooth version of the, that layered cenote that I created for my previous model. So I wanted to incorporate the layers of the nostalgia model with the smoothness of the Dali model, as well as the entrances and the exits in very uh, small and not as well seen uh, pockets. So this is that view as you exit down the stairs, exit the structure. Um, something I was very inspired by as well was Ayers Rock or Uluru in Australia, where it's a very barren landscape, but you have this strange formation with no context. But I think that it's that still, it's still time the land, uh, something that the Aborigines were very aware of, as seen in their artwork, that I wanted to incorporate into the exterior of the project. So this is that view from the western side. So it's, a, it's rounded and it's similar to these domes, but there's still an element where you can tell that it's something different. It's uh, more like a, a sort of rock than anything else. And there's light, there's glass. Glass is an indication of the layers, kind of like the layers of, of Earth. And I chose the material of rammed Mars, not rammed Earth, uh, which is one of the somewhat design constraints that we had 
because of the materials available on Mars, but to show the tie between the idea of ground on Earth and ground on Mars. As you can see here is the building and it's nestled into the domes so that it goes with, it somewhat flows with it, but also stands out a little. And the close approach space is actually a view out onto the frozen river where you exit and you have access to the river and to the site. There's that entry space, the, the nostalgic base here, traveling upwards and then to the second level, which was this whole space and then traveling to the space of the natural area and then the close approach space. And there is a video. I apologize if the sound isn't the best. It's okay, Aranza. Uh, the video is actually available in the uh, folder. Uh, it plays super nice. So if you guys have access to the UT box, the the video is is, is uh, worth worth uh, watching with the sound and everything. So if you if you guys have opportunity to do that, that'll be great. Um, I know it probably much with the streaming and the uh, and the uh, screen sharing that it's like lagging a lot, but as a beautiful, beautiful video, so. Mm -hmm. I can try one more time if you'd like. I have the I'll folder open right now more. and I can't, it doesn't have a little go button on it. Oh. Brett, do you have it open? I don't, but I'm where I'm. My internet's lagging so much. I'm worried I'll just stop the whole thing. Yeah, up. it's. Really <laughs> right Sing it. But, uh, okay. We can send a. Uh, we can send a link to it, right, mm -hmm. and, uh, after after the presentation. If you want, you're more than welcome to try one more time. I know you spend a lot of, of, of time, and and it really shows the experience of it. Yeah, I'd hate to miss it. I know. So, I will try one more time. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Let's do it.
Thank you so much, Aranza. Um, I definitely, I've seen the video. It's it's really nice, and the transitions are less choppy than the, what the live streaming does. But uh, yeah, I'll make sure that uh, we can send a link to 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 Brad and Camille so they can see it. Uh, I wanted to invite you for comments now uh, for our both reviewers. Um, I am flipping back through all the slides now to try to get myself oriented. Um, I think it is, we are finding this is hard to do when making our own presentations. The things that we're used to seeing simultaneously, you have to flip through separately. Yeah, Aranza, can you, can you pull up like um, just maybe that the main space, the, the hope, um, the hope space, like a rendering of that or. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, overall, beautiful job in terms of creating um, not just a space, but a series of spaces um, that are really poetic um, and really rooted in their context. Um, I really um, think one of the strongest things about what you've, you've created, first of all, it's still a linear path. I mean, you, you, you tried to get away from the linear path, but it, it is still a, a fairly linear one way travel, but you've done a really nice job of um, sort of taking open space and closing and opening up again, the sort of conceal and reveal and these use of these long thresholds um, and transitions really helps to accentuate the reward, um, I'd say at the end of the, um, at the end of the path. I am, I'm really curious since you, you come about, um, come at this really wanting to kind of mediate light. Um, I'm curious about the choice of water from a resource point of view on Mars. Um, and so have you given any thought at all about how, um, cause there are a lot of things about this that feel very earthly. Like it's a, it's a very sort of earthly notion of like, okay, we'll just, we'll, we'll make big reflecting pools of water. Um, and it's not necessarily a, a tough resource to come by, but um, is there, I'm wondering to challenge you for a little bit more like local context or resource um, uh, resource context, is there a way that you think you could kind of create the same feel that water gives you with um, maybe a different use of materials um, or is in, in the year 2,500, have we tapped into unlimited resources? Of pockets of water on Mars. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up actually. Thank you for that. The rivers that were shown in site plan are actually the frozen rivers on Mars and so the idea is that the civilization was uh, able to basically melt those rivers and have that water as the, the resource for the community. So that's where this water would come from. Um, the idea behind having so much water here in this space was um, so that it would represent Earth and those were somewhat abundant at the time and are no longer as abundant. So it's a, a reminder that it was a precious resource that isn't as easy to come by anymore. Um, in terms of a different material that could be used, perhaps glass, uh, could have that same feel of reflection. Uh, behind the, the proposal of the colony on Mars, uh, the material constraints, I believe, were Martian earth, metal, like steel, I believe, and uh, glass because there were not very many resources, like especially wood, there was no, no wood on Mars. Uh, so that's why I chose to use the land Mars and the, the water and glass. It could be a really interesting exploration um, and experimentation over the summer to play with light and glass and mirror and maybe try, trying to even kind of uh, study some film effects on lighting. Um, to try to recreate that kind of effect. Cause I agree like in that space of loss, I mean, what a, what like that perfect sort of quiet calming feeling of that, that water over your head. And so 
Um, I think it'd be really interesting to play with um, some other techniques um, given the resource list that you had. Um, I think you could probably achieve um, really similar effects, but yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna ask some really basic questions <laughs> because this one, on top of this being all digital for us, um, this is not your traditional type of uh, studio project necessarily, and it's on a whole nother planet. Um, so, are all of these spaces in the one space? Like in when I'm in the uh, what's the the first one, the law space, is that, what's the law space's relationship to the hope space? Which drawing would I look at to see that? The section, perhaps. You're uh, below it, right? Yeah. At the, well, you would have to be because there. you're under the water, but yeah. where? There, she's got it out Hi. to the section. Uh, I, I know, right I'm also time. having, mm, Uh, yes. <clears throat> Let me go to that one. Okay, got it. Um, what is the relationship of this? How are people, where are people before they get to this thing? Yes. So, um, our proposal here. Yeah. This, by the way, is, uh, applicable to all of our projects, like uh, all of us from Mars, that this is a city and these domes cover the colony, which is actually underground. Okay, so all of the little blobs around the, your site are habitats. Yes, okay. like in habitable spaces, let's call it those. Habitable spaces, okay. Um, the idea is that they'd enter from underground through space here. So this is where they enter, is okay. that reflection space. Okay. They'd exit that space through here and they travel along that, that ramp, which is actually yeah, gotcha. <clears throat> And then onto the second space. Mm -hmm. Travel behind the waterfall, up onto the bridge, and then onto the the platform. Okay. And this may be a silly question, but does anyone spend any time on the surface of Mars ever, or is the assumption that everything's underground all the time? That is possible. We haven't really established it. It's a little difficult to. Um, <laughs> they would have the technology where they could go onto the surface for an amount of time, but the idea is that they wouldn't be exposed to the rays of the sun for far too long. Mm -hmm. It is out onto the site so that you can experience the site, but it's not meant for, for someone to stay there for very long. Mm -hmm. in, in uh, there's, there's actually a couple a proposal, I think that, uh, uh, addresses the surface, so you approach the uh, building on the surface. Okay, um, so the relationship of the people generally in the habitats and or the habitable spaces in your space, they're only engaging with that surface mostly through the holes that you're providing, the, the apertures that you're providing. Um, can, can they see through the little slices um, in your um, well, perhaps a few. Uh, if they're at somewhat eye level, the idea is that they only provide uh, diffused light. Um, it was shown a little bit in the video. In fact, if you would like me to open, uh, I have my Lumion file open. If you'd like um, to see the three D model um, of it, I will. I would love to if we had a lot of time, guys, but we still have to review four more mm -hmm. events and uh, we have very time limited. So, um, yeah. Um, I guess what I was going to uh, just 
trying to get more insight into all of this, of course, because it's not, I mean, it's not like you're, um, this isn't a building. This is a space manipulation, right? Because the supposition in this is that there aren't buildings the same way there are buildings um, in the old world. Uh, so I'm just trying to like, I'm trying to understand more of the, the inside to outside relationship and the connection back to earth. I think for me, one of the, like the most interesting uh, moments are the places where you're getting that relationship between the outside and the inside, or you're looking through the aperture back to earth and you have the close Mars approach um, and finding those connections because it, do, it does, it's a beautiful space. I will start, I should have started with that. Um, this is a beautifully sculpted space. Um, I think that it does evoke a lot of the same emotion from the spaces on earth that you're showing with Ayers Rock and um, the canyons. Um, there, there are several different types of emotions that you're approaching and I think putting the water in between them and, and layering the, the light, the vegetation, the water and the empty space gives it a nice uh, bifurcation or trifurcation, I guess, um, of, of the different opportunities for different emotions. I think the what I'm kind of looking for or more interested in is all of those engagements back and forth, because you've obviously created somewhat of a, yeah, like an earth terrarium inside of this thing that is inside of Mars. So what is that? If, you're, if it's introspective and you're thinking about Earth when you are inside of the hole that's inside of Mars, looking inward, you're sort of seeing the Earth, but then you have these apertures where you're looking out and you're either seeing Mars or you're seeing the Earth. Um, I think seeing if there was some way to layer those things a little bit more. Like I'm looking at the one where, I'm sorry, I'm flipping a lot through your pictures instead of looking at what you have up because I, they're all really interesting to me and in trying to find uh, different ways of seeing these. But the, the blue one that you have up or the, the one where you're looking back, is that, in the same, is that the same one as when you're standing next to the tree looking out? Or is that a different hole? Uh, this one? Uh, yes. What you have up says Mars close approach. That one, yes. Okay. So those are the yeah. same holes. So in some instances, you're sort of on the edge of it and you, you're looking across Mars to the Earth. And in some of it, you're sort of in the Earth inside Mars. Um, I have a specific comment about that. I think, you know, the thing that's interesting about these projects is uh, you don't critique them in the same way that you would critique a building. Um, I think what these can do is uh, generate conversation about emotion, obviously, and how you react to it in space. I think they all have sort of a, you know, a cathedral type feel to them, which is, you know, of course, the way that we have used architecture to evoke emotion a lot. Um, The light, I mean, obviously bringing light in from above um, is a very specific way of, of bringing emotion to the space. You know, I don't know, I was asking about the little slices because I don't, I don't really know how they, they're bringing in little diffuse light, but I don't, they're not as powerful as these other uh, sources. The little side oculus that you're looking back home through uh, is very powerful because you're looking across that Martian landscape to the planet home. And the one above, of course, brings in that super clear natural light. I don't know if the, the little slices, um, I might show it in the video. Yeah, they but I would dare say they're probably not as dramatic as the others. And I don't know what, um, what special they bring more than <laughs> other pieces. And I'm, I'm sorry, but we're running kind of out of time. Um, um, I, I, this is really valu valuable the feedback, um, and I appreciate that. But uh, Adansa, I think we, we got to move uh, with the rest of the presentation. Uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. It's a very interesting project. Mm -hmm. And the, conversation, you, continues. Yeah. the yeah. conversation continues.
I think this 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 applies to all the other proposals as well. Uh, John, you you ready to to share your your project with us? Wonderful. Okay, you, you guys you guys can hear me right yes um there's a, a big like gray rectangle on your side i think you have something uh and there's a way you can minimize that on the right side of your screen gray rectangle yeah we at least i'm at least um, I'm seeing i see it, it. Yeah. <laughs> uh i'm not i'm Dijon, not quite sure john i think it's your it's one of the zoom like bars Either it's the screen showing all of us talking, or yeah, you don't see the right side of your screen. screen. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to trying to figure out how to do it. No, no worries, and um, is this, it's still there, right? Well, we're not seeing your mm. your yeah. right, so your screen sharing. This is hard to try to figure out. So, no worries. Share share screen. And uh, I think if you can hit the important points, so we can get at least a ten minute conversation with the reviewers, that'll be that'll be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not sure if I know how to eliminate the little rectangle. It's fine. Uh, we'll we'll live with it. <laughs> okay. Is it is it like is it really like, you know, like interrupting the or is no? He, okay. No. Just keep going. Okay, so uh, as you all heard from Aranta, it's pretty much a design proposal of coming up with a memorial space on uh, Mars. Um, I'm gonna just kind of walk, quickly walk through the design process that, uh, that I went through in, uh, to accomplish that. <clears throat> um, now I can't see it. So uh, I'm a writer at heart and my way of approaching this was actually to try to pretend or imagine as if I was an architect and if I was placing a building plaque uh, outside of this memorial, um, as if to say it would be the first thing that people saw when they experienced the space, um, th this is what they would read uh, for their first time. Uh, I can't, it's hard for me to see it because this is blocking it, but let's see. <laughs> I'm having trouble here myself. Okay, but it reads, uh, to, those, to those who will experience this memorial, may the structure welcome you as it is a place for all people, even though the loss of loved ones may be devastating, leaving behind a permanent void, we must find within ourselves a way to move forward. It is very important to emphasize that we are not leaving them behind, but taking them with us. We will honor their memory and their lives by how we choose to live ours. They live on through us. So it was actually through sitting down with a pencil and a pad and actually writing this um, that really helped me uh, move through the design process by picking key words. Some of those key words, uh, as you see here, loss, devastation, permanent, void, reflection, sadness, forward, hope, fragile, grief, mourning, and careful. <clears throat> so out of, out of the, the words that I derived, uh, I came with three experiences. <clears throat> so that's not to say that uh, a space may not, a, a space may give this main emotion, but it may also give different emotions as well. But these are the three main uh, objectives or the main intentions of each space. So sadness, reflection, and hope. <clears throat> uh, I originally started uh, just thinking of forms of circulation. Um, I've I was thinking of this space as something that is a, a, of a very sensitive nature. Um, so originally I started with, you know, like angular forms where, you know, the vertices of those angles would, would create meeting spaces. Um, but I quickly found out that for a more smooth form of circulation, it's, it's probably better to go with curvilinear forms. And in this case, it was actually more congruent with the site as, as you will see uh, further into this presentation. Um, also, uh, I also drew inspiration from 
this image right here. This is actually from uh, the surface of Mars. Um, I got it from the NASA website. Um, so I thought this, I thought this was beautiful. Uh, I thought it was a beautiful form. Um, so, but that's actually a sand dune, which is smooth on one side and textured on the other. Um, so I was, I was kind of walking myself through um, this information to try to see how I could use it uh, to create a design. Um, here are a few objectives that I wanted to uh, stick close to to kind of guide myself. So I didn't want any really long, flat, orthogonal facades um, because there are really harsh solar winds on Mars. I mean, like solar winds that kind of change the orientation of things, really harsh ones. Um, I also wanted it to be a tribute to, to human life. And the only real life source on Mars would be the frozen rivers. Um, also, as far as the form goes, Mars itself is, is pretty undulating. So I decided that that would also be something to try to emphasize or highlight. Lastly, I, I wanted the space or the series of spaces to be completely unobstructed for human circulation or movement. I wanted the users to be able to move directly through the entire space. So with the help of Professor True and some of my studio mates, um, it's, as you all have pointed out, it's very difficult, um, very challenging to try to approach a project like this. Um, but the parameters that were given were light color, uh, material and space. So with these four mediums, that was that was kind of the box I was placing myself in to try to create the space first, just thinking of these four mediums. Um, I actually did more word relationship as you can see there with the drawing. So by the use of natural light uh, and only natural light, I had to try to find a way to introduce uh, light into a space that was intentional um, so that it would not take, it wouldn't take too much attention uh, from, from the spatial quality or spatial purity itself, but it would also give enough light uh, so the users could move around uh, and clearly be able to distinguish where they're going. Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is because there are extremely harmful UV rays on Mars. So uh, as kind of what Iran says, uh, presentation was highlighting that most of our forms or most of our ideas for building this, we were thinking underground. I was originally thinking underground, but uh, as you'll be to see further in this presentation, when you look at the entire structure, it is very earth-like, uh, it it's upright. Uh, it it kind of models after uh, a regular building of sorts on earth. And because we're memorializing earth, I decided to take that approach as well. Um, the light. Uh, we, we, we're limited on time. So oh, we, sorry. Yes. Okay. I want to make sure we give enough time for, for the reviewers to give. Yes, sir. Feedback. My apologies. Uh, so as far as the colors I chose, uh, I went with just earthen tones, uh, like soft and neutral. This was all uh, because of the sensitivity of the nature of this space or this building. Um, I didn't want any, any colors that would call attention out or uh, be distracting. Uh, from the spatial experience. As far as materials, just I just chose concrete and stone. I felt like uh, minimalistic is the best approach. And also because of the site, there's not much to pro procure. So um, that would that helped me decide what materials to use. <clears throat> as far as uh, space, it's extreme, but those three spaces that ocean sadness, reflection, and hope. This one, the one that you're seeing now is sadness um, with a huge void in the center. Um, again, that comes from the original uh, plaque, I guess you will, uh, if you will, uh, the writing on the plaque while it's explaining how it's losing someone is a permanent void. Um, and that's how I derived that structure. Um, and also the fact that it's huge, uh, this is actually, that's actually 20 feet above uh, human scale. Um, I, I know right away that that conveys a level of importance. So, so here's an overall uh, photo of just an exterior rendering with uh, the site to, to the right, the dome settlement, and then the structure itself. I do have uh, other, I do have other images I could show to, to give you an overall profile of the building if you wanna see that. 
Yeah, do you have a site plan or a building plan or section yes. or anything like that to help or the plan, especially in the section could really help us orient. Gotcha. Let me just a second. I might have to stop share for just a second because I'm still learning how to use Zoom as far as video goes. Give me just a second. Yeah, so part of the challenge of that is like that they're Illustrator file, so I can't easily preview, but I have been following mm -hmm. along with your um, presentation. Now I'm all different file world. Yeah, um, make sure everybody that you, you're uploading the PDF for the assignment so we can actually access those files. Um, Adobe Illustrator files are not part of the assignment, so make sure to be conscious about um, our reviewers being able to access your files. Mm -hmm. Okay. My my apologies, uh, but I want to share a screen. That's one. So here's a. Uh, I'm just share the text. Yeah. Here is the first space, uh, the void, um, with a huge dip in the center and this this crossover space. Um, the idea is definitely to feel a sense of loss. Um, but also a kind of like a sense of discomfort um, because no, nobody really wants to face the idea of losing someone. Um, so that that's that's how I came up with uh, that particular part of it. But this is the first space that you enter. Um, and Okay, wait, pause there for a second. So the space in the middle is loss. The space on the side is what? I'm sorry? This sort of uh, reduced space on the side is what space? I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're looking at. Can you, so can you in your section, you've got two spaces. Yeah. There's the, the main space and then there's so, the smaller space. So the, the space, the space with the huge okay. void and the bridge, uh, that's sadness. Okay. Um, the, the space with the, the rotunda space is, is hope. And then the last space uh, is reflection. Okay, and have we, did we see the rotunda space? Uh, uh, it, it, it's here in, it's here in section, um, right here in section. But yeah. I can, I actually have Rhino up so I could give you a, a, like a 3D of that, of that space right now. But in your slides, did you have in the presentation, did you have um, interior renderings of the three, of the three spaces? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, you want me to point out which ones they were? Uh, well, in relationship to this plan, let me see the plan real quick. <laughs> Get oriented again. So you come into the, uh, you come into sadness. Yes, sadness. And then what's the second one again? Hope. Hope. And the third one is? Re reflection. Reflection. Okay. All right. Can we see those spaces in the rendering then, I guess? Okay. Is that helpful to you, Brett? Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, here we go. I'm I'm in your box file too, trying to do the same so thing. So just, just to highlight, this is this would this would be the last space. This would be reflection. I did I didn't I didn't show it, but this is that's a that's a section of it right there. Okay. Um, but I will go to the the you were asking for the three dimensional space, right? Or 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 back to, or going back to the slides. Which one were you asking? This, can you pull up the hope rendering because it's I'm on it right now too, and okay. it's I mean it's. So, okay. so one just overall comment, Dijon, is that I know that this is a really difficult format to mm -hmm. present in, but um, creating a comprehensive um, uh, slide PDF slideshow that has that helps you sort of talk to you started you started mm -hmm. we've we've seen like we've seen like the the preamble of it in what you showed, but then we're missing kind of the meat of your. Um, presentation. I know it's hard, like not being it's, able to pin this stuff up. It's, um, it's pretty. Yes, it's pretty. It's pretty. But it would. Though. It would certainly. I'm sure that uh, Professor True would appreciate probably another two hours of your time <laughs> creating that PDF. Because you've or, got beautiful renderings, and you you created some really artful spaces mm -hmm. that are doing really interesting things with this diffuse light, and mm -hmm. you, you are doing a really good job of this sense of carving out space. Like yes, it's a very solid form that's that's weaving um, through the landscape, um, and I understand back to your reference of the sort of frozen lakes. 
mm -hmm. um, and how it mimics that. Um, yeah, we're just missing the, we're missing just the, the nuts and bolts parts of sort of, I, I loved when you said, you know, I, I think of myself as a writer and I pretend, I'm, I'm imagining that I'm an architect doing this. Well, you're an yeah. architect. I mean, you're, yeah. you're here, you're in architecture school. So don't ever say that. Right. <laughs> um, I really apologize. But we only have one hour to review three more proposals. And, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, Dijon, that I have to. Oh, it's okay. Uh, as I think they got the gist of it. So <laughs> yeah. and, uh, thank you. It's very important. And for the future presenter, for Sarah, Lily, and Miguel, Make sure to, to be concise, have a clarity of your drawings uh, so we can actually have a, a more engaging conversation about the design aspect of it as well. Thank you. Um, Sarah, could you, could you take it from here? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so just to reiterate the storyline a little bit, there was overpopulation, lack of food and lack of shelter that occurred on earth. And because it was beyond repair, they decided to leave and go to Mars. And so because we are in Mars, we have certain lim limitations that are going on. So it's very, very cold. We can only use concrete, metal, glass. Uh, the sun is harmful and the atmosphere is harmful. And so I really wanted to focus on the emotions that are associated with the great starvation and this whole idea of how they have to cope with hardship and this sudden abandonment of home and have to explore this new terrain, like this new, this uncharted territory that they've never been on. So my intention is to create this space that is not only a reminder of the challenges that was faced on earth, but also an expression of beauty as Mars. So though they, though they have lost earth, they now have a new home um, because what they did with earth is that they just decided to leave, but they can't keep doing this because everything will be destroyed by if they keep continuing to do this. So this memorial, I really wanted to emphasize the beauty of Mars. And so let's see. So our preliminary research. So uh, this is just our group site plan. We situated the site in this, in the first community that was ever established on Mars. So that's what these little domes are. And a lot of spaces occur underground, but you can't approach things from the surface. You can, I think the way I took it on was that you can spend a limited amount of time on the surface. And another thing that I, utilized in my design was these two moons because um, they're just a really beautiful part that like hypothetically can really emphasize the beauty of Mars and what's interesting is that there is a solar eclipse that occurs almost every day in Mars. So going on to preliminary research I looked at a lot of memorials and monuments but instead of using it as a precedent for form I wanted to focus it on, on more of like why these are so powerful and why they're so impactful and what factors actually um, result in this. So I narrowed it down, which is frame view, circulation, scale, materiality, relation to site, geometry, density, program, and narrative. And another really big thing is lighting, but I feel like light gets informed by all of these factors, which is why I didn't want to list it as its own individual thing. Um, and so with my design process, I started out with thinking about it as a narrative and thinking about it as three spaces. Um, I first thought about it as remembering Earth as something beautiful then the destruction of Earth and then the beauty of Mars, but that kind of got to be a little chaotic and I started thinking of it as separate buildings. So as I proceeded throughout my process, um, I went through a couple of iterations and I started to think about connecting these spaces and bringing everything together and just trying to make it enclosed because I think I thought about it more as like a pavilion at the beginning, but then I started to merge it more into this architectural space and I started to look at the site and follow the site because at first I situated it across from the dome, but then I started to realize if I use the river and I situate it in between the rivers, the river can start to inform um, the form of my building. And so the concept that I decided to go with was using the water as a driving force because water has so many meanings to it and it has a dual meaning It can mean like opposite things. So with a moving river, when it's moving away from you and never comes back, it, you can think about it as like sorrow. And because of the, quali the natural qualities of water, you can think about it as int introspection, but that momentum and that movement can also be seen as renewal and life. And so what I try to do is have my curvatures in my form be representative of this. And later when I uh, show my renders and drawings, it'll be more clear what this concept is. And we have, like, like I said before, the environmental conditions of Mars is that it's very cold. So the rivers are frozen. 
And so I feel like frozen, a frozen river is a really beautiful thing because it can mean frozen life, but it also can mean death. It's like, oh, it's not there. And so the, what I did was uh, upon entrance, the river is blurred and upon exit, the river is framed. So I wanted to deal with the duality of the meaning of the river throughout the space. And another thing is, uh, so with the factors that I used from my uh, research, I thought about the frame views, the circulation scale, materiality, relation to site and all those things. So with the frame views, I really thought about positive and negative space, like transparency and opaqueness and about framing the, because we're in such a unique site, I really wanted to think about using our site. So framing the moon, uh, using like the funky terrain that's going on, the frozen river. And so I wanted to create this shift in perception as you move through the space. And so with circulation, obviously like ascension and descension, how you enter and how you exit is really important. And in relation to the circulation, your scale changes. So I, what I wanted to do was like, I have these personal and communal spaces as you move through the space, you funnel through it individually. But when you're actually sitting in this space, it feels like a communal experience because it's so large in scale. And another thing was materiality. And even though we were pretty limited in what materials we were allowed to use, um, I went with what I had and like the transparency and the color and the texture can really inform the emotion. And as I mentioned earlier, it's situated into the site um, and has this dual symbolism. And my geometry overall was like informed by my program and informed by my site. So I had these strong curvatures and ovular shapes and it's very reminiscent of yin and yang, which is like this Chinese concept of dualism and how like these two things um, can harmonize together to create something good. So I feel like with this, because like my intention with the memorial is to give you the bad and also give you the good, it's you need to have both to really appreciate the value of Mars. And uh, also the density, something I noticed in a lot of things and repetition with that. So I use thin lines throughout to represent the event of the great starvation. So I use it in every single space, but it's just a reminder of the great starvation where it'll always be there to remind us. And so my program is separated into three spaces, but they're all interconnected. Space one is loss and devastation. Space two is contemplation. Space three is rebirth and hope. And just to reiterate, I'm sorry, I'm going really fast right now, but just to reiterate my narrative one more time, uh, this memorial is intended to remind citizens of Mars that the about the great suffering on earth, which was the great starvation and to convey the beauty of Mars to express that it's now their new home. So just some final drawing. So here's the site plan. And as you can see in the site, I've situated um, my building in between two rivers and just among all these rivers. So like from this space, uh, the slightly blue color thing over here is representative of glass. So you can see all of this, like when you're standing in this space and it's situated across from the community space. So you can enter it here. And this is the bridge that is situated over the river. And so here is my first plan. This is the underground space that is located in space two, where you go underneath and you have the ability to move around here. And you, it's not an enclosed underground space, so it doesn't feel disconnected from the rest of the spaces. So you, later in my other renderings, you'll see that you have the opportunity to experience the space at a very large scale and to see the people circulating around you. And then this is the second floor plan where you can get a clear idea about the movement throughout it. So this is the bridge and you go in, you go here and you have the opportunity to go down if you want to, and you can come back up or you can just choose to go here first. It's just this space of contemplation. This, is, this whole space uh, serves as that transition space in between. And um, then from this ramp, it like circles up more, which you can see clearer here and it keeps circling upwards. And then it starts, like this whole ramp start, like continues throughout the entire space. And something that you might notice is um, the, these little sticks and you can't see the sticks in the second space, but uh, okay. <laughs> it doesn't show in this elevation, but I'll, it, it should show up in sections. So this is the elevation, you approach it and you can see already that you have this whole transparent space that you can oversee the site on. And over here, you can start to see how I'm using light through the thin lines here in this first space. And this is the section. Okay, so these are the little sticks that I was talking about. So in the first space, you saw those cutouts. So those thin lines were the apertures in the second space, the thin lines are represented through railings, which occurs all across your circulation. And in the third space, the thin lines are represented through the steel mullions. And 
Oh, I and so this is the other section and it just kind of shows a little bit better about how open the space is and how you move throughout it and how you can go underground and you have the opportunity to go in between those other spaces. And so here's my first exterior render. Um, you can see the frozen river and how at entrance it is blurred as you are approaching the building. And over here, you can see again, like, so from the beginning, you would see, oh, the river's blurred and it kind of has this sad emotion, but then in here, it's framed a lot more beautifully and you see all these, like beyond this, you can see so much more um, of the site. And it's just in this very large scale upper, um, <laughs> this very large mass. And it feels very monumental, especially because it's all transparent. Um, and so this is the first space where the thin lines start to occur. And it, the thing about it is that the first, in the first and third space, they contrast each other in that these thin lines are the only source of light. But then in the third space, the thin lines are the only source of shadow. And this is the second space. So this is frosted glass. I wanted it to be where there is light let in, but it's only coming in from one aperture. And it's that. So I wanted, I was looking at my precedents and with my precedents, a lot of it was having these very large scaled walls that are just like surrounding you and your, your eye is attracted towards the upper part of it. And so I wanted you to feel like you're looking here and hypothetically it would frame the solar eclipse or frame the moons while you're walking throughout the space. And you have the ability as you're circling around to kind of see other people walking around. And this is the third space where, as you can see, I um, kind of frame better that how um, the site is framed. And that is the end of my presentation, but I also have a video just so you have a better idea of how the space feels. Um, I guess while we looking at the video, we can uh, start a discussion and get some comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the the idea of reversing the the not just the light but the solidity and the clarity of the two of the loss and the rebirth is pretty strong. Um, the central space, for some reason, uh, I do think that it, you're right about the way that if you focus everything upward and you're not looking at Mars or Earth or anything, you can have a contemplate. It was contemplative, right? Is that what the, the right. second space Sorry, was? Sorry, I muted. Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and, and I think that is coming across more in the video than it was in the sections or the plans. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's interesting. I think it's it, it has m much more of a focal point on Mars and sort of reconciling where you are in this new place through rebirth, which is really interesting that you come out and and that's you're confronted with this with this new place. Um, I, th I think that is pretty powerful. Thank you. I don't think I, I'm not getting the, the the linkage between the chaos and the contemplation in the middle, but maybe that's just the sort of mutated into the, and I wasn't following you because you were going pretty fast at the beginning and thank you for doing that. <laughs> you had a lot of information to get out. But I do think that uh, I guess what started out as sort of the chaos is the uh, figuring out how to clear the palette in between mm -hmm. um, and reconcile with the loss before you. So um, how would you suggest that I can better connect the first and second space? Because something I struggled a lot throughout the process was no, I, trying I to um, connect everything. I think it is, I think that uh, conceptually that does work to, to move from the lost space into that clearing space and contemplative and looking up and, and not really connecting with anything around you and then moving out into that rebirth space. I do think that works well. When I was looking at your plan, what I was distracted by was the thinness of everything. It seems like such a, a solid space to walk into and it feels very solid when you're in there, but the way that all of this is sort of uh, constructed feels very thin mm -hmm. compared to how it, it felt on the inside. Um, yeah, your glass you know, has the same weight as your yeah, yeah, or your concrete, whatever. 
And, you know, okay. where that shows up is not so much um, in the way that the light comes, well, it would show up in the way the light comes in because your, your walls aren't thick enough to really have that feel like a real slice going through there, but it also shows up uh, acoustically. And if you're talking about phenomenology, when you're moving through spaces that are built of something very solid versus something that's very light and thin, uh, that's, that's where that shows up a lot. Not something okay. you can see in drawings very well, but if you've been in those kind of spaces, you can feel it. And when you're looking through the drawings, you can feel it as you know, sound absorbing. But I think okay. to, to go back and, and look at your sections with that same eye and the plans, mm -hmm. uh, let's see, I mean, there, back up, hang up. Sorry. So, <laughs> that, the one that's super <laughs> thick, that yeah. thickness should be apparent as your contrast to the lightness of yeah. the, the surrounding glass in every single drawing. Um, okay. Because that emphasizes your sort of thesis of this sort of, you know, emergence. Um, oh, you know, so should the walls contrast. like be thicker? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's exactly what, what you're Camille's saying. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> On your plan, your 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 walls that are hard and solid, they need to mm -hmm. they need to be this thick. Yeah. Um, hard okay. and solid. Yeah. And the way that they connect to each other. I mean, I, I when you showed the plan that entrance from the lost space into the contemplative space, I wasn't really buying it in the plan. But when you showed it in the model and it was so tall and you were sort of moving through another one of those slots, it was way more convincing. Mm -hmm. um, but it might be even more convincing if there was if there was some thickness to that threshold. To that. Okay. Yeah, it is mm -hmm. a dramatic threshold. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll go to the sections. Okay. Yeah. And same thing. Yeah. Overall, you your your form formally, this whole thing is this very light, sort of diaphanous screen around this very solid sort of insertion um, mm -hmm. that you move through. And that doesn't convey at all in these drawings. The, the, mm -hmm. the feeling and the, the, the visual feeling of that Martian ground plane that you're rooted in, it needs to come up and sort of, you know, be part of, and that's kind of the irony here is that you're using the, these enclosed spaces or where you're really trying to have people think about earth um, but it's formed of this Martian land coming up and, and creating it. And then when it gets, when everything gets very light is when you're, you know, looking out at the Martian landscape. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical about a totally light, thin glass building on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> when you talked about the harshness of the sun and the harshness of, I mean, those winds. The wind. We've yeah. all seen the movie. You know. <laughs> um, I was just assuming that, um, because in the outline we were giving, they, gave, they said the material was um, safe in Mars. So I just went off that assumption and kind so of- It might be more bracing. More bracing. Yeah, a little, yeah, a little bracing. Mm -hmm. bit of bracing. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. A little bit of like yeah. baffles for all the Martian rocks flying around. Some kind, mm -hmm. of, some kind yeah. of thickness to that glass to help also be a barrier uh, for mm -hmm. the sun and, and, uh, um, uh, and the rocks. Well, um, you know, that's a good point because if you- if you're coming back out and you're just reconciling with the fact that you're on this new planet and you've got this, you're overlooking this vista and you're in the middle of the frozen rivers, um, it would be interesting if that, you know, when it's light and diaphanous and so thin, you kind of feel like, oh, I'll just walk outside for a stroll. Like there's, there's not that much of a difference. If you can feel like, if you saw that there had to be like four layers of glass with like these air pockets in between for, you know, to keep the cold from killing you or something. It might be more of a recognition of the difference between, you know, a glass yeah. building on Earth and a glass building in Mars. Yeah, the reality is that you have a really harsh, deadly site and you've mm -hmm. made something that will look beautiful in the middle of Westchester right now. Like it will mm -hmm. work perfectly in just this beautiful field, but you need to now you've got all the ideas there. Now you've really got to adapt mm. it to the environment in which you're mm. actually placing it. Yeah, because the thesis is very clear. It's that the building now has to respond um, from the spaces to the sort of the construction and the physicality of it. Okay, thank you. But nice ideas and nice and nice um, uh, procession. Yeah. And speed, thank you for, you got through this very clearly and it was clear to see the project. I mean, I, mean, I do wanna say that the, all of these projects are so very different. I hope at the end, we get a little chance to respond back to some of the ones we had to skim over a little mm -hmm. bit. The more we go through these, more we get it. 
Yes, absolutely. And uh, thank you so much, Sarah. This is, uh, you got really great feedback in here. So thank you. Awesome. Uh, Lily, you ready? Mm, hello. Yeah, I can share my screen. Please. <laughs> Can everyone see the presentation? Okay. Yes. Um, the general concept for my building was for there to be these three main spaces, um, a sad space, a reflection space, and a joyous space. And they're all kind of linked. Um, the form is generated by like, these five major blocks that all interact in a way to represent stability in the joyous space, which would be on the side and um, fragmentation and like destruction in the sadness space, which would be underground in here. Yeah, I can go through the images. Sorry, I forgot um, slow for me when I'm using Zoom at the same time. Okay, I looked at some of these um, inspiration images. They're also monuments to try and understand what Mala kind of is. I'm thinking this might go quicker if I um, exit presentation though. So where what are these? Where are these? Um, this one is this is my favorite one. It's in Croatia. It's the Lepo Papa Memorial Graveyard. I thought it was relevant because it also uh, symbolizes death. And this project is about um, the people that we lost on Earth. Okay. Really sorry. The slow technology. Um, this is my design process. I kind of looked at the pictures from before and I really liked the fragmentation. And I thought if I was going to translate this to architecture, I could create sort of cracks in the fragments for light. So um, my plan was to have these volumes that intersect and kind of create the spaces that you would inhabit. And the circulation would be like, you would start here and you would go through the kind of um, sadic, um, sadness space to represent the tragedy of all the lives lost from Earth. Then you would go into this more peaceful contemplative space, like beneath the frozen river, um, for you to kind of reflect on all the events. And then you would be led through this um, joyous space that's meant to represent the new life that they created on Mars. And here's just showing how the circulation would work now that the pieces are like offset. And then the fragments would interact to make the form. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why that one's all small. Okay. And then these would be the five major blocks that I mentioned at the beginning. This would be the joyous space and the sadness space. So they kind of create they um, create light coming from above in the joyous space and light coming from the side in the sadness space. And then this is just um, a drawing of how I kind of plan the elevations to be. So this um, space is more open and comfortable. It represents stability. And then this one is meant to give you um, a feeling of unease, like with the kind of tilting ramps and the um, while it's like leaning on to you. And then this was my um, sketch um, representing how I planned the uh, wall in the sadness and destruction space.
I'm really sorry. I'm not sure why I'm practicing. Do you have some uh, individual files that maybe we can open instead of uh, the compiled? Yeah. Usually the compiled is too much, uh, mm -hmm. it's too heavy. So maybe it will be best to just open two or three files. Okay. And um, yeah, I want to see some of those little bitty thumbnails that- Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. More I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry it didn't work out as I planned. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, let's look at the renderings and, and um, well, those also open in Acrobat. Okay. Well, um, this is my site plan. And in the site plan, if it was loading, you would be able to see that I like, like nestled in between the. Um, there you go. Like civilization mm -hmm. and the uh, frozen river. All right. And then, um, so I think we have a pl pretty clear idea of the three spaces and where the building is located. We are dying to see the building. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I'm sorry. Um, I had it all planned, but now Acrobat is not. Um, can you guys see the files on? Bots, maybe. Let's see. Lillian, they just showed up. Oh yay! Okay. Yeah. Okay. This would be my uh, floor plan. So you would enter right here and go down this um, long ramp and then descend into underneath the frozen river, where you could um, look up and contemplate about the. Um, events that happened on earth and then you would be led up this kind of joyous ascent back towards um, the domes on Mars. Okay. And um, this section of the floor plan is kind of like the light tunnel that um, lets the light go through into like the cracks here. So you get the lighting there. This is the elevation of, of what you would see from the domes. And I guess I consider this to be the front. This is the northern elevation, the, um, the side and these Three, these are three of the um, five major plots that I played out earlier. And you can see how they're supported by the sort of um, secondary wash structure. This is the um, section of the wall created by the five main um, blocks. So that would be this one, this one, this one, and then these two at the bottom. Can you talk and, about what that space is to the top left? Top left? Oh, this? Or is that a space? Or is that just a... That's, yeah, that's meant to represent the river. Oh, OK. Got it. And then you would kind of like walk down this um, descent into the space beneath. Lily, do you have the Enscape uh, model that we can just? Yes, but Enscape is very laggy too. It's just that if this is a, a project specifically that you really need to experience it um, either through renderings or or some type of um, 
way to get the uh, uh -huh. the experience of the space really yeah. Where are your, I, I could see your renderings in the box files, but do you have, are they part of this or are they, are they part of this PDF that you have open? Yes, they're part of this PDF. Okay. Yeah, I'm opening the PDF on I mean, your they're really on the box and it's a big file <laughs> for the presentation. <laughs> yeah. Open it up. yeah. Can we yeah. close the presentation and just go uh, with your individual files, uh, Lily? Yeah. Let's go to the renderings because those open in my, also, when I try to open the presentation, is huge. Mm -hmm. Okay. So should I open them in individually? Oh, yeah, those oh, okay. are much okay. easier to get open. Yeah. Yeah, I will close this so you are not using all your RAM. And if you have the Enscape or other programs open, that also are eating up your RAM. So. Okay. I think Ryan, closing Rhino helps a lot. Oh my goodness! Much better. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> yeah, go down, go yeah. down, go, 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 go. Okay, um, here is the uh, yeah. space that's okay. supposed to be like the joyous ascent and you can see how light would be um, streaming from above as you go through this more sort of predictable pattern in comparison to the um, unpredictability that the um, five major blocks kind of create there. The blocks would be here, 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 and there. And then, um, this is the light quality created by the sadness space. This is the light quality in the more joyous space as you like descend and ascend. So they look really similar right now in those two renderings. Um, what, um, what is different about them? What were you trying to do differently? Um, I was trying to um, create a more um, unpredictable lighting effect here, and then establish a pattern here. So like the pattern mm. is repeated right here and then is repeated one more time. Whereas here the um, blocks kind of interact in a way that is really reminiscent of anything else. Go ahead, Camille. I was going to say, I think this is one of the hardest things to do when given this assignment in architecture is try to assign uh, assign a subjective reaction to specific physical phenomenon. Um, and most of your examples we looked at were objects and not spaces. So it, it's, I think it's hard for you to look at what as a, a memorial like you showed us would generate from the inside. I think these are very, uh, they're very interesting forms. I think you've gotten some very interesting spatial forms out of the geometry that you're using. What I think uh, Brett is touching on is that, uh, you know, light could come through in a, in a very irregular way and create a very playful and joyous space. Irregularity doesn't necessarily mean sadness. Um, I think the way that you were looking at the physical forms uh, in, in, in the way that they either made you uncomfortable or uneasy, I think that's, that is more in line with what, I think that's probably something that's more experiential that you would experience. It's harder to see them in these models exactly because they are sort of, um, they're all irregular forms. So it's hard to tell when it, one is being supported well and when one is being like, I would think if one of them was sort of hanging and not supported and crushing, that it might feel, ev evoke that feeling that you were looking for with some of your diagrams. Um, I think they're actually both delightful spaces. <laughs> I think I would feel happy in both of them, which is- Yeah, I I, I, I'm not getting <laughs> sad in there. <laughs> I, I wouldn't get sad. Yeah, it's a um, good, good space right there. Part of it too yeah. is they're, they're both the same, and, and this may just be the fault of the rendering too. They both feel like they're very much the same size. Mm -hmm. Are they? Yeah, I, this space is actually a bit smaller than this one, but I think I really could have made the scale change more dramatic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, and all the light is very direct. You're, you've got this sort of one-to-one -one relationship mm -hmm. of there's this, this surface and you've cut a hole in it, an aperture, and the light is coming in. You're, you, I think that you could really um, uh, dramatize this or, or um, 
manipulate it more by having it bounce and maybe playing with some indirect um, and sort of contrast those two mm -hmm. um, a mm -hmm. little bit more. Yeah, and Lily, you actually were playing with that with the fractures because you had a very thin, almost a lot of tension in between the volumes, a very pin, almost a pin light uh, uh, will come through. And I, I feel like the way you render it uh, conveys a different story of a much larger opening than, uh, and, unless the model uh, changed a little bit since last we spoke, but uh, I thought that no, was I... interesting. I think it's just the rendering I chose. The light changes between the, like as the sun moves. So mm -hmm. I guess the space would have much, much thinner light than the space. Yeah, I mean, can you see? Oh my, I don't know how to do this, but a little arrow that I had for a second that disappeared. But there's that in the in interior too. There's sort of that little slit on the right. And is that mm -hmm. kind of the quality of aperture throughout the space? Here? Yes, that's yeah. meant okay. to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was the intent. So it's very diffuse, like Camille was, was mentioning. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the intent. I think maybe the orientation of the time of the day is playing against you to kind yeah. of that, that yeah, thought. Yeah, for sure. You're getting whoo, straight light. Yeah, that it. one ceiling thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can we see the other renderings? Yeah, the exterior ones. Um, this is just kind of a rendering of the um, wall that's supporting the three top structures. And this is the exterior rendering of the front. And so are you approaching this from the exterior or are you coming up from underground? You're approaching it from the exterior. Okay. So you would enter down this stairway and into the ramp of the satin space. Yeah, so that's another kind of interesting thing we haven't really gotten to talk about with anybody else yet either is this idea of, okay, the reality is that there's sort of this airlock component that you're going to have to introduce um, if this were to be a, a real thing. And how can that moment, how can that threshold, um, you know, be within the language of the space or be an introduction to the space without feeling like this, you know, tent add on or anything like that, that how do you integrate the realities of you of the environment? Um, with yeah, your I've been watching more Mars movies than I have, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> my, yeah, my husband has a bit of a sci fi obsession. So. <laughs> been watching a lot <laughs> yeah you know the it's it's very expressive on the exterior i think mm -hmm. even more so than the interior really because the mm -hmm. the way that the forms are put together and it's not so much the shapes themselves but their relationship to each other and how they don't really join in a a way that traditionally we would look at as um uh, secure or structurally sound, right? I mean, they could be, but um, to me, the exterior of your building speaks to that sadness or uh, insecurity or um, discomfort. And then the inside to me feels very sound and fe feels very peaceful or, you know, I don't know if it's joyous, but more of that peace feeling. It's interesting that the same form can look and feel so different from the exterior and the interior. I think you're getting more contrast from that than you are from uh, space to space on the inside. Yeah. Especially yeah, how the, the volumes are like almost like collapsing. Mm -hmm. you yeah, I wanted them to. Level of like yeah. loss and devastation. Yeah, yeah, it could be a ruin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. I wanted them to look like, like mm -hmm. stones. Mm -hmm. Unless then I would say your first space is outside of the building. And then your next space, your peaceful space and your joyous space is inside the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just re relabel it and you're done. <laughs> yes, for your yeah. portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> and you've done a really nice job of representing um, the thickness in your drawings. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what we were talking about on, on um, the last presentation is that I really do get this sort of tactile sense of, of what you're making. And it feels very of the place and of mm -hmm. the of your intention. So um, I know you've had a lot of trouble with just 
physically presenting it in this form, but I think you've done a really nice job of representing it in your drawings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Lily. Appreciate it. Great comments. Thank you. I, I appreciated all the feedback. Sure. I'm glad we got to see it. Yes. <laughs> yes. I was nervous for sure. <laughs> I think Lily was yeah. pretty, pretty nervous. <laughs> Yeah, it didn't go how I planned. Yeah. It, it all worked out. So now you can take a yeah. deep breath and yeah. That's right. Can you, can you can you join us? Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I can. Um, can you hear me well? Very yes. well. Yes. Okay, thank you. Let's go ahead and share the screen. Okay, do y'all have anything um covering the screen? Is this... No, you're good. Okay. Being as a whistle. Okay. So um, this is my project, uh, which I'm calling the Mars Memorial, just to be uh, quick and concise with it and to have kind of this alliteration to it that's really iconic, I guess. Um, so the prompt that we are given, the narrative, um, as you have heard several times by now, is actually um, a site on Mars. And so let me go into detail about how I approached it. Um, my idea was that uh, the great starvation, which happened on earth was basically this worldwide catastrophic famine that left the earth, uh, the population of earth <clears throat> like suffering and an irreversible ruin. Um, so the only choice they felt they had was to travel to Mars. Um, now it's been 200 years since then and this that we're actually seeing is the first established colony on Mars. <clears throat> and the idea is that they want to create a memorial for everything or everyone who suffered through the great starvation, um, the perilous journey that people had to actually um, undergo to get here and then kind of the transformation of life in this new frontier. And so thus arose this Mars Memorial that I, uh, this design that I, created. So some more quick context. Um, oh, sorry. So more quick context was the way that I understood Mars was that it's a landscape with a harsh uh, environment, basically. The sunlight um, makes it impossible for like plants to grow above ground due to radiation. Uh, I researched more about Mars and found that Earth and Mars have similarities in terms of how many hours there are in a day. Um, like Mars only has 30 more minutes than Earth does in a single day. So that's 24 hours and then an extra 30 minutes. And the axis of Earth and Mars are actually similar. Um, they only differ by one degree, which is 24 degrees versus 25 degrees. So the sun works in a very similar manner uh, for both of these planets. The only big difference is kind of like the atmosphere and then Mars has one third of the gravity of Earth. So I also went and established for me that water was a a uh, scarce resource on Mars, and it's found as a frozen form inside these rivers on the surface of Mars that go um, underground as well. And so with these materials, the material that I chose to use for my project was a concrete that utilizes Martian sand and aggregates. So it gives my, uh, my material a subtle reddish tint to it. And I made my walls thick, um, like four feet thick in order to mitigate like the harmful effects of the sun once you're inside the memorial. And so that's the context of my site and kind of an uh, overview of the materials I'm gonna use. So my process was to kind of think about this narrative that we were given and think about the different events that led up to it. So we have the great starvation, then we have the great migration and the shift to the underground. So you can think about the great starvation sort of like the great famine here that we've actually experienced already on earth with the great uh, Irish potato famine and just how they people were displaced because of hunger and the peril, perilous journey that they had to go to in order to be able to survive. And with that, I separated three distinct events and thought about um, the emotions that are actually associated with each of them. So with the great starvation, we have sadness and despair uh, melancholy, great migration, the second event, um, thinking of things as anticipation, kind of um, not being sure exactly what's going to happen. 
and then like the transformation of life and the underground shift into Mars, um, kind of a celebration of new life on Mars. And from there, I thought about different analogous architectural ter uh, terms um, and how I could portray them in an architectural, architectonic way, basically. And these kind of correlate with the same uh, analogous architectural terms that I wrote here. So I started visualizing kind of the kind of conditions that I wanted to see within my project. So we have these uh, columns um, that are representative of kind of the starving human frames um, that happened during the great starvation. And the fact that they sink into the ground is representative of the, first of all, of like one's passage into death and also of our shift into the ground, underground uh, with our new life on Mars. And then I wanted to have different uh, conditions where the light would be uh, played with and modulated to have specific kind of qualities to have um, either subtle light or kind of more direct ways. And so now uh, this brings me to my concept of more research, uh, from more research that I actually gathered it from. So the form of my Mars Memorial draws inspiration from the concept of sacred geometries. Um, these sacred geometries actually have deeply embedded powerful meanings and symbolism shared by ancient civilizations of like Persia and India and China. Um, the Mars Memorial arises from a spatial intersection between a circle. Oops, sorry. Let me get to that diagram. Between a circle that represents the heavens and an orthogonal square that represents mankind slash earth. <clears throat> and so with its sharp corners and straight edges, the square essentially cuts into and through the rounded circle. And the intersection of the two geometries, sacred geometries, become a symbol of mankind making its mark in the cosmos as they settled on Mars. Um, I then split the uh, memorial into two distinct spaces and with the associate with the associated emotions uh, like along with that. And so I thought about my memorial in terms of two uh, spaces, the Requiem space and the Rebirth space. And so here is my site plan. The way I designed essentially for a user to experience this Mars Memorial um, is that of a pilgrimage site that requires like a conscious undertaking of a journey to the memorial itself. Um, there's no clear or defined path to doing so. Uh, this pilgrimage is something that you experience by traversing through the Martian landscape and walking on rivers of frozen ice. Uh, so this is a journey that's essentially associated with risk, similar to the migration of humans from Earth to Mars and the uh, trials and tribulations that came along with doing so. So my Mars Memorial, the way I wanted it to feel was the scale of it. I wanted to work from a monumental scale that evoked the sublime, um, which in its highest degree seeks to uh, elicit admiration and to astonish people, but also have um, qualities of reverence and respect for the meanings that are embedded in this space. So here we have a floor plan of my model. Um, of the memorial. And I just, I'm not sure. Um, feel free to um, ask me any questions if you have any as I'm talking, by the way. It, are there uh, more? There's more slides, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. Okay. And um, so this is the floor plan of it, just mm -hmm. to give you a quick view of the inside. That's It's kind of sliced through uh, halfway. So we this is a section perspective of it. Um, the way you enter would actually be through here. And then um, through the floor plan, you would follow through and go into the space and come around. And so I'll define that a bit more. So this right here is the rebirth space. I guess I should go about it in terms of Requiem first. So this right here is the Requiem space. The idea is that <clears throat> Sorry, um, the idea is that you would go up 
into the rec room space. It's about 14 feet above ground and you would get to experience these um, columns, uh, which I said were representative of um, humans who were starving in the great starvation. And so these, what I call starving stele, um, they undergo this slow descent into the ground, which is symbolic of uh, one's passage into death and like our shift into the underground on Mars. And if you look above, you're able to see where the columns have conceptually uh, extended and pierced through the ceiling. And these create small apertures that uh, allow light to come in and kind of twinkle. Um, so it's supposed to be reminiscent of uh, stars shining above you. And so the small apertures, they refine the light that actually comes in through the space and they create this interesting phenomenon that I'll show you later um, that actually filters the light and makes it multicolored. But once you, long, once you walk along this set path, uh, the idea is that uh, you turn and the way to cross over to this next space, which is the rebirth space, is to physically pass through this threshold condition. Since this wall is about four feet thick, it's uh, something, it's a conscious decision that you have to make to go from one space to the next. And the importance uh, behind this wall is that this wall in relation to the rest of the shapes, it's actually this, uh, in proportion to the rest of these shapes, that this is the same curvature as Earth, um, uh, as Earth, whereas um, the rest of them, for example, this dome is the same curvature in, as Mars. And so the idea is you cross into the rebirth space and you see uh, these sort of large heavenly domes that craft uh, the harsh sunlight into celebrated and soft diffused light. Um, you have a staircase that gently leads you toward an open area that contains the final space of repose for the columns. Miguel, um, I think it presents better on the, on the um, actual renderings. Okay, I'll go do that. Okay, so this is the exterior form, first of all, um, and you enter. This is that multicolored light that I was talking to you about, about Requiem. So we see the light that actually washes over this wall and we get to experience the columns that um, have the slow descent toward the ground. So this is the space that you actually get into in rebirth. The idea is that this is a space that celebrates the light, the harsh sunlight on Mars and crafts it into something, um, something soft, something beautiful. Uh, it lets light in through this aperture up here and it diffuses it. And um, the idea is that it illuminates this social space and this sort of cemetery space down here. And the idea is that on the peak of the summer solstice, since it's similar to uh, Earth, that these words right here would be illuminated per aspera ad astra, which essentially, sorry, my, which essentially means um, through hardships to the stars. And this is the famous phrase that uh, President Jimmy Carter um, in 1977 attached with a space capsule. And within that space capsule, um, it had a bunch of images and sounds portrayed uh, inside that, or attached inside that would portray the diversity of life on earth um, to anybody who would be able to access that. And they just sent it off to earth, I mean, into space and um, anybody who would um, be able to access it would be able to see the diversity of life. And so the idea is that here we get to see an extension of the columns um, from the rec beyond space. And here this is, they become something that we can actually interact with, something um, tangible that we can attach emotions onto, um, something that we can project uh, feelings of uh, reveration and um, be able to actually have something to, I guess, attach uh, everything that we're feeling inside this space onto. And the idea is that these river stones, uh, these river pebbles are actually taken from the nearby uh, frozen rivers and um, they become sort of this 
uh, new ground that you have to physically walk on and uh, makes you conscious that like you're in a space that's supposed to be sacred and that you get to um, basically interact with these stelae. And so here, the last thing that we see is the social space on the left, uh, which is a place for post interaction um, after we've been able to experience everything. And the last thing that you actually see as you exit the memorial, it's a framed view of the first colony of Mars, which acts as a parting gesture from the memorial and kind of as an embracement of the new life that we've been able to uh, successfully accomplish on Mars. And so um, I'll take you back through my sections. Um, the idea. You might want to just let us comment at this point. Okay. <laughs> I know you probably have like a thousand other things to add because okay. I mean, the thing that is, uh, stands out the most about this project is, yeah, you just sort of thought of everything. Like all, all the little pieces are here. Everything is well thought out. Everything has meaning. It has extra meaning. It's got like layers of, of thought in it. It is a very thoughtful project. And so I'll start by saying that it is, it is very complete. It is very thoughtful. It does, I think it does all the things that you want it to do. Um, to me, it's almost too clean. I don't know what's missing from it, but it's as if uh, a lot of these projects are a little bit grittier. I mean, Mars seems like sort of a gritty place. This is a very pristine, clean, polished, almost um, figure in a very, very rough landscape. I don't quite know what that means yet. I don't know if it's me. the fact that this is me. supposed to be about okay. emotion and it's supposed to be very like raw with, um, you come into this requiem space that's about loss and death. And then you come into this other sort of more contemplative space. It, what strikes me about this is it is a very um, clean, sterile and polished version of emotion in a very different way than some of the other projects, like especially the last one that was a lot more sort of raw um, in its presentation. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm digesting that because it, to me, it feels like a very different type of project than some of the other ones that we've seen. Mm -hmm. I do think that it, it is very thoughtful and considered like all of the things about, you know, the, the stele and the holes in the ceiling and that you would like in the same way that we look up at the stars to remember people that we've loved and lost, you would see these little holes and it would be like looking at the stars in your homeland. You know, the having the sayings up there and having such meaning that's tied to all of the little bits and pieces The, you know, the curvature of everything, like all of the little pieces are very well thought out. Um, I, I don't know what I'm getting at here. <laughs> well, if I may, I do agree with what you're saying. I felt like it was, um, I've talked about this with Professor Chu about how clean I, uh, this project kind of felt. Um, I think what we both agreed on was that I really wanted to play with the purity of these geometric shapes um, without kind of like messing with um, their geometries um, because these are sacred geometries that hold a lot of meaning um, in not only like one culture on earth, but within a wide variety of them. And so the idea was that to keep conveying this idea of purity and sort of the idea of uh, pure emotions that are associated with them. But emotions are messy things. They are, but in the rawest <laughs> form, they kind of have. They get messy. I mean, you can, they, yeah. <laughs> That's what makes this one interesting. That's, it's thought provoking for me for that reason. I mean, Dijon's was very geometric too. That struck me as like, the first one was very non-geometric. -geom These are, those two are very, yours and Dijon's were very geometry driven. Um, we didn't get to comment on his project much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that some of, some of the, uh, geometry can be very powerful I'm missing the contrast between sort of the rugged terrain and that very pure, powerful geometry. I'm wondering how they can tie in a little better than like a very tidy little river rocks. Maybe there's something from that rough terrain and the frozen rivers that can interact, engage with this a little bit. Okay. 
see, and, and it's funny. I'm I'm less bothered by it. Part of it is the the fact that the the source material, besides like these these pure geometries, part of your your study or source material was um, religious objects and, and iconography. And there's some obviously this is very sort of cathedral esque, mm -hmm. um, and it's very it's very clean. It's very pure. You imagine that the sound is very um, you know, kind of epic. Reverberant inside there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of echo um, in this space. Um, but then there's also sort of that interesting play of like, I wonder if there are places in this room where you get that sort of whisper effect as sound moves across these curves, yeah. um, which could be kind of cool. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very Calatrava, um, and even sort of the, um, I'm, I need Chris Long right now. Um, uh, what's that like really big dome proposal from um, the turn of the century, the turn of the, the 20th century, they sort of epically mm. scaled buildings. Yeah. Um, uh, and part of it is that in being so clean and also being, I mean, it's, it's, it's large scale, but it's not overly large scale. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's, it's large. Um, but I almost want it to be even like bigger, just like grotesquely huge landing here. I mean, um, I do appreciate the, the really, um, sparse, um, apertures and mm -hmm. the, the reasoning behind them. Um, certainly you're, you're definitely, I mean, it's very spare. It's, it's clean, but it's very spare. And I don't think there's anything here that you could necessarily, um, take away you know you've, you've already done your editing um i mean except for yes i think the the river rock certainly camille's comment is worth um uh worth pondering um about what is that i mean there's very much this is very like uh, eisenman or Liebeskind. um I, I think part of it is that some of those some of these imagers we've seen these kind of memorials already and so I think that's that's one thing that that does bother me. I mean, this is just sort of a thinner version of the um, uh, Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, um, and so or even Oklahoma City too. There's some mm -hmm. there's some of that Dictures. to it as well. Yeah, <laughs> and um, so I, I don't know. In some ways, like if these, so what do each of these? totems do they do they represent something well these um they represent basically um since they're supposed to be skinny um they represent the, the frames of the people who are starving in the great starvation and the idea is that they sink into the ground um to like kind of represent um death mm -hmm. in a poetic way but i think so that the that uh that our reviewers are, I wanted to uh, push a little bit uh, on you is that how can you reinterpret that in, a, in the Martian uh, rugged terrain, right? So, okay, how would you do that if you actually expose the actual terrain and be a whole, you know, I, I think it will, I think it will improve your project for sure. Um, because you're very meticulous on every single thing that you have done that sometimes maybe a whole is a whole and 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 then you start um interacting with the site right mm -hmm. uh, the raw terrain and and what is that exposure to it you know it's it, it's quite interesting for sure mm -hmm. well i want to give some opportunity i know we passed the time but i want to give some opportunity for our reviewers to can I get some general thoughts and, and, and maybe some comments for those who actually uh, were not able to, to get too much feedback. So if, if, if you don't mind, uh, borrow some of your time, uh, extra time. Yeah, no problem. Uh, that'll be wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Miguel. Great presentation. Thank yeah, you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. 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 Um, I, this is, you guys must have had a lot of fun this semester. I will start by saying to you that I would, I would love to hear how many of you are in Austin and how many of you are elsewhere. I am at my hometown helping with my family. Yeah. Are most of you living with your families right now? Yeah, I'm at home. 
Yeah. Yes. I have a 19 year old stowed in the back who was missing his freshman year at do for industrial design. So I know how tough it is doing studios long distance and I'm, I'm seeing it from both sides. Now you guys did an incredible job of, of, having to scatter in the middle of this and regroup yourselves and um, kudos to everybody <laughs> for, for getting through that. Um, I think this is, despite that, probably an incredibly fun studio for you guys to do. It, I mean, it must have been sort of bewildering a little bit. How do you address something that is so foreign like this? Um, but rooting it sort of, you know, ironically from the inside of you with this emotional component to it, to form something that is like in another world. That's like a really long, that's a, that's a big journey. Um, and they're all incredibly different. So you're obviously all approaching this from very different places. I can start to understand some of your personalities, I think a little bit through these projects and the way that you've approached emotion or, um, you know, in different ways. It's, it's really interesting. So um, yeah, I am sad that we didn't get to do more comments on some of the first few, because by the time we got through the last ones, we could sort of see the landscape of everything. Um, and it's much easier to make those comments. But I think that um, you know those who tried to invent an architecture or a way of building out of it got some very different results than those that used more conventional means. Um, I think it's, like on the last project that we saw, it was a little bit more conventional construction than some of the other ones. And you got to fine tune it a little bit in ways that were a little bit more familiar um, because they, uh, somebody else, one of you guys said that it's, you know, these are places that we've seen before um, and they're built that way because they are very evocative, you know? And I said it was very clean, where's the emotion? But maybe it's the people inside that are just in an emotional mess when they're inside against this very clean, you know, pristine, sterile environment. I don't know. That's that's one way to look at it. But it's you know, I've it's been really interesting um, contemplating what you would, how you would memorialize something like this in mm -hmm. such a different environment. So thank you all. Um, right. It was it was interesting seeing also the other two groups. I was reading those proposals as well. I mean, some of this is interesting. It's very timely in terms of these. All of these are about events of great change and yeah. how we respond to them. I mean, so um, I'm sure that's not lost on on all of you. Um, so I appreciate you all kind of buckling down and and working your way through. You know the thought in the future, um, uh, you know, that you respond to um, in times of great change. Um, I will say overall, chances are this is probably not the last time that you have a final, final review in this format. And so I encourage all of you to practice, to, to get that package, that presentation package together um, and practice a few times talking through it. Um, mm -hmm. And also because, you know, one thing that took up a lot of time is that each one of you guys were presenting the background information that all of you share. And part of it is that, you know, when we're in the, we're, we're in the Mebane together, you guys can just point to a poster on the wall and say, you know, go look at that. Um, but you don't really need to worry about that here. We really want this time to really get into the meat of what you have done, because that's what's the most important. Um, but yeah, I was on an advanced um, studio presentation earlier and, um, and you could tell those groups had rehearsed. As they were speaking, things were highlighting on the screen um, and it, 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 it helped. So definitely be sure to rehearse and keep it concise. You know, the best part of reviews and, and this social interaction that we're all kind of craving is the ability to have a conversation about your work. Um, so yeah, you know, practice, the next time you have to do this, it's a five minute presentation and the rest of your 10, 15 minutes is the conversation. Um, but back to the, the overall work. I mean, it really, it's a really provocative studio and I really appreciate you guys really stepping out of your comfort zones um, to create, um, you know, architecture that makes us think um, and still references, you know, our earthly past, um, but really helps us to push forward some of our um, thoughts and ideas. So good job.
Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you guys and the wonderful feedback. Um, I would like to leave it like that. I'll uh, uh, stop the live streaming and I would love to uh, chat with, with uh, you guys. And uh, probably uh, we won't see each other for, for quite a while. So uh, if you can stick around, uh, let's uh, please, uh, um, thank uh, our reviewers and, and thank you so much again. Uh, I really appreciate it. Sure, thank you. And thank all of you guys. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Sure, happy to do it.